Well, here we are, part two of Midnight Sun. So glad to have you here. If you have not listened to part one, be sure that you go back and listen to that before you begin. There are also two other installments before this book. So if you need to start at the very beginning, make sure that you start with The Darkest Winter. The links are below in the description. All right, so this book packs a really big punch. So bear with me and I hope you enjoy the rest of the adventure. I can't wait to see you on the other side. Happy listening. 41. Alex. Jackson and I stood at the wash bin and counter outside the skinning shed, gutting and filleting fish for dinner. I sliced through the belly of the salmon, from fin to gills, and flipped it over to gut it. Sophie's going to be bitter you took her favorite job, Jackson joked, but I knew that was far from accurate. She hated cleaning fish with a passion. The scales under her nails, the slime between her fingertips. She would rather catch and cook than clean. Where is she, anyway? After the wheel got going, she took off. A nap, I think, I muttered. But I didn't want to talk about Sophie or why she needed a nap to begin with. I'd been thinking about her enough since last night. More than was healthy. I all said she wasn't sleeping well. Any idea why? I tossed a handful of guts into the bucket. Nope. Jackson's eyes were like a hot iron, trying to sear more words from me. But I refused to talk about or acknowledge that I'd let Sophie and Phil sour my mood. It wasn't my place to be upset anyway. What's Kat at the prison for? I asked, needing to think about something else. She mentioned Hartley Bay before she left. She and Woody are talking about how things are progressing there. She mentioned there's talk of a summit. A summit? Like for survivors? Jackson nodded and set two salmon fillets in the basket with the others. He looked like a regular Susie homemaker in his gutting apron, donned with silvery fish scales and splatters of blood. Yeah, I don't know much more. It sounds interesting, though, listening to her talk about the place. All we hear on the radio is what they want us to know. How do you mean? More than ever, I was interested in what else there was beyond Whitehorse what I could learn and how I could carve out a life for myself, at least until Whitehorse was more than just the family. I was beginning to feel claustrophobic. I set two more fillets in the basket with the others. Cat mentioned they have quite the farm. He slapped another salmon on the cutting board in front of me, then set one on his, wiping off the slime before he started. I guess a few of the residents have abilities that help produce production tenfold. Then they'll never want to come here. I thought aloud. We had to work for our food, just like subsistence living had required before. Nothing grew with the snap of our fingers or jumped from the river into our plates. I don't know about that. From the sound of it, Hartley Bay is overcrowded. I guess it would be. Elle told me how small it is. There's a lot more infrastructure there because of it, to make sure things remain fair and equal. There has to be. Something we'll need to keep in mind one day. Is it still only accessible by air and water? We hadn't learned that until Woody had told us soon after we'd settled. Had we parted with Jackson as originally planned, getting to Whiteley would have been a bit more difficult than we'd realized. I'm not sure how they'd have a summit if that's the case. Cat mentioned Prince Rupert, but we'll have to see. Here you go, Sophie called behind us. She walked up with a cart full of salmon. Looks like you two are going to need another set of hands. Sophie's eyes met mine, dark and shadowed with exhaustion. I imagined she hadn't gotten much sleep after I left her and Phil in the barn last night. I thought you were napping, I said, sounding a bit more disappointed than I'd intended. Her grip tightened on the salmon cart. I tried. Then Jackson put the tenth filet in the basket, enough for all of us for dinner. Good timing, then. I rinsed my hands under the faucet. I need to get started on dinner. I lifted my gut-covered apron over my head, handing it to Sophie. You can take my spot, I told her. She watched me curiously and carefully took the apron from me, ensuring our fingers didn't touch. I'll be inside if you need me. I grabbed the basket and turned for the house, ignoring their eyes on me. 42. Sophie. 
citronella candles flickered down the center of the glass table to keep the mosquitoes at bay. And the peppermint and lemon oil on my skin was a scent I'd grown so accustomed to, I barely noticed it anymore. Just like I barely noticed the fog in my head from too many sleepless nights. I peered down the row of four empty plates on my side of the table. L, Jackson, and Ginny had eaten all of their dinner, like I had. Then I glanced down the row across from me, the plates each littered with one remaining portion or another. Well, it looks like some of us enjoyed dinner, I muttered. Thea had only picked at her salmon. That fish wheel is pretty awesome, Jackson. We'll have enough frozen and smoked salmon to last us a while by the time we're finished. And snacks for the wolves, Bo added with a grin. I can't take all the credit. He leaned back in his chair with full satisfaction on his face. You all helped, and Took gave me the idea when we were staying with them last year. It would be nice to see them again, I said, suddenly in desperate need of Jade's grandmotherly advice. It's been too long, and I've been thinking about them a lot. So have I, Al admitted. We'll try to plan a trip soon. We have winter to think about first and we need to stay with the fish wheel until salmon season is over. While all of that made sense, it was still irritating that the one thing I felt I needed to feel whole right now was an inconvenience. When I noticed Jenny was watching me, I glanced away. You don't like tomatoes? Thea asked Kat, staring at her plate on the table beside her. I'm allergic, Kat told her, pushing the plate closer to Thea. Without hesitation, Thea plopped one into her mouth and giggled as it burst between her teeth. Ew, gross. Thea, close your mouth when you do that, Bo scolded from the other side of her. He picked up his discarded napkin and wiped off his arm. Thea giggled in answer, earning a warning, if a bit of an amused look, from L. Well, Alex, I think those were the best mashed potatoes you've made yet. Jackson patted his stomach. I even had seconds. You always have seconds, Al told him. Alex snorted, clearly in a more pleasant mood than he'd been in earlier. Or at least he was hiding it better. Well, it's just been a while is all. He grinned and gulped down the rest of his water in his glass. It's because you're always at the stupid dam and don't cook for us anymore, Thea told him with a bit of sass. From the mouths of babes. Taking a sip of my son tea, I smiled inwardly. Thea might have been the pickiest eater of all of us, but I loved that little girl, and every single thought she had that fell from her lips without hesitation. What do you mean? I just cooked. Besides, it's good for you to learn to cook. Your husband will appreciate it. Hey, Al chided and tossed her crumpled napkin at him. It would have been insulting if Alex weren't the one who looked the best in an apron, and he knew it. I'm never getting married, Thea promised. Boys are gross. So are you, Bo groused back. Nuh-uh. Yeah, huh Oh boy, here we go, Alex muttered. Do you guys want to play the giraffe game? El said with effect, making me laugh. That one still got you stumped. Who knows? You might be old enough to figure it out this time. She winked at me. Bo and Thea looked at each other, their scowls lessening as they contemplated. Kat leaned closer to Alex. What's the giraffe game? They have to figure out what sound they make. Kat's brow furrowed. What sound do they make? She straightened and looked at him. Alex grinned with a shrug. Kat's cheek twitched, and I thought she might actually smile, but it never came. With Bo and Thea deep in thought, Elle sighed in her small, momentary victory and leaned back in her seat. So, Alex, the fish wheel is done and the goats have their little safe haven. Now what? Are you going to stay a little while longer? He pressed the prong of his fork into his last bit of potatoes, moving them around. The sun was bright behind him, washing his tan skin in a gold hue, 
though I tried not to notice. It's nice to be home, he said, purposely not looking at me. It was obvious Alex had been avoiding me all day after what he saw last night, and it bothered me that it felt like I was being punished, regardless of what really happened. But, he continued, which I'd been expecting. I'm curious to hear more about the summit Kat mentioned earlier. A summit? I glanced around the table. Kat nodded and turned her fork over and over on her plate. Now that Harrodson is not a threat, Hartley Bay wants to gather everyone up. She peered around at us. Hartley is small, and the resource is limited, and it's time we all got on the same page. Or so Huck and the Navy feel. The voice from the radio? I asked. The very one, Kat said. He's been helping the Navy to strategize and spread the word. They've sent envoys down the Pacific coast, looking for settlements, and they'll be broadcasting more information soon, if they haven't already. Well, we're going, right? Alex asked, so quickly I thought he might actually be giddy. His eyes darted between L and Jackson. I mean, this is what we've been waiting for, a way to tell people about what we have here. This could be huge. A dozen resentments filled my head as Alex said that. The thought of him leaving again, knowing it was because of me, was like a slap to the face, like he couldn't get away from me fast enough. And once again, the Ranskins would be shoved to the bottom of the priority list because there would never be a good time to see them. And more than anything, a summit meant that, unless we all abandoned our posts, some of us would be leaving to attend and we'd be separated again, which rarely ended well. Jackson looked at Elle, like they were still undecided. Alex leaned forward, his eyes pointed and clearly impatient. Think of what we could learn and the people we could bring back. You said it yourself, Jackson. Hartley Bay is overcrowded. They could use a place like this. We could see what other abilities are out there. More than you can imagine, Kat muttered. She looked up from her index finger, tapping against the side of the table to our expectant faces. She was restless, always, I'd noticed. And the number of people attending who might be attending, is why I'd wanted to stay and wait for it. JJ shot Kat a stilted look, and a silent conversation passed between them, thickening the tension more than Alex and I even could. Well, he prompted, are we going to go? Jackson tossed his napkin onto his plate and heaved out a steady breath. We haven't had time to discuss it yet. His bearded face gave nothing away not a clenching of the jaw or a twitch of the lip, but I saw the concern in his eyes, and concern meant he was already thinking seven steps ahead. We would attend, of course, because it was the whole point of keeping White Horse running. This was the reason we'd stayed here, the reason we'd sacrificed so much. Jackson was too smart to pass up what might be our only opportunity to make the shift. So... I scooted my chair out as I grabbed my dirty plate. I could feel the anxiety creeping up on me, even as I tried to swallow it away. The Ranskins are tabled for now. Some of us are going to the summit, and there's a possibility whoever goes might not come back. Meanwhile, the rest of us stay here and hold down the fort. Got it. I grabbed my empty tea glass and turned for the sliding door. Sophie! El said, her surprise ringing in my ears like a damn bell. That's a little overdramatic, don't you think? I looked at her. Which part? Because all of it is true, isn't it? Oblivious to the kids gaping at me, I glanced at Alex, then at Kat. It's true, isn't it? I repeated, knowing at least she'd be realistic about it. They're putting a broadcast out to anyone and everyone, Good or bad, anyone who hears it could come. Kat's gaze darted around the table. It's a possibility. What, Sophie, you don't think it's smart to go? Alex asked. After everything we've done to keep this place running? Why does it matter what I think, Alex? You'll do what you want regardless. 
You'll leave regardless. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. I slid the screen door open. Good, because it shouldn't matter if I leave, he ground out. You have plenty to keep you busy here. You mean Phil? I shot back at him. Alex simply stared at me, like everything was so obvious to him, and he had all the answers. Clenching my plate in my hand, feeling the sharp bite of bitterness in my stomach, I nodded. Yeah, you're right. I do. I didn't know if the words hurt him as much as they hurt me, but it felt good to sling some frustration his way, even if the words weren't true, because I was tired of bearing it all on my own. So deal with it and stop being an ass. Okay, that's enough, you two, Jackson scolded, and he stood up from his chair. Now's not the time to hash this out, and we'll discuss the summit later. His tone brooked no argument, and as I felt everyone's eyes on me, tears burned the back of my throat, and I tried to swallow them away. Fine, I breathed, because it was all I could manage. Somehow, I'd lost my resolve to be strong and capable. I barely felt like me anymore, and turning on my heel, I disappeared into the house, swallowing a silent scream. 43. Alex. Following the winding gravel path toward the water, I tried not to let what happened last night distract me. The whole reason I wanted to talk to Sophie was to make peace, if it was even possible, and make sure she was okay. The Sophie glaring at me on the deck wasn't okay. She was rumpled and agitated, and that it was because of me made me feel nauseous. As expected, I found her on my rock. I hadn't been to the swimming hole all summer. I'd been too busy at the plant and at the prison. This place felt more like hers now, and I was just an intruder. She didn't bother looking at me as I stepped around the rocks along the riverbed, through the mud as I drew closer. Her back was to me, and her hair was a nest of chaos on top of her head. Even her shoulders were slouched. She knew it was me, though. I knew she could sense me when I was near the way I could sense her. Hastily, she swiped beneath her eye like she was crying. You're right, I'm an asshole, I blurted. I hated to see her cry, and she was crying because I was wound up and jealous, and I had no right to be. I stepped closer, the toe of my boot scraping against the boulder, a much-needed physical barrier between us, and I willed her to look at me. I regretted throwing Phil in your face the second I did it. I needed to see those big, beautiful blue eyes of hers and to somehow feel like we weren't on this downward spiral that was quickly veering out of my control. It's fine. I was an asshole, too. I saw you with Phil last night, and it hurt. A lot, I admitted, shoving my hands in my pockets. I needed her to understand, even if I knew I'd do a piss-poor job explaining it. I keep telling myself distance is best, but the closer you and Phil get, the more I hate him. Feeling it too on top of everything, seeing it? I shook my head. I don't like it. Phil and I aren't what you think, she said, finally looking at me. Her eyes were watery and her nose was red, the combination illuminating the circles under her eyes. Whatever the two of you are, I still don't like it. I had no right to say it but I couldn't stop myself. I don't know why I thought this would be easier. Sophie gurgled out a laugh, like it was all she could manage. Yeah, well, whatever's going on, I don't like it either. Despite her laugh, her eyes glistened with tears, and a few seconds later, she lowered her head into her hands and let out a sob. Something's wrong with me, Alex, she whimpered, tearing a part of my heart out with it. I wanted to climb up onto the rock and comfort her in some way, but my feet didn't move. A siren rang out in my head, telling me to stay away if I was going to have any shred of sanity left. Instead, I locked my jaw into place and fisted my hands in my pockets to keep from reaching for her. Something weird is happening. Her words flowed in a rush. My ability is changing, maybe. It's different this time. I can't sleep. 
All I see when I close my eyes is Phil, and I don't know why. I feel like I'm losing my mind. My heart cinched so tight I thought it might burst, and I forced a deep breath through my nose. Maybe you care about him more than you think. She sniffed and threw her hands up. I've tried to like him like that. It's not working. She shook her head. I'm just, I'm so tired. She breathed. I need space, but I don't want to be alone. I need air to breathe. I need sleep. Maybe my being here is making it too hard to figure out what you really want, Soph. I obviously can't handle it, and it's making everything harder on you. Finally, she looked at me and wiped the moisture from her cheek. Meaning you're going to the summit, whether Jackson goes or not. I bit the side of my cheek, forcing a nod. Sophie stared at me, or maybe she was staring through me, and finally she nodded, like she'd accepted that was the right thing for us, and her eyes refocused on me. Is it weird that I miss Whiteley? Her lashes were dark and wet. No. I'd been there for all of five minutes, but Sophie had spent a lot of her life there, so I could imagine her missing home. Even if I thought I was going to die, even if I wanted to at times, I felt so miserable. Everything was less complicated then. I thought of Sophie in the hallway, outside my Uncle Jimmy's apartment, and how her eyes burned with concern as she took my face in her hand to assess the damage my uncle had done without a second thought. A practical stranger, caring about me, touching me, seeing me. It wasn't like that now. There were very carefully constructed walls, even if they were beginning to crumble. Leaning against the boulder, I peered down at my boots. Long gone were the old Adidas with worn soles that had been too small. But deep down, it felt like a part of me was still on the run and restless. The day I found you, I started remembering the way my heart practically exploded with joy seeing her in the doorway of her apartment. I thought for a moment you were an angel. If you hadn't been there, I wasn't sure what I would have done. I know. She said softly. Me too. She waited a breath, then continued. Will you promise me something? She asked, though her voice was barely audible. She lifted her head to look at me, tears filling her eyes as she worried her bottom lip. I hated that look. Lost, lonely, afraid. I swallowed thickly, determined to keep myself together because holding or reassuring her wasn't an option. Whatever you want. Promise me you won't disappear. Her voice was pleading and riddled with desperation, and for the first time since I was 12 years old, I had to stifle the overwhelming threat of tears. Squeezing my eyes shut, I promised. I won't disappear, I whispered. Had I been able to formulate more than three words, I would have told her she never had to worry about that because I would never leave her. I would always be there willing to do anything for her. But I wouldn't make more promises I couldn't keep. The sound of the rushing water filled the silence that followed, and I peered up at the sun, lowering behind the mountains. She was exhausted, and it was getting late. Do you want me to walk you back to the house? I wasn't asking because she needed my protection, but because I thought she might want the company. Or maybe I did. But Sophie shook her head. No, thanks. Her voice was only a whisper. I'm going to stay out here a little bit longer. You should go in, though, and get some rest. The next broadcast is tomorrow. Everything will change again after that. Sophie's none too subtle request for me to leave her alone was received, loud and clear. Yeah, I guess you're right. I ran my hand over my head, wishing I could scrub the constant disquiet away and I spared her one more glance. I wanted to say more. Instead, I turned to leave. Good night, Sophie. A sniffle was all I heard in response, and flexing my hands at my sides, I forced myself to walk away. 44. L. I leaned against my photo table down in the basement, arms crossed over my chest, staring at the photos I'd taken over the past 10 months. 
I tried to remember the exact moment in time Bo, Thea, Alex, and Sophie had become my family. In the frantic haze of the months past, their smiling faces had become everything to me, each of their laughs filling the emptiness I'd always felt, diminishing it to nothing more than a shadow of a memory. Each of their tears were like salt in a festering wound. I hated that Alex and Sophie were fighting and that Ross was keeping his distance. I hated that Jackson would no doubt leave soon for the summit, because despite the truth in Sophie's words, going south was the right thing to do, even if the thought of splitting all of us up scared the shit out of me. The steps creaked as Jackson made his way down into the lab, and before he even uttered a single word, the air in the room changed and the chill was gone. Bo and Thea are asleep, he said, his voice smooth and rich like hot fudge on a Sunday. Alex is in his room, and Sophie is somewhere, I guess, probably in the barn. He walked up beside me, his gaze a lick of warmth against my face. Oh, I already missed him, and he hadn't even left yet. Rubbing my arms, I finally looked at him. The first time I saw you at the bus depot, I knew I needed you, I told him. With a pinched brow, Jackson stood beside me at the table, his arm brushing against mine. I knew I had to do everything I could to keep you. Stealing my nerves under his pensive gaze, I turned to face him. At first, because I was afraid. But then because I couldn't imagine my life without you. Jackson leaned in and pressed a kiss to my mouth. His whiskers tickled my cheeks as his lips lingered on mine. And as he pulled away, he brushed his nose against mine and lifted my chin. Where is this coming from? He said softly. His face was cast in shadows from the dim light overhead. And I wondered if there was ever a man more perfect than him. Or a woman as lucky as me. I tried and failed to say the next words with absolute certainty. Alex is right. You have to go to the summit. Surprise creased his brow, but he waited patiently for me to continue. What have we been keeping the plant going for if not for this? The grueling days, working between the prison and White Horse, all the reconstruction and supply runs, even Alex and Bert locking themselves away in the facility, would all be for nothing. Not for nothing, he pointed out. For us, too. I guess, but we can't be all the kids know forever, Jackson. We set out to give them a sense of safety and community in the beginning. Sure, living in hiding changed that, but now, now they need stimulation and people their own age. Thea has an imaginary friend because her brother can't stand her, and Bo's only friends are wolves. You see how Sophie and Alex are? They're going to hate each other by the time this thing between them is over. There aren't distractions like there were before. Sophie doesn't have friends to confide in, and she stopped confiding in me a long time ago. Alex, he needs a purpose. And there's only so much that will keep him here before he leaves on his own anyway. Jackson listened without disagreement, but I assumed one was coming. If we don't try to make White Horse what we set out for it to be, if we don't seize this opportunity, things are only going to get worse. But Sophie was right too. We don't know what we're walking into either. The summit will be dangerous. Yes, he said, a single word that rumbled and reverberated through me. It will be dangerous, and we'd be gone for a couple weeks at least, probably longer. A lot could go wrong. Wow, I mouthed with a pointed glare. Thank you for reiterating all of that. Do you want to give me an ulcer? He chuckled softly and pulled me in front of him, our bodies pressed together as one. No, but I want to make sure you know all of the risks. And, of course, that you won't get to see me for a while. You might have withdrawals. Or you will. I said, and lifted my chin defiantly. That's a given. 
I rose up on my tiptoes, staring into his eyes as I wrapped my arms around his neck. His hazel gaze shifted from my mouth to my cheek. Then he lifted me up and set me on the photo table, his hips pressed against mine. What should we do about- Please don't say the kids, he whispered and brushed a kiss against my lips. I stifled a laugh. Of course not, I lied. His irises burned brighter, even in the shadows, and a warm ache spiraled through me, low and deep. Instead, let's talk about how I'm going to get through a few weeks without you. I lifted my lips to his, stopping a hair's breadth away. I have a few ideas, I whispered then pressed a feather-like kiss to the corner of his mouth. With my index finger, I traced a line over his Adam's apple and down his chest, stopping at the button of his jeans. But it's going to take some vigorous commitment on your part, I warned. He grinned and kissed me more deeply, pulling me in like I was the very air he craved. I think I'm up for the challenge. 45. Sophie. We sat in the prison, 13 of us, waiting at the long cafeteria tables, poised and ready to listen to the weekly broadcast. It had been weeks since we'd listened to Huck Fulton deliver stats and updates to any and all survivors listening. Now, however, knowing what announcements were to be made, we waited impatiently for Bert and Ross to join us, and for the clock to strike 6 p.m. L sat next to me with Thea in her lap, playing with a strand of L's loose hair. But I kept looking at Phil, across from me. He and his mystery girl had been on my mind since the barn, which hadn't helped lessen any weirdness with my dreams. Hey, I said, leaning closer. Things between us weren't the same since the barn either, but they were bearable. And even if I'd been feeling off about him lately, I was grateful for Bearable at this point. He leaned closer. What's up? I have a random question to ask you. Well, I guess it's not so random, but... Did you know someone named Nora? You know, before the outbreak? Phil pursed his lips, and with a thoughtful, furrowed brow, he nodded. Yeah, I think a girl in my psych class was named Nora. Did she have dark brown hair? He shrugged. I think so. Why? I couldn't help but smile as the frantic buzz of alarm silenced. Good, I just... I waved his question away. I had this crazy dream, and that makes it a bit less weird. Does it? Because that sounds pretty weird. It made sense to me, and that was what mattered. I rolled my eyes, glad that things were okay between us, even if it was still strange that I'd been dreaming about him. But this Phil was so different from the other one, and because I knew my dreams weren't real, I couldn't hold my warped brain against him. Elle glanced at the clock on the wall, then at Jackson sitting beside her. Ross is coming, right? Jackson blew out a breath, clearly uncertain what was going on with Ross. I hope so, he said, and marked an X on the tic-tac-toe game he was playing with Bo. Hey, how do you keep winning? Jackson winked at him. Age and wisdom. Al and Jackson hadn't brought up the summit since my outburst at the table last night, but I already knew some of us would be going. And maybe... Just maybe, a small part of me was glad Alex would be one of them. I met his gaze from the other table. He gave me a pinched smile, and Kat stole his attention to look at a map sprawled out between them. Like me, JJ just watched everyone, quietly observing. I had so many questions about her and Kat. Like, why was Kat so keen on going back to Hartley Bay since she'd just left it behind? Even if JJ wasn't much for sentiment, she had to have some sort of feelings about it, especially if they loved each other so much. 
I glanced at Stanley and Woody at the table across from me, wondering what their thoughts were about the summit. Woody seemed content to mutter to himself as he picked at his fingernails with his pocket knife, and Stanley just watched him, semi-disgusted, with his pen poised over his journal, waiting to take notes. Bert's hoarse laughter boomed down the hallway before he entered the cafeteria. Ability-enhanced strip clubs. Everyone's eyes shifted to him. Inappropriate, Al warned, but was too slow to cover Thea's ears. Shit, sorry, Bert croaked. He wasn't like any old man I'd ever met. He'd smoked enough cigarettes and God only knew what else in his lifetime, so I was pretty sure his insides were preserved like century-old driftwood. And his humor, even if Elle didn't always appreciate it, made me smile. He was like that one unruly hair you couldn't get to stay in your bun, or that piece of bacon that refused to fry. Everything about him was odd, and I liked it. What's a strip club? Thea asked, blinking up at Elle. Jackson scratched the back of his head. I'll leave that one to you, he muttered as he rose to his feet. Elle heaved a sigh and told her it was a dance hall, then pointed toward the ham radio at the end of the table as Jackson switched it on. He glanced around the room as Huck Fulton's familiar, rich voice came over the airwaves. Again with Hartley Bay for the weekly broadcast. If you listened to our broadcast last week, you know we were hinting at a big announcement. I wasn't sure I'd ever meet Huck, but I used to imagine him in his late 30s and tall, dark, and handsome. That was before we were considering going to Hartley. Since then, the fantasy had faded away. Now, I imagined him tired, like all of us, patient and diplomatic, since he was running one of the only communities we knew about. But I imagined he sat in his office each night like Woody did, drinking a highball of something to wind down for the day. Some of you have been listening in for nearly two years, he began again. And you are aware how much has changed now that General Gregory Harrodson with the United States Army is no longer a threat. With his armies disbanded, we, survivors of the new world, must come out of hiding if we want to truly live again. And so, Hartley Bay is hosting the Survivor Summit in Prince Rupert, what we hope will be the first of many. I glanced at Alex again. His eyes were riveted to the radio, like Huck himself was standing at the head of the class, enlisting men and women to fight a war that was already over. Effective immediately, we're preparing to leave for Port City Prince Rupert in hopes of meeting some of our fellow surviving communities. We invite all survivors interested in trade who want to exchange knowledge and gain allies in this very big world we now live in to join us. There are safe havens throughout the United States and throughout the world, and while our small town of Hartley Bay aims to remain one of them, we are too small to host or house many others. We can assure you that our gates at Prince Rupert will be well guarded, and there will be checkpoints upon entering to ensure everyone's safety. Additionally, we know winters here in the North are harsh, and traveling is difficult, sometimes impossible so we want to make this summit as efficient as possible. Prince Rupert's port and city gates will be open by the 1st of August. We ask that you bring what food you can, though there should be enough lodging for everyone during your stay. Again, this is Huck Fulton, Vice Councilman for the Hartley Bay Community. We'll bring you more information about the Northern Summit next Sunday. Until then, may your bellies be full and your hearths stay warm. The radio went silent, and for a moment, we all sat staring at it, as if Huck were simply taking a breath and had more to say. Jackson cleared his throat and clicked the radio off. Well, he started, peering around at all the blinking eyes and engrossed faces. We have a community of our own to run and winter to prepare for. But we also have an opportunity to create an even larger community a sustainable one with more hands and able bodies, by going to this summit. 
What do we want to do? His gaze flickered to Alex. I already know your vote. Alex's eyes didn't waver from Jackson's. The dangers of the past couple years aren't gone just because Harrison is, Ross said, glancing around at all of us. People are dangerous now. Crazy, power-hungry, ability-mad fanatics are still out there, and they are still a threat. Whoever stays behind will need protection, just like anyone who goes to Prince Rupert. Ross looked at Bo and Thea, then at Alex and Jackson. Then, his gaze leveled on Kat and JJ. It's something to keep in mind, is all. Elle tilted her head to the side like she was uncertain and cleared her throat. I think it's more foolish to waste this opportunity than it is to split up. Her eyes shifted around the room. She appeared to be thoughtful about it, but she and Jackson knew what they were going to do from the moment they sat down tonight. It was the uncertainty of it all that weighed on her, the backlash of what might come. A team should go, and a team should stay. Hear, hear, Woody agreed. If it's civilization we want, this is the time to make our move. I'm in, Bert rasped. We ain't getting any younger. We're at a disadvantage, Woody continued, patting down his wild hair. Having so much to ourselves, so much to run and to protect. We're spreading ourselves so thin it isn't sustainable. We can bet survivors who come here. He looked pointedly at me. We can learn their intentions. And if anyone tries any funny business, well, we have a duly reinforced prison at our disposal. While people were more dangerous now than ever, it was a slippery slope between us protecting ourselves and the government doing it, which was Woody's biggest fear. Uh-oh, Woody, I said with a hint of amusement. You sound like one of them. Woody's mouth curved into a grin. Desperate times, was all he said. What about moving to Hartley Bay? Bill asked. I'm not saying I want to, but it's a possibility. It's safe, with only the maritime highway access now. We could be a part of a community without the worry of running an entire city. I glanced at Bo, seeing the instant apprehension on his face. I like it here. I said, and it was true. This was our home now. We'd worked hard to make it that way. Me too, Bo added quickly as he clutched Luna's fur in his hand. A pack of wolves wouldn't likely be welcomed in Hartley Bay, especially if it was already so crowded. Hartley Bay is not an option, Kat said with far more authority on the topic than we had. You heard him. It's already full. That's why they're having the summit in Prince Rupert. There's been a small navy outpost there, but it's not protected or lived in, other than what small area they've dedicated to barracks. It's uninhabited. Nothing like your white horse where things have been kept up. Plus, white horse is sprawling with housing and room to grow if needed. You have the hydro plant and the prison for safety, or to lock people away, like Woody suggested. She looked from Phil to Jackson then leveled her attention on Woody. White Horse is a good place to settle. Trust me. Kat stole a glance in JJ's direction, their eyes locking for a split second, before Kat said, I'd like to be on the team that goes back, though. You just came from there, Ross said, his voice riddled with skepticism. Yeah, well, I want to go back. She glowered at him, daring Ross to say something more. Besides, others will come with news and discoveries we haven't heard yet, with food and medicine. How can you be so sure? JJ asked. Because, Kat rebuked, that's the point of all of this, to bring us all together. And if nothing else, Harrison's virus rooted out the weak, which means everyone left alive has something to contribute. Every single person who comes. The abilities you will learn about alone will be worth the trip. It's not just an ordinary town anymore. You probably imagine a town like you've lived in before, when people couldn't move things with their minds or will it to rain. 
Bill and I looked at one another in surprise. Think of what the 11 of you did here, and then times that by a hundred, because if Prince Rupert is anything like Hartley Bay, you won't be able to walk down the street without seeing someone doing something that will make you stop and stare. At least until you get used to it. What else should we expect? Alex asked. The excitement in his voice was unmistakable. I don't know how it will be in Prince Rupert, but if they do anything there like they do in Hartley Bay, there are think tank rooms where people mat and plot routes and sit around tables much like this, deciding which teams to send out next, who will be in the rotation, and what supplies can be spared. Nothing is easy. Everything is congested and complicated, and while everyone is working together most of the time, there is a heaviness that goes unspoken. Everyone still mourns. Everyone still jumps at shadows. And more than anything, everyone wants a slice of normalcy again. Kat peered around the room at our entranced faces. Then we decide who goes and who stays, Ross said in reply. I, for one, would like to stay. He was the only military-trained person we had, aside from Woody, whose skills were a bit rusty and primarily tactical. I'll stay here, Elle added. Thea, Ross, and I will keep everything running while the others are gone. She tightened one of the purple ribbons on the end of Thea's long braid. With a brisk nod, Thea leaned her back against Elle's chest and gave a thumbs up. I will stay with Elle, JJ added. Kat's gaze skirted to her briefly, a shadow of fear or sadness darkening her stormy blue eyes. But she said nothing. I want to go to the summit, Bo said. I want to meet people with abilities like me. He looked from Jackson to L, and his eyebrows drew together in a silent plea as he waited for her final say in the matter. I was surprised when she said yes. Bo's eyes nearly bulged with surprise, like he couldn't believe it himself. Really? He chirped, just like his sister, and one of his rare smiles engulfed his face. I can go? She glanced at Jackson. Yes. As long as you look after Jackson for me. I will, Bo said, running around the table to her. Me and Luna both. He threw his arms around Elle in gratitude, shocking the shit out of her. Though she smiled, I could see the fear filling her eyes too. Alex, Kat, myself, Woody. Jackson looked at Bert and Phil. What are your thoughts? I think I'm gonna have to go. Bert said. Sounds like a meeting of the minds, and I'd like to know what other folks have been working on. Not to mention, you all might need me along the way. The bus, which I assume we're taking, hasn't been used since we put in the converted engine. Someone's got to make sure you all get there safe and sound. I'll stay here, Phil said. There's a lot to do to prep for winter, and someone's got to keep Stanley company. Someone's got to make sure he gets out of this big old place and into the sunlight every once in a while. He grinned, happily willing to take charge. Perhaps we can work on your garden, El said, offering the warm reassurance she'd gotten so good at over the past year. Especially without Woody to kill everything off. Hey now, I resent that statement, he blubbered. And as a small, knowing smile crept over Stanley's lips, everyone's faces lit with amusement. Finally, Jackson's gaze leveled on me. Soph, what are you? I'm staying, I said, even if a small, eager part of me was curious to go. I didn't want to leave Elle alone with the homestead, and Alex was right. We needed the time apart. A clean break one that we both agreed on. After talking to him, I'd felt better. This was how I was going to start gaining control again, not being pushed and pulled in so many directions. My heart versus my mind. Then it's settled, Bert said, clapping his hands together. We have a shitload of planning to do. I'll make some coffee. 
Coffee was just what I needed if I was going to get through the hours of planning to come. And as I stood, Phil stopped me. Hey, he said, clearing his throat. Can we, like, forget about the other night? I mean, it just feels like a drunken night sort of deal. Like something we should pretend didn't happen so we can be normal again. You know what I mean? Yeah, I said though I still thought about our many dream kisses when I looked at him. Really? Because I feel like you're just saying that to get me to go away. He smiled. Laughing at such a fill thing to say, I nudged him. I'm not just saying that, I promise. I've got other stuff going on. It's not entirely about you. Okay, good. Because it was stupid. No, Phil, it wasn't stupid, I told him. It might have been fuel to a strange, unrequited fire, but it wasn't stupid. I'm glad we did it. It was only partially a white lie. I take it you haven't been sleeping any better? Ha, <laughs> is it that obvious? Yes, but only because I know you. You haven't asked me to spar at all this week. That's true. It's been a pretty busy week. I actually forgot about it. Anything I can do to help? While Phil's question was harmless, it was comical. He'd done plenty already. No, I'm good. It's nothing a little coffee won't fix. I tipped my head toward the scent of fresh brew. Come on, then. We have a lot of weight to pull while they're gone. We might as well get used to it now. This is when everything changes. 46. Alex. You're sure you want to stay? I asked Ross as we made our way down the hall to Woody and Stanley's offices. We needed maps of British Columbia if we were going to determine the best route to Prince Rupert and how long the trip would actually take. Two weeks? More? When Ross didn't answer, I looked at him. He stared down the halogen-lit hallway the sound of his boots and mine echoing like a memory from the past. Only before, it would have been Diggs walking beside me with a scowl on his face, angry at me for getting caught up in something dangerous again, angry at me for getting caught at all. But Ross's scowl was more menacing, and it made me uneasy. Ross? I'm sure, he reiterated. I'm assuming this is about JJ and Kat, I said, knowing he still didn't trust them. Hell, I didn't even know if I should call JJ by her nickname like Sophie or by her real name like Elle. Ross didn't spend much time with them, so I figured it would be a while still before he warmed up to the idea of them at all. Kat's coming with us, so... Jackson will know if something bad is coming on that front, he said. Then he stopped and looked at me. What did Sophie say their abilities were? I'm not sure she said. I guess I just assumed JJ didn't have one since she doesn't remember anything. If Jackson and Sophie aren't worried, then I still don't trust them. We continue down the hall. Well, Woody can block Kat's ability in Prince Rupert or any other ability-related threat for that matter. Even if part of me felt like Ross was overreacting, at least when it came to Kat and JJ, I was suddenly glad he was staying behind with the others. He'd be diligent and keep them safe. We turned down the next corridor toward the administration offices. Can I ask what it is about them you don't trust? They aren't telling us something, he said after a few seconds. I can just feel it. Though it wasn't amusing, more unnerving than anything, I laughed to break up the tension. That's supposed to be Jackson's forte. Yeah, well, he wants Al to be happy, and sometimes people miss things when they're distracted. As we stepped into the office lobby, we stopped in the doorway. Whoa, we said in unison. It had been a while since I'd been inside, and Stanley had butcher paper taped up everywhere and white boards leaning against the walls. There were pie charts and formulas, bar graphs and tally marks everywhere. I saw the names of safe havens I'd heard about, lists of known abilities and a timeline of dates. 
This is some warped mashup of Criminal Minds and Bill Nye, I muttered. You're telling me. I walked over to the diagram of abilities. They were broken down into categories by type, empathy, telepathy, alteration, telekinesis, physical enhancement, and mind manipulation. He has all of us on here, I realized, and pointed to my name by ability alteration. Ability to amplify others through touch, I read aloud. Ross stepped closer to the list, staring at his name circled at the bottom with a line drawn between empathy and mind manipulation. Able to see others' memories, sense emotions, and put others at ease. His voice trailed off as he read, and the permanently etched line in his forehead deepened. Kelsey always said I was one of a kind, he said dryly. It was a joke, a sad one especially since Ross hated his ability, even more than Sophie hated hers. And for the first time, I realized how lucky I was in that department. I didn't like my ability around Sophie because, like everything seemed to, it only made my relationship with her harder. But just like I couldn't choose my shitty parents, we couldn't choose our abilities, and we were stuck with them. Forever. I didn't mind mine so much, even if I had to rely on other people for it to work, which wasn't one of my strong suits. Fleetingly, I wondered what Stanley's notes said about why our abilities were what they were. I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> I'll grab the maps. I turned for the wall covered in scribbled-on maps of the Northwest Territories in British Columbia, deciding to take them all down in case we needed them, when there was the squeak and a door opened down the hall. That's Woody's office, I thought aloud. Ross and I glanced behind us to see Woody and Cat coming down the hall. But unlike Woody, who smiled in surprise, Cat's eyes widened in perceptivity with alarm. Didn't know you were in here, Woody said, and he waved to the wall of maps. Just be careful taking them down. Stanley's quite particular in the case you haven't noticed. With a chuckle, he headed down the hall. Cat glanced at us once more, but before she could take another step, Ross's voice cut through the silence. What were you doing in there? Apparently, Kat's surprise in seeing us hadn't been lost on him either. <sighs> Not that it's any business of yours, she quipped. But we were going over a few things. Ross took a step closer, his eyes like sharpened blades threatening to harpoon her to the wall. Like what? Take a step back, she ground out. And it's none of your damn business. Like fucking hell, it's not my business, he growled. I could practically see the fumes as his gears grinded. What are you hiding? Easy, man, I said, sidestepping the desk to put myself between them. Cat peeled her lips apart and seethed. Back the fuck off. Hands clenched at her sides. She marched onward and I could practically feel the steam wafting off of her. Next time, she called over her shoulder. Ask nicely, and I might tell you. Ross didn't need to snarl. It was implied in the rigidity of his body. He was wound so tight, it made my muscles hurt thinking about it. We'll ask Woody about it, okay? I'm sure it was nothing important. She just likes getting you riled up. It's fucking working, he mumbled. Wrong word choice. Just come on. I turned back to the maps. Help me get these down. They're waiting for us. So, Jackson said, his finger tracing the highway down the topographical map of the Canadian territories. While everyone fanned off to do tasks and chores, those of us leaving for Prince Rupert gathered around the cafeteria table to plan. If we take the Yukon, one over the border... Then cross through 37 to Highway 16, it would be a solid day and a half, maybe two of driving. Shit, that's nothing, Bert said. But you have to take into account the neglected roads, Cat reminded them. I glanced over at where she sat on the tabletop. Her long, blonde braid hung off to the side as she studied the map sprawled out in front of us. She reminded me of Thea when she sat up on the counter at home watching Elle cook dinner. Only, Cat didn't look so innocent. She was like a vulture, hovering and plodding with keen eyes and bits of knowledge we needed. 
So, I started. I don't suppose you took many roads to get here, then? I asked her. Or know what the road conditions are these days? Her light blue eyes flicked to me, and she shook her head. I'm not all that fond of being a walking target. Yeah, stupid question. I grumbled. So, tell us, Woody said. What sort of place is Prince Rupert? What's the actual city like? None of us have traveled that far south. Jackson, Ross, Bert, and I all stared at her. She took a swig from her coffee mug and licked her lips. It was a good manufacturing and shipping port for years. As far as I can tell, the majority of the summit would be held in the city center, where there is enough housing and conference areas large enough for everyone, depending on how many survivors attend. You should know, though, when I was in Hartley, there was only one person I knew of, though, that could generate any sort of power, and that person had to be physically touching whatever they were sending power into. They don't have a hydro plant or anything like that to keep the power running. Is that a warning? Ross muttered from his gun cleaning station behind her. They both cooled down and were mostly ignoring each other, but at least they were sitting in the same room and weren't shouting. It could be. Cat glanced from Ross to Jackson and then to Woody. I think you should be prepared for a lot of people to come here. I know many of them will consider it, at least. You have what they don't, and that's something you need to keep in mind. Rest assured, these people are good people. They want to move on with their lives after so much loss. Good, that's the point, Woody said. If they want peace and they want to thrive, they'll listen to us. They don't know how to keep the plant running during the winter like we do. They don't know about our safety precautions, our hideouts and surplus storages. I've been here nearly two years and know this place like the back of my hand. They'll see that. They'll understand. And what if they have someone who can see inside our minds like Sophie? Bert said. What if they can learn where our stockpiles and weapons are? Which abilities do we need to be ready for, Cat? Jackson said. It was less of a wondering question, but one that commanded an answer. She raked her fingers through her blonde hair, stopping at her braid. There are survivors who can do what Sophie does, through touch, like her, but without it, too. Animal whisperers like Bo, which you already know. Telepaths who can only speak to people, too. Her eyes fell on Jackson. There are some people who have heightened sense like you. Only it's more physical, like seeing and hearing things others can't, or running faster, becoming stronger. And I've even heard whispers of a man who can't die. Jackson's eyebrows lifted with intrigue. I've heard of others who can see flashes of the future. Whoa. Now that was the most intriguing to me by far. Even if every story ever told having to do with prophecies and the future warned you never to alter it, I wanted to know mine like a druggie craved his next fix. I wanted to know what my life would be like years from now, who I would be with. I wanted to meet that person. I wanted to know where exactly I belonged and if White Horse wasn't it. Kat looked at Ross, but it wasn't with her usual animosity, but more like regret. I've never heard of anyone who can do what you can, though, she said. It took Ross a moment to realize that the cafeteria had fallen quiet, and he looked at us, his eyes locking with cats before his brows lowered and his expression hardened again. Lucky me, he muttered. The cafeteria remained silent, save for the hiss of the air circulating through the vents and the hum of the overhead lights. If Ross hadn't felt singled out before, today changed all of that. Between Stanley triple-circling Ross's name on the abilities list and Kat looking at him like she pitied him instead of despised him, Ross couldn't have felt any more uncomfortable than he already was. And what is it you can do again? He bit out, a distinctive gruffness in his voice. Kat rolled her eyes, but her cheeks reddened a little, like the question either embarrassed her or she was ashamed of it. We all looked at her. We knew it was energy-related. Sophie had told us as much, but beyond that, we had no idea. I'm not sure, she said. I've used it once, and I'll never use it again to find out. Ross glared at her. The hell does that mean? It means it's not important, she growled. 
And if you're so fucking worried about it, you can bring Sophie in here and have her pick my brain to convince you that you don't have to worry about it, Ross. But I'm not talking about it. No one moved. But I could imagine everyone was dying to know what she could do, or at least what she'd done to scare herself from using it. Look, Kat started again, leveling her gaze on Ross. Trust me or don't, but I'm not the bad guy. I didn't wake up one morning in my soft, warm bed and learn the fucking world ended. She glanced around at all of us, her shoulders squared and her tone hard, almost defiant. I didn't pull my hair up in pigtails and skip all the way over here either. I've been fighting to survive every damn day, just like the rest of you. So don't talk to me like I'm trying to fuck you guys over or something. This summit is what you've all been working for. You want to go too. Finally, Ross met her gaze. Now that I know JJ is here and safe, I'm going back with or without you. Ross eyed her for a moment longer, clenched his jaw, then seemed to relent the slightest bit. What about the military? Ross asked. You think these people are good people? They could be, who knows? But are you forgetting they're the ones that set all of this in motion to begin with? If one of them gets some batshit, harebrained idea to take something that isn't theirs or hurt one of you, you'll need to be ready for that. You'll need a contingency plan. He looked back down at the disassembled pistol in front of him. We haven't survived this long without one, and it would be stupid to go in there unprepared. We'll prepare for it, Jackson said, and Al walked into the cafeteria, Thea shuffling in behind her. Can I take a new sleeping bag to Arya? Thea asked, peering up at Elle. Both of them had their arms full of them. What? No, sorry, sweetie, she whispered. They need them for their trip. We'll get another one for her next time we go into town, okay? Well, Bert said, smacking his hand on the tabletop. The sound ricocheted through the vacuous room. We still have a supply list to make and tasks to divvy out. I'm going to take a piss break. I need to speak with JJ, Kat added, stepping down from her perch on the tabletop. She didn't like to sit much. In fact, she was almost always standing or sitting on the top of the table, like chairs were only a suggestion. I kind of like that about her. And I desperately need more coffee, she muttered, grabbing her empty mug. Was it something I said? Elle teased as she walked up behind me. Just a break, I stood stretching my arms above my head with a yawn. It's been that exciting, huh? Productive might be a better word, I told her. Elle glanced at the map on the table, her eyes darting between the circled and starred locations. Thanks to Kat, we have a good understanding of what we're walking into. I wanted Elle to know we were being careful, even if I knew she would worry regardless. She lifted her chin in understanding, studying the map a moment long before her gaze flicked back to me. I'm glad you're excited for this trip, she said, and I hope you get the answers you're looking for. Answers to what? She shrugged. You tell me. I'm just curious, Elle. Aren't you? Yes, she said softly. I'm curious, and... Fearful of what happens when an entire city learns about us, about our hidden oasis here. We have to try, though, right? It felt pivotal to everything we were doing. Elle reached for my shoulder, her squeeze gentle and reassuring, and she pursed her lips. Yes, I agree that we do. But please, don't be reckless, Alex. Jackson needs you. We all need you, and we want you to come home. If you decide to that is. I frowned. I'll be home with everyone else, I told her. That's the plan, at least. I remembered what Sophie said about my empty promises, and I didn't want to lie to Elle. While I was open to having a life elsewhere, White Horse was my home. If I stayed in Prince Rupert or anywhere else for that matter, I'd be leaving the only family I'd ever had. They wouldn't be leaving me this time, and that felt so ass backwards, my heart raced in my chest, and I felt an overwhelming need to stay. I'm not running away, I thought aloud. But I have to go. I have to see what's out there, and I know. 
Elle said softly. Her eyes were shimmering and soft, and a small, understanding smile tugged at the corner of her mouth. I'll miss you, though. With another squeeze, she dropped her hand back to her side. And you know I'll worry, she added. So don't be gone too long, if you can help it. I won't. Well, she sighed, and nodded to the pile of supplies she'd already gathered for us to take. Since you're all leaving in a few days, we'll stay here tonight and make as much progress as we can. Come on, Squiggles. She motioned for Thea to follow her back out the door. Then Elle paused. Hey, Alex, can I offer one piece of advice? Of course. She tilted her head, and a faraway look flashed across her face. Dr. Rothman, a friend of mine, once told me that everyone has monsters. Ones we don't talk about or want to think about ever again. But only we can give them power over us. I know you gauge your future a lot from your past, but don't let your monsters and your fears that have taken so much from your childhood already take away from your future happiness as well. We've all been gifted a second chance. L turned for the door. L, thanks, I said. And while I appreciated the sentiment, I couldn't help but wonder if Dr. Rothman knew just how applicable those words would be one day when there were actual monsters out there. Or what I was supposed to do when it wasn't shadows I feared, but heartbreak. 47. Sophie. As I sat in my cell, staring at the cement walls with no windows, a stark contrast to my bedroom at home. I wondered how many nights Alex had spent in a room like this growing up. Alone. Maybe even scared. Or, maybe Juvie was better than being anywhere else, because it was safe and reliable. And he definitely hadn't had all of the stuff that littered my temporary room. A plush pillow and down comforter on my twin bed a pen holder and stack of books. Even here, my notebooks were scattered around on the floor. Everyone was either in bed already or still in the cafeteria, planning. I didn't want to sleep, though. It was pointless to try. Instead, I stared at a book about Whitehorse, about the First Nations villages that surrounded it. We hadn't seen any survivors, at least none that had been untouched or tainted by the virus, like Jade Dell and Took. White man's disease had taken on a whole new meaning now, but I wondered if there were others like them, other normals. Soft footsteps echoed in the dimly lit hall. Then Phil poked his head through the door. Good, you're still up. Hey, yeah, I... Couldn't sleep, I know. I thought I'd come keep you company for a bit. Phil stepped inside with a six-pack of squirt, my favorite soda pop, and he lifted a paper bag. I brought junk food. My eyes brightened. No, my entire face did, and I smiled. Wow, what's the occasion? I pushed my book aside and sat up on the edge of my bed, patting the seat beside me. Well, you're here, first of all which rarely happens anymore. And I want things to feel normal between us again, so... That sounds amazing. If my Phil dreams were more like this, about the real us and how easy and natural it felt, I would be able to sleep for days. So, he said with waggling eyebrows, I brought some sustenance to get us through the night. My night in shining armor. I cooed as he opened the paper bag and dumped the contents on my bedspread. Holy hell, I gulped. That's a lot of candy. There were packages of peanut M&Ms, sugar babies, sour patch kids, lollipops. You name it, Phil had it. And my mouth watered. Don't let Thea see those lollipops or she might knife you for them. Phil smirked. It's my own personal stash and you're welcome to have whatever you fancy. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I breathed, nearly overwhelmed. It wasn't that we couldn't get candy, 
but we never asked for it. Well, none of us but Thea, because it wasn't important when they were out scavenging. I sort of forgot about candy, I realized aloud. Say what? How is that possible? I'm a candy fiend and that will never change. He waved to the rainbow of wrappings. Seriously, have whatever you want. He didn't have to tell me again. I snatched up the bag of sugar babies and tore it open, unable to stop smiling. This is an unexpected surprise, I mused. Phil chose a package of assorted now and laters and winked at me. I like the chewies best too. He bent over and grabbed two squirts, handing one to me. Don't tell me squirt is your favorite soda as well, I said. That would be quite a coincidence. He shook his head and popped a blueberry taffy into his mouth. No, it's yours though, he said through a blue-toothed grin. Who told you? A birdie, he said. But I can't tell you more, sorry. I don't want to jeopardize my source. Smiling, I leaned back against the wall beside him. I wondered if he'd gleaned it from my memories, since I didn't close myself off from him. It didn't matter to me, though, and I popped a few caramel soft chews in my mouth. I forgot about these. I have no idea how. They were always my favorite. Yeah, well, there are two things that are a staple for me still. Junk food and old car magazines. You like cars? I knew about sports teams and his family. I knew about his claustrophobia and that he'd had a few girlfriends in high school, but nothing ever very serious. I knew he liked action movies and that cats made him uneasy because of how sly they always seemed to be. But that he liked cars, strangely, I hadn't known. I've always had a soft spot for them since my dad was a big car guy back in the day. I knew his dad had died in a car accident when he was little, but I'd never try to pry much more than that. I had his work uniform at home and some of his old magazines. The garage was full of his stuff. I told my mom to keep them for me in case I got into mechanics, but I never really did. Phil spoke about his father more easily than I would have, especially since he had such fond memories. I'm sorry about your dad. Phil fidgeted with his empty candy wrapper, then forced a smile. They said it was instant and he probably felt minimal pain, which is better than how it would have ended for him if it had been the virus instead. The sad part was, it was likely true. But that's not what I want to talk about, he said. What are some of the things you like to read? Let me guess, Cosmopolitan and Teen Vogue? I glared at him. Stereotype much? He shrugged. Sorry, those are the only girl magazines I know. It's what my sister used to read. His round cheeks flushed a little and he looked away again. Well, I said, unable to hold that against him. I have read Cosmo a few times. Well, I guess only once. I was 16 and my mom found it in my bedroom and freaked out. She lectured me on boys and how I needed to be careful, like I was some harlot. I chuckled at the thought, then instantly reddened, flashing back to my dreams about Phil in my bed. Even if it had only been a dream, it felt almost as real, and shameful in a way. Dreaming about Phil, kissing Phil, but loving Alex. I shoved another handful of candy into my mouth to distract myself. Anyway, he would have thought it was a playboy or something. Now there's an image, Phil muttered. Sophie reading a playboy. We laughed, and it felt good to let out a little nervous energy. The sound of our taffy smacking filled my cell, and we sat in companionable silence for a moment. It was so easy being around him, save for my mortification should he learn how much he was on my mind. But even then, he would blush and crack a joke and move on. Do you like living here at the prison? I popped more chews into my mouth and waited for him to answer. 
I'd always been interested in how Phil fit in with Stanley and Woody, especially with such an age gap between him and the two of them. Phil shrugged. That's fine. Big. And a little lonely sometimes. But I know I'm lucky to be here. You can always stay with us. We have the extra cabins, I said, pulling my leg up and turning to look at him. Yeah, I'll think about it. I'm serious. You wouldn't have to stay here with Stanley and Woody, who are always lost in their own little worlds. And Ross is always going back and forth. Phil's easiness faded, and a thoughtful expression pinched his brow. What does it mean, that he's leaving? He asked. Who? He looked at me. Alex. I know you guys have been through a lot, and I can fill in the holes most of the time, but now what? It means nothing. He's leaving, I'm staying, and things will be as they've always been. Which is what, exactly? Phil's warm, caramel-colored eyes held a curiosity, but also hurt. Just like he had known how I felt about him, I knew how he felt about me. For the first time, it dawned on me how hard this might be for him, and how selfish I'd been, even if it was unintentional. Alex and I are friends, I guess. Very complicated friends. We can't be more than that. I know that now. Saying the words out loud made my stomach drop and my throat tighten with sour regret. But it was true. I'm sorry, he said. You don't have to say anything, Phil. I can't believe you're still my friend after all I've put you through. But I am sorry, Sophie. And I am your friend. Alex gets under my skin, but I see how much it all affects you. Trust me. And I don't want that for you. My eyes nearly clouded with tears. Why are you so damn nice? I asked. Why are you so understanding? Do you have a mean or selfish bone in your body? Of course I do. His mouth quirked up in the corner with a half shrug. I don't know. I'm dumb, I guess. He nudged my shoulder, then sobered a little. It feels wrong to push you, so it is what it is. Yeah, but why? Why are you so worried about me? What about what you want? You should be going to Hartley Bay to meet new people or something, instead of being stuck here with me. I guess... He licked his lips and stared down at his mangled candy wrapper again. I guess it all just feels too good to be true. Finding Woody, you guys, the general being dead. I'm here with all of you, alive. I'm healthy. And I'm just happy to be here for now. And to be your friend. If that's how it needs to be. Oh, jeez. I teased. I know, totally sappy. He rolled his eyes, but I reached for his hand. His brow furrowed, then gave way to surprise as I allowed him to feel my adoration. A little something of me. My love for him as a friend. And a smidgen of the something I felt for him. Though I did my best to keep the dreams under lock and key. I'm glad to know you too, Phil. You're a really... Really, good friend. Unable to sit in the weight of the moment any longer, I dipped a quick nod to the candy minefield on my bed. And you've officially won me over bringing in all of this candy. Well, he said with a grin, we have all night. So, which candy, pray tell, will you choose next? I woke to the tickle of something on the back of my neck and then the feeling of arms wrapped around me. Blinking my eyes open, I stared at the candy wrappers littering the floor of my cell. Then, I glanced down at Phil's arm draped over me, his thermal shirt bunched up by his elbow, and my heart began to race. We'd fallen asleep with the lights on and everything. Phil was sleeping in my bed, and it wasn't a dream this time. 
The only guy I'd ever literally slept in bed with was Alex, with Bo and Thea's arms and legs tangled between us. Even if I knew this was nothing like my dream, it still felt intimate, or too close to the truth, and I felt a sudden urge to flee. Quick footsteps approached, and before I could move, Bo stepped into the doorway, his face instantly contorting. Ew, he said. Shut up, I said, lifting Phil's arm off of me. We were just sleeping. I sat up and blinked around my room and into the hallway. Wait, was it possible I'd actually slept through the night? Did I actually feel rested? Elle wanted me to ask you if you want to go into Whitehorse for anything. They're about to leave. Bo's eyes shifted from Phil's smushed sleeping face back to me. Well? No, I'm good. I was too relieved to worry about Whitehorse. Whatever, Bo grumbled, and he turned on his heel and disappeared down the hall. The sound of his footsteps clacked behind him. I glanced behind me at Phil. His long lashes fluttered in his sleep. However it had happened, I'd slept through the night, dreamless. My body felt lighter than before, rejuvenated in a way it hadn't in a long time, and I couldn't stop grinning. In fact, I was damn near giddy. Phil stirred and stretched in my bed, his eyes lazily peeling open. Why are you smiling like a crazy person? He asked through a yawn. Because, I told him, unable to contain my excitement. I don't know what you put in that candy, but I slept all night long. 48. Alex Ross and I drove through Riverdale to the stockpile of supplies we'd left in the shed behind the gym. Among the food, clothes, and camping gear, we'd left guns, a lot of them. Riverdale was the one location we had that we could really fend off, so we'd made sure it was well supplied and ready for hard times. Hard times that never came, and now we needed some of the ammo for our trip. Kat shifted in the bed of the truck, and I glanced at her through the side mirror. She said she could use the fresh air, so she'd opted to sit in the back, but I figured it was to keep some distance between her and Ross more than anything. Her hair blew in the wind, and her face was less pensive when no one was looking, like she didn't have to put on a brave face or a hard front, which she tended to do often. It only made me more curious about her. Had Kat ever been happy in her life? I thought that might be why she clung so much to JJ. What's up with you? I looked at Ross. Nothing. Why, what's up with you? You're not brooding again, are you? Brooding? No, that's Bo's forte. He glanced at me. His eyebrows raised in question, but he didn't say anything else. Dude, I'm not. Seriously. Why would I be brooding? I thought maybe with Phil being in Sophie's room this morning. I tried as hard as I could not to give my surprise away. And it might have worked if Ross hadn't known me better. I wasn't even sure if it was surprise anymore. More like sadness. Shit. Ross muttered, but we said no more than that. I didn't need to think about Sophie and Phil. I was leaving. Whatever happened next is how it would be. I repeated that to myself over and over as we pulled into the parking lot of the gym, trying to convince myself I didn't care. Let's get this over with, Ross said, and the truck jolted to a stop. Cat muttered a curse from the back, and Ross looked a little too pleased with himself as he pushed the driver's side door open and climbed out. As I got out of the truck, Kat jumped out of the back. Then she handed me my rifle, ignoring Ross completely. Thank you, I told her. But really, I wanted to fade out of existence when I was around the two of them. It felt like even when they were silent, they were arguing with each other. Kat pulled her pistol out of her holster and glanced toward the gym. Lead the way, hot stuff, she said with a wink. You heard about that, did you? I groused, and Kat smirked an answer. Kat followed us around the back of the gym to the storage unit where we'd hidden all of our things, and the moment we rounded the building, our ease evaporated. 
The door to the storage unit was open. What the fuck? Ross bit out and lifted his pistol as he drew closer. I take it that's not how you left it. Cat muttered, and like me, she raised her gun and swept the surrounding area for onlookers. Ross flung the shed door all the way open. The metal clanging on the steel siding echoed in the vacant alleyway. Well, if they didn't know we were here before, they do now, Kat said under her breath, and I tried to ignore her. If people found our stuff, they wouldn't only be well-fed, they'd be heavily armed. What the hell? Ross stepped inside the shed and lowered his weapon. I glanced one more time around us, seeing nothing but apartment buildings down the street and an empty car lot surrounding the left side of the gym, then lowered my rifle and stepped inside behind him. Light filtered in through the doorway, illuminating the storage we'd spent a couple days organizing months ago. I wasn't sure what to think. The shelves we'd set up were pilfered through. Some empty MRE bags and boxes of crackers were discarded on the ground. The rest of the food, the water jugs and preserves, the cans of vegetables and meats, was all gone. The shelves were mostly empty. I picked up four cans of tuna left on one of the shelves. I guess fish wasn't their thing, Kat said. One of the weapon trunks squeaked as Ross opened it and crouched down. It was still loaded with our weapons and ammo. Good thing it was locked, I said, breathing with a heavy sigh of relief. Ross opened the second trunk and looked at me. They weren't. I stepped closer. Glocks, Winchesters, Berettas, even a few knives filled the inside. You mean they ate all of the food but didn't take any weapons? I didn't understand. At least not very many if they did. There's an armory worth still in here. I shook my head, weirded out that someone had been in the shed to begin with and confused as to why they'd left precious weapons behind. That they might have had such a strong ability they didn't think they needed them made me feel nauseous. They were just hungry, Kat said. There are worse things. Ross's gaze darted to her, pointed and accusing. What? She snapped. There are. Or are you somehow implying this was me? I wasn't, but now. You seriously think I had something to do with this? You said it, not me. Trust me, she sneered. The food and clothes would be the last thing I would take. So back off. He rose to his feet. Or what? Kat stepped forward, her cheeks reddening and her arms so straight at her side, I thought she might launch straight for him. What the fuck is your problem, Ross? What is it about me that rubs you the wrong way? Do I look like a fucking ex-girlfriend or something? Did she do you wrong? Stop talking, he demanded. No. Not until you tell me what... Cat, I tried to warn her that talking about anything remotely close to Kelsey wasn't a good idea. Though the more I thought about it, the more I realized Cat did look like her a little. I remembered photos of them at Ross's house when we were staying there in Anchorage. She had Kat's blonde hair and blue eyes. You're my problem, he straightened, rage lighting his eyes. You showed up on Elle's sister's coattails, but nothing about you makes any sense. Oh, because you're an open book, she growled at him. You know far more about me than I'm comfortable with, he spat back. You refuse to talk about your ability. Just about everything you say is vague, and I know you're hiding something. I'm not hiding anything. You're fucking lying. And unlike everyone else, desperate to learn about Hartley and blindly trusting you, I don't. You have to earn it. Back off, Ross, or I swear to God, she gritted out. You what? Shoot me? The closer they inched to one another, the more I worried a gun would be drawn, because neither of them were backing down. Tell me what's your height. JJ's dying, she shouted at him. My gun nearly slipped from my fingers. Are you happy now? She's fucking sick and she's going to die. We were staying in Hartley Bay because I've been trying to find answers so I can save her. And now that the summit is actually happening in Prince Rupert, I'm going to keep searching. I don't care about your fucking food and your damn weapons. I care about JJ. Even Ross looked stricken his face paler and his arms hanging heavily at his side. Kat glanced from Ross to me, her eyes hard and her jaw clenched. 
There are ramifications for bringing someone back from the dead, and I don't know what I did, but it's my fault, and I'm trying to fucking save her. Her words filled the air and clung to my throat. I didn't know what to say. And if Ross did, he said nothing. If you want to break the news to Elle, then be my guest. I won't be the one to do it. Straightening, Kat shook her head and walked out of the shed, leaving Ross and me standing in the middle of a mess of wrappers and discarded bins, stunned. It must have been why JJ looked so much older than Elle. She was reborn, tired, and broken, a shell of who she was. What do we do? I looked at Ross. He stared after Kat's outline as she stalked away. Elle needed to know, right? Nothing, Ross said with a heavy sigh. We do nothing and hope that JJ tells her the truth soon, or that Kat finds her answers at the summit. It's not our place to say anything, not yet at least. I nodded, grateful he'd said it and not me. As much as I wanted Elle to know, I wanted to spare her the truth for as long as possible, too. Running my hand over my head and down my face, I peered around at the musty storage. And what about all of this? That seemed to jumpstart Ross back into task mode, and he grabbed one end of the weapon trunk. Even if they just wanted food and clothes, this place is compromised. We get all the weapons out of here and never come back to this location. But Ross had a glazed look in his eyes as he said it like he was on autopilot. Thinking about death had that effect on him, I'd noticed, like a visceral sensation settled over him every time. And when he glanced out the doorway again, I began to wonder if there wasn't regret I saw in his eyes too. 49. L. You have transformed the facility into a home in many ways. Jenny noted, as we each lugged a box of food to the loading bay in the bus yard. It was the back part of the compound a couple dozen meters from the prison, and with each step, Jenny seemed to find something new that caught her attention, something more curious than the last. The inside feels less fearsome than the outside. She squinted out at the stark front landscape, it was only pavement and dirt and a never-ending fence line with nothing beyond to block our views or compromise our defenses. Out here, it actually feels like a fortress. Yes, well, since some of us spend so much time here, it's important they feel settled inside, like it's home. Especially since there is so much of the prison we don't use. It can feel too big. Our feet crunched through the gravel as we drew closer to the loading area. They've done what they can to make it all feel a bit smaller. I shrugged. Truth be told, I can't imagine living here. It's still a bit ominous to me. But then again, I rarely visit the prison. The house keeps me plenty busy. I tried to look at the building as Jenny saw it. All sharp edges, razor wire, and metal-lined fencing. But out here, yes, it's more of a fortress. We were preparing for the worst for a long time. Jenny's eyes drifted to mine, and I saw sympathy in them, and exhaustion. But really, the sympathy I had was for her. There was still so much I didn't know about her, and despite how resolved she seemed to be about her life now, I knew it couldn't be easy. Stepping out of the afternoon sun, into the shade of the loading bay, we set our boxes off to the side with our other provisions for the summit trip. There are only a few more boxes, and then we can see what else needs to be done on the list. We turned back for the facility. Elle? Jenny said, and she paused beside me. Are you happy here? I looked at her thoughtful expression, surprised by her question and curious why she'd asked it. Yes, I am, I said, nodding without hesitation. She assessed my face, perhaps looking for a hint of uncertainty. I've never been happier in my life, I admitted. The Jenny of my childhood would understand why, 
But it wasn't as if we needed to rehash the hard stuff from a past she couldn't remember. Jenny's lips parted in a small smile, and for the first time, instead of looking thoughtful or concerned, she looked pleased. Good. One of the side doors of the prison opened, and Phil and Sophie came out with boxes in their arms. Sophie wasn't just smiling, but laughing, which I hadn't seen in a while. I assumed Phil was the difference. Regardless of the reason, it pleased me. Old Rusty, the adopted prison dog, came jogging out behind them, his fluffy collie tail wagging from all the excitement around the facility in the past 24 hours. He ran up to Jenny, his tan snout nudging her hand with a lick. He likes you, Phil said. He only gets that excited when he sees, well, me. He beamed with pride. Jenny opened her palm so Rusty could sniff her. With a nudge and a tongue hanging out of his mouth, he peered up at her, waiting for the affection he clearly felt he deserved. Jenny looked at me. There were dogs in Hartley Bay, she explained. But I'm not certain I ever pet one before. Well then, Phil said with a chuckle, Rusty would happily be your first. Amusement lit her eyes. And like a small child seeing a rainbow for the first time, she reached out and pet the tuft around his neck. Phil flashed his famous grin. He's a good old mutt. He can't hear all that well, but he's a keeper. As he and Sophie continued to the loading bay, the gate gears grumbled to life and it began to open. They're back. I headed for the Chevy as it rolled into the lot, glancing at Jenny as she followed beside me. Cat jumped out of the back before the truck came to a stop, and the passenger door opened. Alex climbed out next, but the moment his eyes met mine, they shot to Jenny, and he looked away. He walked swiftly to the back of the truck and lifted one of the plastic bins into his arms. Cat did the same. She moved hastily and barely spared us a glance as she began to unload. It didn't take an Einstein to notice that something had happened while they were out there. And if I had to guess, it was that something unpleasant between Ross and Kat. Let's see if we can't help them get this done a little faster, I muttered, and we made our way over to the truck. We passed Alex and Kat as they hauled a few boxes over to the loading bay. And when I got to the truck, I stopped beside Ross as he pulled a duffel bag from the back. Is it just me, or did you bring Winter back with you? He paused, mid-motion, before he looked at Jenny for a split second. Then he continued to unload. What's that mean? He asked, stacking one crate on top of another. It means I can feel the ice wafting off of all of you. What's with the gloomy faces? Oh, that, he said. And whether it was a silent explanation or purely automatic, Ross glanced at Kat walking back from the loading bay. She hurried toward Jenny, who was lifting one of the crates Ross had unloaded. Those are heavy, Kat reprimanded, taking it from Jenny's grasp. I glared at Ross. What happened? I whispered. Did you argue? Ross's gaze lingered on the two of them a moment longer. Then finally, he looked at me. I was going to wait until Jackson, but... But? The shed was pilfered, he said quietly. Someone has been in there and all the food is gone. I swallowed. I hadn't expected him to say that. What? And the weapons? We have them, but still. Someone knew our supplies were there and they broke the lock to get in. It could have been months ago or a matter of weeks. The door was open, so there was dust everywhere. With the elements, it's hard to tell how long it's been. That was unnerving, to say the least. And the others? We checked two of the others, and they were fine. I didn't have time to check them all, though. How could anyone have known about it? It made no sense how they could have found it. Or who they were. They might have been desperate for a place to sleep, 
he said with a grunt as he heaved the duffel bags over his shoulders. But Ross and I both knew that wasn't likely. There were a hundred places they could have slept. They didn't need to get into that shed. Not unless they knew what was in there. Ross, I said. I grabbed a crate and hurried to catch up with him. Does that mean someone was watching us? I knew the answer could have been yes, but there was no way to know for sure. But somehow, I hoped he'd be able to explain it as a fluke. That there was no danger. That all was well. L. He turned to face me. You have other things to worry about, he said. Though the moment he said it, his brow crumpled a little, and he shook his head. I mean, you don't have to worry about this. Whoever it was would have taken the weapons if they were dangerous. And it could have happened months ago. I nodded. Because all of that did make me feel better, even if the pit of my stomach burned with the sour taste of fear. Fear for the first time in a long time. I am fine. Jenny growled at Kat as she took another crate from her arms. I hadn't seen Kat so agitated or Jenny so frustrated before. Stop fussing, please. Kat, I said, uncertain why she was so adamant that Jenny not help. Jenny's been very helpful while you've been gone. She's capable, I promise you. Well, she should be more careful, Kat said coolly, her gaze leveled on Jenny. Kat, Ross called. Grab those duffel bags, will you? It was more of a command than a question, and after a few tension-filled heartbeats, Kat walked to the truck. Kat strode away with more indignation than usual. Why is she so worried about you? I glanced at my sister. Jenny rested her hand on her forehead and blew out a breath, another one of the more human things she did sometimes. She worries about me is all, she explained. I have not been as strong as I once was, not since the virus. Frowning, my heart palpitated a little, and I tried to subdue the rising panic. What does that mean, Jenny? She looked at me, her brow unfurrowed as she took in my concern, and she smiled. It was weak and false, the way it was when we were younger and Dr. John took his aggression out on her. The same expression on a familiar face, but with starkly different eyes. It was as if my sister was trying to be strong, and as much as I should have appreciated the gesture, it instilled a renewed sense of fear in me instead. As everyone scurried around the lot, my world stood still. Jenny? She pried her gaze away from Kat and looked at me. Really looked at me. I get fatigued sometimes, she said. I have fainted a couple times. It worries her, is all. Of course it does. Why didn't you say something? Jenny stared at me so long I nearly snapped. Because, she finally said, I like that none of you fuss over me the way she does, she admitted. I already know I am broken. A daily reminder does not help. Well, I guess I understand that, I admitted. But she only worries because she cares. I know. Jenny breathed. Her gaze flicked to Kat again. Sometimes I wonder if she cares more than she should. I already knew their relationship was complicated, especially since Kat's memories of their relationship would never match Jenny's. You'll tell me, though, won't you? I said. If you're not feeling well. I don't want you to overdo it. Jenny scratched the side of her face, another telltale sign, a gesture she'd had when we were younger and her thoughts were going in a dozen different directions. Yes, she finally promised. I will tell you when the time comes. She continued toward the truck. It was a strange response, but then Jenny was strange to me most of the time. 
and instinctively, I knew I had to trust her. 50. Alex. I stood by Sophie's rock at the river's edge, still uncertain why I'd asked her to meet me down here. I told myself it was because I was leaving tomorrow, and I had learned a nagging secret I had to tell my best friend. Then I told myself it wasn't because of what I'd learned about JJ, but that there were things to say before I left. I wasn't sure if they were regrets as much as they were truths I wanted her to know, in case something happened. I thought I'd told her everything I needed to the other night when we were here, but now that I was actually leaving, that felt like a lie. Elle's advice about monsters and untainted futures had stuck with me, and I needed to make sure I wasn't running from my future because of my past. The never-setting sun illuminated the mountain peaks in the distance, and the shimmering orange and pink clouds were a glaring reflection on the river's surface. I wondered if the sunsets would be the same in Prince Rupert, or if I needed to soak those in for later, too. The bushes rustled across the water, and I stirred from thoughts of homesickness, though I hadn't even left yet. Squinting through the glare of colors, I expected to see the wolves trotting along the water's edge, making their nightly rounds of the property, but there was nothing there. Hey, Sophie said, coming up behind me. I turned around, my arms unfolding and falling to my sides, pleasantly surprised to notice she was smiling. I saw your note. Yeah, I didn't see you in the house, so I figured you'd get it eventually. I was going through the garage with Phil, looking for the extra bungee cords, she explained. I've been trying not to think about what Ross alluded to in the truck, but as always, what I knew about their developing relationship reared its ugly head again. Don't worry, it's still not what you think. I shook my head. I'm not thinking anything. Liar, she said with a smirk, and she walked past me. Her long hair swayed around her as she climbed up onto the boulder to sit down. You seem good today, I said, wondering if Phil was the difference. You seem better. Sophie inhaled a long, deep breath, holding it in her lungs before her eyes flitted shut and she let it out. I do feel better. I got a full night's sleep, which hasn't happened in I don't know how long. That she was smiling made me resent Phil a little less. I'm glad. I climbed up and sat beside her, even if I'd told myself it was probably a bad idea. Not because I was worried about us touching, not anymore, but because proximity, being so close to her, always made things harder. I'm glad things are finally working themselves out. It seems like all the practicing with Stanley and Phil has really started to pay off. She snorted and tucked her hair behind her ear. I wouldn't go that far. My dreams are still... off. It's only been one night, she said with a sideways glance. But I'm hopeful, so we'll see how it goes. It's amazing what a single night of real freaking sleep can do. I think it really pulled me out of my own head, which I get lost in too much. I looked away and permanently scratched the JJ concern off my list of things to tell her. Sophie didn't need to worry about Elle and JJ. She didn't need more secrets to weigh her down, especially if she was finally getting sleep. What did you want to meet about? She asked more quietly. She tilted her head to look at me. Are you having second thoughts about leaving? Her eyebrows lifted slightly, and she pulled her bottom lip between her teeth. I wasn't sure if it was a worrisome quirk in this instance or something more hopeful than that. Why, do you want me to stay? She shrugged and looked out at the water. I don't want you to leave, even if we agreed it's for the best. There's a difference in knowing you're at the plant or the prison and knowing you're hundreds of miles away and might not come back. I'll come back. Eventually, she said. I have a feeling you're going to find exactly what you need there, though, and it might be a while before I see you again. You think? She slowly nodded. I do. She was quiet a moment. Then she sighed. So then, what's up? I guess I just wanted to say goodbye to you before I left. Really, say goodbye. 
and I wanted to see the sun reflecting in her eyes and memorize the bow of her lips. Slowly, her eyes drifted to me and a small smile curved her lips. I'm glad, she admitted. Our gazes drifted over the river. Somehow this had become our place, even if it didn't hold all the best memories. At least I'd be able to remember her here, us here, in companionable silence, as friends. Sophie tucked her hair behind her ears again, and with a quirk of a grin, she said, I've been thinking about the broom closet a lot lately. The what? Her head tilted and she looked at me, expectant. You know, the broom closet in Whiteley. You followed me in when I was hiding from my mom. Oh, shit. I grinned at the memory. You pretended not to like it very much. She smacked my arm, and I felt a warm jolt. We both looked at her hand, our smiles wavering momentarily. And as if we both gave up caring in the same moment, we peered back out at the water. I thought you were so mysterious, she said, with far too much amusement. I scoffed with mock offense. I was mysterious, thank you very much. Ask any of the girls in your class. I wish I could, she said nostalgically. Except for Jeannie. Why, you didn't like Jeannie? She balked. God, no, she was horrible. And I was jealous, she confessed. I leaned away, shocked at the thought. Sophie, jealous of Jeannie? That seemed ridiculous. Why the hell were you jealous? Because of the way she could make her hips move, she confessed again, a little reluctant. When she caught my grin, she rolled her eyes. She had all the right curves, and I didn't like the way you looked at her. My heart thumped like a double bass against my chest, and I almost laughed at Sophie's ridiculousness and to cover my utter surprise. Even before my unexpected and grand gesture of buying her that pregnancy test, she saw something in me, even if it was just misplaced mystery. You never had anything to worry about, I reassured her. You were the one I followed for lunch, not her. Remember? She gaped at me. You followed me? I thought you said you were buying lunch. So did you, I reminded her. The more I thought about it, a part of me missed the Whiteley days too. I guess we were both liars. Her blue eyes scanned my face, as if she was seeing me for the first time like a veil of truth had lifted and we might actually find common ground before I left. It was like a weight lifting off my chest. Don't look so surprised, I said, glancing away. But I am surprised. Stunned, actually. I didn't even think you noticed me or cared much. You were just a nice guy and an unexpected friend when I needed one. It hadn't been as coincidental as that. Sophie intrigued me the moment I first saw her. You're right when you say we're meant to be in some way, Soph. I feel it too. I just... I had to steady my breath in order to force the words out. Everything out of my mouth would sway the way things would be left between us, and I didn't want to screw things up. I think it's just not in the way you've been thinking. Either of us, for that matter. Sophie trailed a blade of wild grass over her jean-covered thigh as her thoughts drifted far away, maybe to Whiteley or to the summit, maybe even to Phil. All I could think was that I needed us to be okay before I left, and I was relieved that asking her to meet me had been the right thing to do. I told you I wouldn't disappear, I reminded her. I promised, and I mean it this time. I just hope that Whatever happens with you and Phil, the feeling's mutual. I can't imagine my life without you, at least in some way. You're Alex, she said my name in a whisper. I barely turned my head to look at her before she leaned in and pressed her lips to mine. My body tensed, but the instant her hands gripped my face, a flood of warmth poured through me, loosening every coiled muscle and chasing every apprehension away. I could taste the chapstick on her lips, and the scent of lemon oil filled my nose. It was like 
the bulk of the world lifted from my shoulders and everything was perfect. Suspended. Peaceful. Images flashed through my mind like a montage of distant, misplaced histories. Regens and General Harrodson, Sophie's parents and a childhood in Whiteley, snowball fights with Jesse, and the nights we lay in bed in Slana, talking. I saw myself in that broom closet with her, and I saw her sitting in the bathroom with the pregnancy test in her hand, relieved and thinking of me. I saw myself in that hallway the night we found each other, but it was what she felt about me that lured me in deeper. Hope and desire. Love and affection. Need. Alex. She breathed. But I needed more of her. Her mouth, the touch of her hands, her tongue. And I kissed her back harder. Longer, deeper. I pulled her against me, floating in a euphoric haze that left me feeling sky high and unstoppable. Nothing in that moment mattered but Sophie and me. And for the first time, I began to realize no amount of distance would ever dissolve the chemistry between us. Nothing either of us said or did would change the way I felt. We were Antony and Cleopatra, Romeo and Juliet. We were made for one another, and our epic love story would go down in history. But as the images and memories continued to flash in the back of my mind... Phil's face became more and more prominent. It felt almost like an anvil crushing the others out, bringing a sense of desperate want for him with it, even a frustration towards me that felt like a thousand bee stings in my mind. Phil was in her bed again. Her hair rumpled. She was kissing him in the barn, then sleeping in her bed with his arms wrapped around her. I felt her unbridled anger toward me, a hatred that cut me to the quick, and a desperation for Phil. Tearing my eyes open, I pushed Sophie away from me. Are you fucking serious right now, Sophie? All of the ease and comfort of having her in my arms splintered, and my pounding heart shuddered and cracked, and the indescribable hurt sunk further in. That, that shouldn't have happened, she breathed. She looked as dumb as I felt. Then, her face crumpled, but I was too incensed to care why. I wasn't even thinking about Phil. Oh, God, just stop, Sophie. I jumped down off the rock, done trying to be open and patient. You can say that you're confused, but at some point you have to just admit that you and I are done. Stop pretending this fucking thing with Phil is nothing and just admit it already. Every word I blurted was like hot air escaping a balloon and I felt a little bit lighter. I can't take it anymore. At that kiss, Alex, what? I bit out. You kiss me and somehow all I see is fucking Phil? You put all that on me, even your hatred toward me, and now I'm supposed to forget about it? I shook my head, still in disbelief. I'm done with all of it. You know I can never hate you, she said, squeezing her eyes shut. Sophie rubbed at her temples like her head might explode. <laughs> Welcome to the fucking club. I don't know why he keeps popping into my head or why I thought of any of that, she breathed almost hysterically. He's in my dreams, Alex. Her voice was barely audible. You don't understand. Oh, I think I do. I groaned and ran my hands over my head, digging my fingers into my skin so I'd feel anything other than my heart breaking. Sophie climbed down off the rock, but I didn't offer to help her. I didn't dare touch her. I couldn't bear it. Please don't hate me. Her voice was a desperate whisper, and as much as I wanted to hate her in that moment, it gutted me instead. I know you have every right to, but please, if you hated me, I would lose it. It's hard enough that you're leaving. Tears fell from the brim of her lashes, and even if I knew I had the right to be pissed off, I still couldn't stand to see her cry. More than that, I hated that somehow this all felt like my fault again, like I'd been too greedy and hoped for too much. I can never hate you, Sophie. I assured her as softly as I could and reminded myself, too, as I forced my eyes to hers. But nothing like that will ever happen between us again. Ever. I wouldn't survive it. 
No more second-guessing myself, no more hoping things would change. They wouldn't, not with Sophie, and I was done having the same conversation with the same fucking outcome. I needed her away from me. I needed to get on that bus and leave this place once and for all. Her chin trembled, and even in my determination to flee, my instinct was to close the distance between us and somehow make her tears go away. Soph, she hurried past me, almost at a run and disappeared up the path toward the house. None of that was what I'd expected, but it was exactly what I needed to break away from her completely. We weren't destined for an epic love story, only a tragic ending. 51. Sophie. My hands were shaking, my eyes blurred with unshed tears. My heart raced so fast I couldn't catch my breath as I paced back and forth by the bridge, hidden from sight. I didn't want anyone to see me like this, so spun out I could barely breathe. My mind was out of control. My thoughts didn't feel like my own, but like my own mind was against me. In one moment, I knew with every single part of me that I wanted Alex to come back to me, because he was mine and I was his, no matter how long it'd taken us to get there. Phil was a shelter in the storm, but Alex was the sun. Now, Alex might never come back, and I didn't blame him. I wrung my hands as I retraced my steps back and forth. I needed to talk to someone. I needed help or divine intervention. I could be indecisive at times, and it was true that Phil filled a hole that Alex left every time he pushed me away but I made my decision, so why was this happening? Was my ability clinging to heightened, overripe senses? Anything that was too close to the surface? Was I losing my mind like the rest of the lunatics? Imagining Alex's expression sent body-racking sobs through me, and I leaned up against a birch tree to steady myself. Sophie? I barely heard my name across the river. When I opened my eyes, Phil was running over the bridge. Soph, what happened? I shook my head, uncertain how to explain. He wrapped his arms around me, and somehow, every ache inside me lessened. Every nerve was soothed. I want it out of me, I cried into his shoulder. I want it to go away. Shh, it's okay, Sophie. I'm here. I want to help. Tell me what I can do to help. I feel so full, I croaked. I feel like I'm drowning. Then let it out, he breathed. Let go. I shook my head, knowing he would never want that. But at the same time, deep down, I knew I should listen to him. Even his touch made the fog clear a little, and the weight on my chest lifted. Looking into his kind, asking brown eyes, I waited for some sort of confirmation that he was sure, that he could handle it, even if part of me knew I shouldn't even consider it. But the decision was made the instant Phil dipped his chin, his gaze pleading with me to let him in. So I did. Without any other explanation, I cut every thread left of my control and I opened myself for all of it to pour out of me. Suddenly, I wanted him to see. I needed him to know what was happening, because I was going mad stewing in it alone. I showed him the good parts of me, and the ugliest ones. He saw my moments with him, my dreams, and I showed him my kiss with Alex. I let Phil feel all of it, every laugh and regret, every fear and sorrow. I felt myself deflating as I sobbed into his shoulder. His embrace tightened around me even more. I don't know how many moments, breaths, or minutes passed, but the longer Phil held me, the lighter I felt. The more I cried, the more my mind began to clear. I felt his own fear and shock, his concern and understanding. More than anything, I could feel his pity and confusion. Body numb 
and limbs heavy with exhaustion. I lifted my head and timidly took a step back, afraid to see the look on his face. I'm sorry, I breathed. My nose and eyes were swollen, and my lips were chapped. It was too much. Yes, he said, his eyebrows lowering. The brightness in his eyes dimmed, and the shadows beneath them seemed to age him by years. Then he shook his head. It is too much for one person to bear. I blinked at him. I'm mad? Why would I be mad at you? I'm exhausted for you, Sophie. I'm overwhelmed, and I'm feeling a little bit... He swallowed thickly. Uncomfortable? His eyes flicked to me. But I'm not mad, Sophie. Then you know that I just made a huge mistake. And he just needs time to cool down, he said, trying to make me feel better. But I knew Alex better than that. And this was it. Alex and I would never be anything close to what we were before. I'd broken his trust too many times, and it was too late. Alex might return after the summit, but the Alex I knew was gone for good. My eyes began to blur again, and Phil reached out to brush the moisture from my cheek. You've lived the last two years worrying about you and Alex, he said softly. And I know he means a lot to you. Trust me, he said. He shut his eyes and took a ragged breath. I know too much, actually. But you have to let this go, Soph. My head was shaking before he could finish. But he hates me now. No, he said, and it was almost a scolding. Alex doesn't hate you. He'll never hate you. But you need to give him space. You both need space. Bill was right. My going to him would only piss him off more, make him angrier, and he wouldn't listen. Come on, he said, tugging me down to sit on the lip of the bridge with him. Give us a moment to recover from that before we start talking about your broken heart, okay? I, uh, could use a minute to process. You'll need a year at least, I told him. I choked out a laugh and sniffled. How come it's so easy being around you? I'm not sure, but then I can't think of much right now, he said. My brain is full, and my body is wound so tight it feels like it might detonate at any moment. Wrapping his arm around my shoulder, he pulled me to his side and rested his cheek against the top of my head. I think we deserve a drink, he said his voice frayed and tattered. Thank you, I breathed. I'm not sure what I would have done if you hadn't been here. Had a convulsion, probably, he muttered. I glanced behind us. What were you doing on the other side of the river anyway? Oh, uh, I was just checking to make sure we hadn't lost the boat. Jackson said he had a bad feeling and I wanted to make sure that wasn't it. A bad feeling? That's not good, I thought aloud. That was never good. 52. L. All of us stood outside the prison, reluctantly waiting for Jackson and Alex to grab their bags from inside so that we could all say our goodbyes. Ross wasn't as agitated as he'd been, which was a relief, and Phil still seemed content to stay behind. We'd worked him so hard that the poor guy looked exhausted. Then again, none of us had gotten much sleep. There was too much excitement, and in my case, too much anxiety. So we'd finished loading the bus with food, clothes, camping supplies, emergency tools, weapons, and biodiesel for the road. Even with all we'd done, it didn't feel like enough. So much could go wrong, and with Jackson's uneasy feeling, it was impossible to ignore that we could be making a very grave decision by splitting up. All right, Bert hollered. Load them up 
Time to go. He spun his finger in the air to circle everyone up, and the dreaded rapid fire of my heartbeat made my tears threaten to surface. Everyone began their quick goodbyes, no one wanting to stop long enough to dwell on anything other than the excitement we were all struggling to hold on to. Bert, I said, walking up to him with open arms. Try not to get everyone into trouble, or you'll be sorry when you come back. I threatened him with a wink. I would never. Realizing I'd miss him just like the rest. Sure you wouldn't. Bo stood next to him, with Thea already crying that her brother was leaving. But what if you don't come back? She whined. Don't say that, Bo chided. Jeez. Well, it could happen. It won't. Luna will protect me. And Jackson and Alex, Thea added, as if Bo needed reminding. Yeah, she'll protect them too, he said grumpily, though I could see the emotion in his eyes as his sister fretted over him. Okay, well, bring me back something good at least, she said. You promise? Yeah, yeah. Go say goodbye to Jackson, Squiggles, I told Thea. He's going to need extra hugs, okay? She ran over to him, nearly catapulting into his arms. When I looked at Bo again, I had to bite my tongue as he looked up at me with uncertainty in his eyes. I forced a giant smile and crouched down in front of him. You better keep everyone in line for me, Bo, I told him. I trust you more than the rest of them. You and Luna are in charge, okay? His little chest rose fast and hard, but he didn't say anything. You know, we could use protection too. Are you certain you want to go? Yeah. He nodded his head emphatically, like he was trying to convince himself. I'm sure. Littlefoot and the others will protect you. Okay then. I'll miss you. Bo flung his arms around me, squeezing so tightly that tears pricked the corners of my eyes. You're going to have such a good adventure. I can't wait to hear all about it when you come home. He pulled away, brushing a tear from his cheek. Time will go by so quick, you'll be home before you know it. Combing my fingers through his hair, I took a long, final look at him and kissed his cheek. I love you, and I'll see you in a few weeks. Love you too, he breathed and pursed his lips. Make sure Thea doesn't ruin my markers when I'm gone. Okay, I promised, leaning closer. I'll hide them if I have to. With a wink, I rubbed the top of Luna's black tufted head and gave her a goodbye pat, silently pleading for her to keep them all safe. Kat and Jenny said their goodbyes, and I heard Stanley's nervous cough and Woody's high-pitched laugh. But when my eyes locked with Jackson's, all of that faded away. I've decided I don't want you to go, I told him, only half joking. He pulled me into his chest and lowered his lips to my ear. I'm gonna miss you like hell, he said, his voice a soft rumble. His hazel eyes were brimming with everything that made my heart full and my insides melt. I'll miss you too, I whispered because it was all I could manage. Rising to tiptoes, I pressed my mouth to his, inhaling the scent of him. So much, I breathed against his mouth. You better come back in one piece or I'll kill you myself. Jackson kissed me back, an impassioned, desperate kiss. And when he opened his eyes, they were shimmering through a smile. We'll be fine, I promise. You're the one who had a bad feeling, I reminded him. I still do, he said. It's just the uncertainty of the unknown. Well, you have a good team, and I know you'll be safe. Everything will be fine. Yes, he assured me. It will. With one more peck on the lips, I took a step back, knowing I might really change my mind if I lingered in his arms a moment longer. Jackson grabbed hold of my hand. I love you, Elle, he said, 
squeezing my fingers tightly. That was all it took. My nostrils flared, my vision blurred, and I wrapped my arms around his shoulders again, nuzzling against him. I love you too, so much. I kissed his neck, then one more kiss on his lips, and forced myself to take a step back. I wiped the moisture from beneath my eyes. You'll find a surprise in your duffel, I told him, and his eyebrows lifted slightly. I knew where his mind was going before he opened his mouth. It's edible and appropriate, I clarified. He winked at me with a chuckle. As I turned to say goodbye to Alex, Sophie walked up to him, both of them visibly straightening. She looked at me with a timid smile, then at Alex. I just wanted you to know that I'll miss you, and I do hope you come home, but I'll understand if you don't. Their gazes were fixed, and Alex's cheeks reddened. Goodbye, Soph. She lifted her chin, like it was the last shred of control she had left, and she stepped around me to say the rest of her goodbyes. Alex watched her walk away, and I saw a look in his eyes I'd never seen before. A look that worried me a little. Are you okay? I whispered as I wrapped my arms around him. Reining in my ever-increasing hover mode, I didn't pry more than that. Yep. I laughed, glad one of us was ready for this. Way to sell it. You still want to do this, huh? He nodded without hesitation. Still doing this. I took a step back and appraised the man he'd become right before my eyes. His broad shoulders were back, and consternation darkened his eyes. He was determined. He was ready. And I knew this was what he needed. Look out for Jackson, will you? I think he's going to miss home more than he thinks. He's a big teddy bear underneath all that ruggedness, you know. Alex came in for one more hug. Will do. Then, he took a decided step back, grabbed his duffel bag off the ground, and flung it over his shoulder. We ain't getting any younger, people! Woody said as he stepped up into the bus. Ah, uh, wait a minute, I commanded, and everyone looked at me as I backed away from the group. A photo of everyone before you leave. There were mumbles and there were groans, but I only glared in return as they filed into place. Closer together, I said, looking through the lens. Closer. Ginny and Kat, get in there too. As Kat opened her mouth to protest, I said, now please. They looked at one another and obeyed. Okay, on the count of three, I said, holding up my fingers as I counted down. One, two, three. I took three photos, hoping that at least one of them would turn out okay, since I wasn't using digital and wouldn't be able to tell until I developed the film. Oh, Kat said, you get in there now. I'll take one with you and everyone. Yes, thank you, I said, clapping my hands, and hurried over to Jenny to take Kat's place. Ross, stop scowling, Kat told him, but I didn't dare look at him and risk ruining the picture. Or not, she muttered. Okay then, one, two, three. Kat snapped a picture or two, and with a few more grumbles and groans, Alex, Bo, Jackson, Bert, Woody, and Cat climbed into the bus. Bert took his place in the driver's seat, and the bus rumbled to life. It was harder than I'd expected to watch them load up and take their seats, because it finally felt real. Part of my family was leaving, and I could feel their absence already. Jackson gazed out the window, his eyes locking with mine one more time. And with an air kiss in his direction, I waved them all goodbye as they drove through the prison gates. It feels wrong already, Sophie said. They'll be fine, Stanley assured her. Woody is a survivor. They all are. Like the rest of us, with our forced optimism, Stanley said it to remind himself as well. With a small smile, he looked at me then at Sophie and Phil. Then he patted little Thea's head 
and finally his gaze leveled on Jenny. Come on, let's get out of the sun and take a much-needed break. He headed toward the side entrance, and everyone but Jenny and I followed. She took my hand in hers. They will all be back soon. Part 3, August. 53, Alex. After two days on the road, driving through the epic landscape of British Columbia, a place I never really gave much thought to, I lost myself in the beauty of it. It was like Whitehorse, but more. The trees seemed leafier and more compact. The mountain peaks felt closer, and there were clouds of mist settled between the trees everywhere I looked. As stupid as it seemed, over 800 miles from home felt like a different world. Or maybe that was because we were embarking on the unknown, so each mile further away felt mysterious. We'd followed the forest-lined road for hours. They were in better condition than we'd expected since no one had driven on them, though they were rough in a few areas from harsh weather, overgrown roots, and fallen trees. The outdated tour bus groaned every now and again around the bends and curves as we went but we'd grown used to it. We'd been living in it for nearly 48 hours, sleeping in it, playing cards in it, and planning. She'll be up this road another half mile, Woody said, staring at his map. He met Bert's gaze in the rearview mirror. Got it, Bert called back. He drove with his window down, his silver shoulder-length hair whipping in the wind, keeping him awake. It was out of the question for any of us to take the wheel. He simply wouldn't have it. The bus was his baby, we'd learned within five minutes on the road. He knew which windows tended to get stuck, which overhead lights were temperamental, and that when using the tin can-sized bathroom, you should only ever go number one. You're sure quiet over there, Woody said, watching Cat from his seat across the aisle from us. The bench seats were cushioned, but covered in a horrific 90s pattern that was threadbare. The ones in the front, in particular, where we were all sitting. Am I? Kat didn't bother looking away from her window. She'd definitely been quiet the whole drive, not her snarky self, which Ross would have appreciated. Other than Jackson's radio check-in with the White Horse gang last night, we hadn't talked to them since, but it was easy enough to picture them feeding the animals and making trips to the fish wheel. Are you rethinking this decision, Kat? Jackson asked her sparing a quick glance at Bo to ensure he was still asleep in his curled-up knot with Luna against the mound of duffel bags behind me. Kat lifted her head and looked at him, as if she was waking up from a dream. Then she looked at Woody and me and shook her head. No, not at all. Then what's with the frown? Woody smiled at her. But something told me Kat wasn't as easily sidetracked as Bo and Thea when it came to his goofy faces. Just. Anxious to be there already, she admitted. She leaned back into the window and continued watching the trees whiz by. We all knew Kat was headed back to Prince Rupert on a mission, even if not all of us were entirely sure what it was she was looking for. Woody knew better than to press her, though, and he didn't pry any further. We've got a roadblock, Bert called from the captain's chair. Wake up, Bo, I said, shaking him gently. I stood up from my seat, grabbing the headrest to steady myself as the bus shuddered over bumps and peered out the windshield. There was a cement roadblock painted in black and neon yellow stripes and four heavily armed men, two on each side of the road, as we slowed, drawing near. I bet their abilities are far more fearsome than those battle rifles they're gripping, Bert muttered as he rolled his window down the rest of the way to talk to them. I looked at Woody. Grateful he was there in case he needed to block any unwanted ability intrusions this trip. Stevens, the black man with the dreadlocks. He's a null, like you, Kat said, glancing at Woody. And he's an all right guy. You don't have to worry about him. Just all right? Woody lifted a bushy eyebrow. Don't worry, nothing crazy like that. He just thinks he's God's gift to women. It's irritating. What about the others? I asked, only able to see that one of the soldiers was a woman with a petite frame compared to the others and that the other two guys had pale faces. I couldn't tell more than that. I don't know them, but it's safe to say one can probably tell if we're lying, 
In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the guns are more for show. I don't think that guy on the left with Chew in his lip is a soldier. I don't remember seeing him before. So these are all likely the baddest of the bad, Bert muttered. Noted. He pulled to a stop at the barricade. The soldiers guarding either side of the road didn't move. I wasn't sure they even blinked. Welcome. A guy with a nasally voice stepped out of a small booth with a clipboard in his hand. He stopped at the window, peering at Bert in the oversized bus. He eyed Bert warily at first, then his expression opened more. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume you're here for the summit. He rose onto his tiptoes, trying to see inside the bus. Yes, there are six of us. And a wolf, Bert added. The man at the window was tall and skinny, with dark hair and a beak-like nose. He wore glasses, and when he smiled, I instantly felt better. As long as they're friendly, all animals and people are welcome, he said. I glanced at Bo. All animals meant that other attendees might have brought animal friends too. Bo's mouth pursed as he looked at me, realizing what I did. I'm Jonah, admissions and logistics coordinator of this shindig. As I'm sure you can imagine, I need names and abilities, as well as a brief summary of your visit. Now, if you'll step out of the bus, we'll get you squared away and you can head through. The four military personnel didn't move, but they were there for a purpose, even if it was only to give us pause. It was working. Quickly, I glanced at Jackson, who gave me a nod of reassurance to do as the man said. But Kat didn't wait for that. No guns, she warned us as she walked toward the door, looking at Bert to open it. The instant he did, Kat stepped out to meet Jonah as he came around the front of the bus. Ah, Kat, you're back, he said. I could barely hear him through the scuff of boots on the floor and the creak of the bus as the remaining five of us filed out. Woody and Bert stepped off next, then Jackson, Bo, and Luna, who hadn't left Bo's side as usual, and me. Jonah offered his hand to each of us as we lined up to introduce ourselves. It's good to meet you. He jotted our names down and paused when he got to Luna. And who does this beauty belong to? He simpered, holding his clipboard to his chest. It was like he was talking to a toddler. Luna stared at him, then looked at Bo, like she was waiting for a command. Luna's with me, Bo said, rubbing her head absently. She's friendly. Jonah's smile grew. Oh, good. I believe we've already had one other animal telepath arrive. He started writing on his clipboard again. Didn't come with an animal, though. I'll make sure you get placement in quadrant one. There are some kids your age there. You might make some friends. Jonah winked at me. I assumed because I had my hand protectively placed on Bo's shoulder. Thanks, I told him. Okay, now. He scanned his clipboard again. I have your names, Luna included, and I know what the kid can do. What about the rest of you? He looked at the row of us, expectant, and like he was asking what food we wanted to order for dinner. Kat stepped forward. Alex has ability alteration. He can amplify through touch, she said. Okay. Jonah began thoughtfully taking notes. Jackson has heightened senses of sorts. Jonah glanced at her. Speed, strength. No, intuition, I think. She looked at Jackson with a shrug. Yeah, he said. He seemed to be watching Jonah and the military all at once. That sounds about right. Jackson wasn't overly nice, but he wasn't rude either, just very cautious as we all stood surrounded by dense woods, perfect for soldiers to hide in, without weapons of our own. Woody here can null, and Bert can control mechanical energy. Oh, how useful. Everyone will want to be your friend then, Jonah teased. He lowered his clipboard with a smile. And you, Cat, what's your ability again? Five pairs of eyes were riveted on her as she glanced at us. We'd been wanting answers, and I wondered how vague an answer she'd give him. Electrical energy manipulation, she said so quietly, I thought she might be trying to hide it from us. I think. Are you for real? I stepped out of line with a smile. You control what, like lightning and power lines? As in, she could have been really useful last winter. I have before, she said brusquely and stared at Jonah. Shall we continue? 
And with that, we were all back in line, awaiting direction. But I was bubbling with curiosity to know more, and how she might be able to help at the hydro plant. Jonah cleared his throat. Right, well, here's how it works. He tore off a sheet of paper and handed it to Bert. I'm giving you this number, which will tell you where to park. There will be signage as you get further down the road, indicating where your block is. This, he said, pointing to an address on the same street, is where you'll be staying. You'll want to drive there and unload your things, then you can leave the bus in the parking lot with all the other vehicles. Though I haven't seen many. Just be careful as you drive. Most folks who didn't come by boat rode horses, so keep your eyes peeled. I glanced at everyone, finding it difficult not to grow a little anxious in my excitement as I imagined how new and uncharted all of it would be. I'm assuming you're staying for the full two weeks? Jonah glanced from Cat to our giant bus. That's the plan, Jackson said. His eyes were set on Jonah, and his voice gave nothing away. He wasn't just reserved, but hopeful, and knowing Jackson, he was definitely on alert. We're here to discuss our settlement. Oh, great. There's a convening at sunset at City Hall. When you get to registration, you can tell them you'd like an audience with Huck. They'll work it out for you. For now, he continued, handing each of us a different colored sticker. You'll need to wear these so that everyone knows who you are and what ability family you fall under. Once you get into registration, they'll put a permanent stamp on your hand so you won't have to worry about the sticker coming off. I peeled the back off and stuck mine onto my chest. The summit was starting to feel more real with every breath. I think that settles it. Oh, he turned to face the road. Once you get past this barricade, you'll follow Yellowhead Highway all the way to the waterfront. It's a handful of kilometers or so. There will be signs everywhere for quadrants and parking, so can't miss them. But, he said, shoving his glasses further up his nose, if you see any in a red vest, they're working the summit and can help you. There's a dozen or so of us. Thanks, Jonah. Cat pointed to the bus. We better get a move on. The rain is coming. We all stopped in our tracks to look at her. Miss Aurora Monroe herself. She might not have looked like Storm, but Cat was a mutant. And if her ability was as fierce as her snark and glare, I imagined she could light the sky with fury. Cat rolled her eyes. I can't feel it. I can see it. She pointed to the misty clouds. Bo sniggered, clearly excited and happy for once. Then we climbed back into the bus. I wasn't entirely sure what to expect, but we were finally here, and that was good enough for me. 54. Sophie. Phil and I sat at the bridge, and our companionable silence after what I'd gone through with Alex was a welcomed relief. My mind felt lighter having perched the weight of every burden, and even if nothing was figured out, at least I didn't feel as alone. Come on, he said, and with a grunt he jumped to his feet. We need to go. His voice was rushed and worried, and yet still so smooth, it was like butter. He reached for my hand, leading me over the bridge, and soon we were running. The woods were a blur around us. Hurry, he called. I saw a flash of a girl with dark hair again, a blurry face, surrounded by muddled darkness, and I froze. Just as quickly as she appeared, she was gone again. What are you doing, Soph? Come on, he urged. We need to hurry. I felt a lick of apprehension up the back of my neck, but still... I fell into step behind him again, tearing through the woods like we were running for our lives. The tall grasses whipped and smacked at my ankles, and when I looked down, I was wearing my running shoes. When the old hunting cabin came into view, I felt a mental tug, and fleetingly, I thought about mosquitoes, swarms of them, and I was afraid. I thought about Alex. Come on! When I looked up, Alex wasn't there. Phil was the one leading me toward the cabin's door. Wait, why are we coming back here? I said, pulling against him. It was dark inside, and a visceral fear rippled over me. I was here with Alex. I stared at the hunting cabin again, remembering him and me trapped inside. 
His comforting arms were wrapped around me, and I could almost feel his body pressed up against mine. Stop that, Sophie, Phil growled, and he spun on me. You're with me now. Stop thinking about him for once and focus on me. I pulled my hands from his and took a step back. I don't want to be here with you. Phil's brows lowered in anger, and he took a step forward. Sophie, he said, almost desperate. The lines on his face eased, and he leaned in, kissing me before I could recoil. At first, his lips were bruising, but then they softened, and I felt warm and coveted. I wanted to stay with him, wherever he wanted to go, forever. I'm yours, I breathed against his lips. The sudden desire to be with him was overpowering. Forever. But as I said the words, I knew they were wrong. Forced, like the words were summoned from my throat. Something about all of it was very, very wrong. As I tried to pull away, Phil's hands clasped on both sides of my face, holding me in place and unrelenting. Let go, I demanded, and pried at his fingers, trying to tear my face away from him. His grip tightened, and his nails cut into my skin. Phil, you're hurting me. I'm done playing nice, Sophie, he seethed, and there was a blackness in his eyes that sent fear coiling through me. Do you want to end up dead like your mother? I gasped, and my heart stopped as tears began to sting my eyes. What? I hit at his hands again. I'm tired of you making this so damn difficult. If I didn't need that pretty face of yours, you'd already be dead. Get your hands off of me! I commanded through hot tears, still pulling at his fingers. I was willing to break them if I had to, but they were like cement against my skin. The more I struggled, the less I could move, and the forest facade around us flickered in my panic as I gasped for air. It's a dream, I realized. It wasn't real. This isn't Phil. Stop being a difficult, whiny bitch, he seethed. Alex is gone. I'm here. Let him go. Like my sudden hatred of Phil was all the kindling I needed to send a blaze of determination coursing through me, I kicked him in the groin, forcing him to loosen his grip on my face. And I willed myself awake. When my eyes opened, I was lying in my dark room. It was daylight, but I could only tell from the naturally lit hallway outside my door. My blackout curtains were drawn, my comforter was thrown off of my bed, and my heart was racing a little. Wiping the tears from my cheeks, I sat up. My mom, why had she been a part of my dream? I climbed out of bed, not wanting to be in my room another minute. Sleep was tainted now. I was growing more and more frightened by what I'd see next. It all felt so real, so terrible. And not even Phil could help me make it go away. It was almost noon, which was surprising. I was barely able to stay asleep until the sun rose, let alone sleep until noon. That meant Elle had poked her head in at some point to make sure I was breathing, then left me to sleep since she knew I needed it. Blowing out a deep breath, I ran a brush through my hair more forcefully than I needed to, anxious to get out in the sunshine, where the air was fresh and the daylight would fill all the shadows of my mind. Phil was always different in my dreams than reality, but he'd never been so aggressive before. He'd never frightened me, and he'd never threatened me or said such horrible things about my mom. I donned a clean pair of shorts and a tank top, knowing I was expected to clean a lot of salmon for smoking. Usually just imagining the slippery scales beneath my fingers made me want to dry heave, but I welcomed it today. Throwing my hair up into a ponytail, I headed into the bathroom for a quick face wash and teeth brushing. Even if I knew it was a dream or a twisted memory, I couldn't get Bill's expression out of my head. The pinch of his features the hardness of his generally soft gaze, even his tone. All of it was wrong. Do you want to end up dead like your mother? 
staring at myself in the bathroom mirror, I remembered the girl with the dark hair and blurred features. Nora. She was in my dreams again. But why? I splashed water on my face as my mind began spiraling down a very dark path. Nora was someone from Phil's past. And yet, the mosquitoes and the cabin, even my mother, those were from mine. My dreams. My memories. I flicked the bathroom light off and made my way down the stairs, trying to push all of it from my mind. Even if Phil had seen everything in my head and knew my memories, there was no way he could actually be in my brain. He could sense abilities in people, but he couldn't go in my mind. Could he? Why would he even want to? I walked into the living room and heard voices on the deck. Getting situated and then they're going to the first meeting tonight at sunset. It was Ross, reporting in about the summit. Heading for the screen door, I saw Elle sitting with him at the patio table. She and Ross both looked at me. I gave them an awkward late morning wave. What's this I hear about the summit? Hey, Soph, Bill said. I whirled around, nearly cringing at the sound of his voice as he stepped out of the kitchen with a piece of jerky between his lips. But when I laid my eyes on his easy smile and floppy hair, he was the same old Phil, smiling and open, and some of the unease faded away. I didn't know you were here, I said. Yeah, we've been here about an hour. I came with Ross, hoping you'd want to practice since it's been a while. But Elle said you were sleeping in. Any more good dreams about me? He said his eyebrows dancing. His smile was strange, juxtaposed to his dream counterpart, angry and forceful. Not good ones, no, I admitted. And once again, I wondered if it was possible for him to be doing this to me. Uh-oh, that's not a good look. Want to talk about it? He crossed his arms over his chest, like he was settling in for another mind-meld overload and his smile waned. You were mean to me, I explained, uncertain what I should tell him. Mean to you? Did you eat the last of my now and laters? It was a joke, and it did make me smile, but I still couldn't be sure of what was happening. While I didn't believe the Phil standing in front of me could or would mess with my mind like that, I had no other logical explanation, unless I really was losing my mind. Is there anything I can do? He took a step closer, studying me. No, I don't think so. A distraction might help. Do you want to? Want to what? Oh, practice? Right. Remembering the panic as his hands gripped my face, Sparring practice didn't seem like a bad idea. Yeah, sure. That might actually help. But I have to clean salmon today. He pointed over his shoulder. We'll do a warm-up, then I'll help you. Come on, it's getting hot. Thanks, I said. But my thoughts were elsewhere as we stepped outside onto the deck. Bill didn't seem like a likely candidate for mind-altering me all the time but then I couldn't think of a logical explanation either. I looked at Elle, about to ask her if we could talk later, when she turned to me. Don't worry, I'll fill you in on what's going on at the summit later. It's all good news so far. Oh, okay, good. I forced a smile. Elle turned back to Ross, but did a double take. Soph, what's wrong? More bad dreams? Um, yeah. Actually, can I talk to you about it later? Of course. She stood up. Want to talk about it now? I wait for her to sit back down. No, later is fine. I'm going to get started on cleaning the fish. Okay, Elle said, a little reluctant. But I knew she'd find me later to talk. Jenny is at the fish wheel. And Thea is, well, she's supposed to be helping her, 
but I think she ran off to play with Arya again. I was about to go find them both. All right, we'll head that way. I nodded to Phil. Let's help JJ first. We made our way down the steps and saw JJ heading toward the skinning shed with a cart of fish. Oh, man, Phil murmured. That's a lot of work ahead of us. Tell me about it, I grumbled. Welcome to homesteading. You should bring Stanley over to help us tomorrow. If nothing else, it will be entertaining. Stanley didn't do slimy, sticky, or bloody. Not well, anyway. But it was amusing to watch. Ha! Will do. As JJ lowered the fish cart, her arms shook, and we hurried over to the skinning shed to help her. Hey, we'll help with that, I said as she took a step back and wiped the sweat from her brow. Thank you, she said, a little more raspy than usual. I'm still getting used to this hard work. She glanced around. I did have a helper, but I'm not sure where she ran off to. Well, if Thea ditched her chores, that just means she gets to make us all dinner, I said, only partially joking. That will be a fun experience. I'll grab some aprons and gloves. Phil disappeared into the skinning shed, and I turned the faucet and the wash bin on to scrub my hands clean. Here. JJ handed me a towel as she braced herself with one hand on the edge of the table. When I reached for the towel, our fingers brushed, and I felt the flare of all-consuming fatigue and a dimness inside of her. It was a strange sort of hollowness and pain I hadn't been expecting, and it made the deepest, most primal parts of me run cold. I'm not sure what I was thinking pushing that card up here, she said, wiping her brow again with a shaking hand. I'd felt death in Ross, and I knew the bleakness that came with it, the mental struggle and the fading light. JJ wasn't just tired. She was dying. She knew it, too. Her body was weak and riddled with pain, though she was very good at hiding it. When she realized I was staring at her, the forced openness of her expression fell. Realization shadowed her milky eyes. You have to tell Elle, I whispered, but it was more of a command. It was the first thought I had and instantly fell from my lips. She needs to know. JJ wasn't dense, even if she liked to hide behind her differentness, using it as a shield to keep her secret safe. She knew what I meant, and the resignation furrowing her brow told me she also knew it was only a matter of time before someone found out. JJ licked her lips and swallowed thickly, holding my gaze. I will, she said quietly. Soon. I grabbed hold of JJ's hand, needing to know all of it. Her memories might have been foggy, but I could still feel her emotions. They were ripe and overflowing with exhaustion. And she was afraid, not of death, but of telling Elle the truth. Part of JJ's resolve to accept she was dying had wavered when she met Elle. She felt a longing now to live and breathe alongside her sister until they were old, to give Elle the sister she'd always wanted, or the best one she could be. It's why you left Kat to come here, I realized with a sharp breath. JJ took her hand from mine and glanced furtively around, like she was worried someone would hear. Kat believes there is a remedy and that she will find it. But I believe there is a natural way of things. And this, what I am, is not natural. I do not think I am meant to be alive. You didn't know how much time you had left. With cloudy, green-flecked eyes, JJ glanced at Ross and Elle chatting at the table. I had to know her, was all she said. And I thought I understood, though my heart broke for Elle and for JJ. Despite having gotten a second chance with her sister, 
Al was going to lose her again, and probably soon. It is why Woody and Kat have gotten word to the Ranskins, asking them to come, she added. You what? I know they mean very much to all of you, and they are not here now because of me. I will rectify that as well. My mind spun as she continued. It will help to have them here when it happens, I think. Or perhaps I should leave. No, I said, reaching for her, turning my ability off out of sheer desperation. No, you can't leave her again. You can't just disappear, and you can't tell her something like that and expect her to let you leave. I shook my head, lowering my voice as Phil came back out of the skinning shed. You have to promise me you won't leave, JJ. I don't know if Elle would come back from that. I held my breath until JJ dipped her chin, giving me her word. Even then, I didn't know how I was going to be able to look Elle in the eyes again. Tell her, I rushed out as Phil drew closer, and do it soon. 55. Alex. After unloading our bags in the four-bedroom house we were squatting in across from the park, some of us napped and snored, practically shaking the house rafters like Bert and Woody. Others, like Cat and Bo, disappeared almost immediately. Cat left to ask around for the cure she was looking for, and Bo, with Luna's protection, went exploring in the park across the street after having been cooped up in the bus for the past couple of days. Meanwhile, Jackson and I were too anxious for the summit to start, and too curious to lock ourselves away or sit still for very long. So we paced and explored the house that used to belong to a family of four. Their pictures were still on the walls, though they were long dead. I wasn't sure if I would ever get used to stuff like that. By the time the sun descended in the sky, and after a couple of hours of stewing, it was finally time to head down to City Hall, a few blocks away. There was a marketplace set up outside that I could see from our porch, and sun gleamed on the harbor behind it. I zipped up my hoodie and basked in the cool breeze. Hey, old guys, I called into the house, tired of waiting on them. They grumbled and patted at their hair, must from sleep. What is this, a vacation? Bert and Woody ignored me as they filed out the door, still bleary-eyed. Bo, let's go. Jackson called across the street. Bo and Luna dropped the branch they were playing tug-of-war with as Jackson waved them over, and I impatiently led the way. Ugh, wait, Bert said through a yawn behind me. We're missing a body. Where's Cat? She's probably already there, I called back. Unlike Bert, who scuffed his feet against the pavement the whole way down the road like he didn't have a care in the world, Woody picked up his pace. It was like it finally hit him that what he'd wanted all along might finally come to something more than a giant, empty city and its eleven keepers. The result of being at the summit could mean huge things for Whitehorse, and Woody, not unsupervised, would be at the helm. The streets of Prince Rupert's downtown harbor area were like any other city streets, with weeds peeking up through cracks in the road and a good amount of trash and debris stuck in small crevices, matted and forgotten. The difference was there were people here. Survivors were bunked in the houses we passed as we made our way through the neighborhood, and there was a buzz of voices as we drew closer to the marketplace. The people walking up and down the street waved at us, and we waved tentatively back. But mostly, we all just stared at one another, like we were all in a strange daze of amazement. I couldn't remember the last time I'd seen dozens of people, and there was something almost unnerving about it, like it couldn't possibly be real. Four rows of vendors and booths, and tents with awning covers flapping in the breeze, filled half of a giant parking lot. There were a handful of older men and women, and kids, a lot of them, and teenagers. The air was alive with chatter, and in a weird way, it was like the people wandering around weren't visitors, but they belonged here, and you could feel everyone's excitement to be at the summit. We'd barely drawn close enough to the vendors to see what they were offering when the clock tower chimed, indicating it was time to head inside for the official start of the summit. Veering for the big, white building marked City Hall, 
I peered up at the multi-level monstrosity, wondering how old it might have been. It wasn't modern, but it looked almost like an embassy built in the colonial times, with flags fluttering outside and dozens of tall windows that lined the front. Right this way, a voice called from the entrance. A middle-aged woman was ushering everyone inside the building. Welcome, she said with a tight-lipped smile. Her brown hair was pulled up into a bun on top of her head, and her face was brightly colored with a little too much makeup. Welcome, everyone. Come right in. We're meeting in the last room down the hall. She nodded at me as I stepped inside with a dozen others, like cattle being called in to feed. Jackson took Bo's hand, Luna remaining outside as previously agreed, and Woody and Bert came in after us. What if they're mean to her? Bo peered up at Jackson. Your wolf will be fine, the woman said. I glanced over as she winked at Bo. I promise. That seemed to reassure Bo enough to stop him from holding up pedestrian traffic, and he followed us farther down the hall. The room smelled musty, like it had been closed up for a long time, soaking in the briny sea air. There were other scents that attacked my senses, like the sudden bombiness of so many bodies around me and the musk of people clean, unclean, earthy, and other scents I couldn't quite determine. The cacophony of murmurs buzzed in my ears. Cat's probably here somewhere, Jackson thought aloud. I tried to keep an eye out for her, but I was too busy noticing all of the new faces. There were people of all skin colors and ages, though Sophie had been right. Most of the people were younger than 40 years old, which was intriguing. I'd been trying not to think too much about her, knowing this was where I was supposed to be. This place, foreign as it was, felt full of endless possibilities, and I began to see why Elle worried I might not go back. The meeting room was barely half the size of the pasture back home, with a banquet table at the front and the Canadian and British Columbia flags hung in the back. A man with short, salt-and-pepper hair sat at the table with a stack of papers in front of him. He pulled his reading glasses off and rubbed the bridge of his nose as he waited for all of us to finish filing in. There were three men and two women in naval uniforms, flanking the perimeter, though they weren't packing heat like they were only there to make a statement. Alex. I peered over my shoulder at Jackson, noticing the others were keeping toward the back of the room where Cat was waiting for us, so I doubled back. Come in, the man said. Come in. It was Huck Fenton, from the radio. His voice was confident, practiced, and unmistakable. He had a form of telepathy by the color of his sticker. Quiet down if you can, please. The sooner we can get started, the better. The woman from the hall, who I assumed was one of our hostesses, came into the room, pardoning herself as she motioned people to step further inside so she could partially close the doors to keep the whistling wind in the hallway. The room was packed with what looked to be around 50 or so people, some of them sitting in chairs closer to the speakers, an elderly gentleman who was older than Bert and a pregnant woman. But most of us were standing, crammed inside like sardines. With a few more pardon me and excuse me, the hostess made her way to the front. She looked to be in her 40s, though with so much makeup on, she might have been older. It was hard to tell. She sat down at the desk beside Huck, and when she gave him the nod, he began. First of all, I'd like to welcome all of you to the first ever Survivor Summit here in Prince Rupert. This has been something my colleagues and I have been considering doing for a while now. But there's a lot to think about, and in all honesty, it's hard to plan for safety in situations like these. And now, before I go any further, I'd like to introduce you to the team. He pointed at the hostess as she tucked a loose strand of her sandy-colored hair behind her ear. She had an ability color sticker I hadn't seen yet, and I wondered what she could do. This is Shannon. She and Jonah helped coordinate and organize this summit, which, given how difficult it is to travel and communicate these days, took some time and careful consideration. Captain Kirkpatrick, who you'll meet tomorrow, and his officers and soldiers, what's left of them anyway, are helping to ensure everyone's safety, along with some civilian help. I never felt one way or the other about Huck when I'd heard him on the radio, but now, standing a dozen yards away from him, I decided I liked him. He spoke to us like we were his equals and got to the point. No bullshit or crazy tangents. I glanced at Woody, 
who listened with rapt attention. Now, the plan is to break off into smaller groups over the course of the next couple weeks, once we know what our needs really are. We have come prepared with as much knowledge as we have to share, but we want to hear from you as well. We've kept you abreast of most of what we know for months now. It's what we don't know that's important to us. We're all in this world together, and all of us, I'm assuming, since you're here, want to live full, safe, and healthy lives. So let's use this time the best we can. Huck peered around the room, taking in all of the bright faces hanging on his every word. As most of you can probably guess, I'm Huck Fenton, the voice on the radio. I was on the city council back in Hartley Bay, when there was a city council, at least. I used to worry about tourist traffic and the ceremonial rights of our people. Now, my days are filled with quite a different list of concerns, which I'm sure you can imagine. I know this is a tight space, because, well, to be honest, we weren't sure how many folks would come. But I'm happy to say that while others might still be arriving, this is a very good turnout in my book, especially since we thought we were alone a couple years ago. If you have any concerns about your accommodations or any questions that come out of this first gathering, feel free to hang around after the meeting. Though, be forewarned, I get grumpy after too much time up here. Shannon chuckled under her breath, which clearly meant it was true. Huck glanced down at the paper in front of him, then cleared his throat to continue. Survivors have come from all over the region and beyond, he continued, sitting back in his chair. He steepled his fingers and gazed out at us, locking his eyes with a few people as he surveyed the room. According to Shannon's notes, we have a total of 72 people here already, and some of you have come all the way up the coast from California. The fact that any of you are even here, to me, means this place is already working. We are the survivors of the old world. We've managed to overcome illness, unexpected and, quite frankly, terrifying changes to our bodies, chaos and the elements, hunger, and then some. Yet, we're here. All of us are together in this place and in this moment, and this is what community looks like. This is what change looks like. The door creaked open and a few more people filed into the room. At first, I thought nothing of them. Two women, a little older than me, and a man. But the woman with shoulder-length jet-black hair, with eyes like teal gemstones, caught my attention. My breath hitched in the back of my throat as I registered the familiarity of her face. I'd seen her somewhere before. I just couldn't place her. Now, Huck continued. Let's get a quick poll of the urgent needs of folks so we know where to take this summit in the days to come. There are many things we'd all like to discuss, but our priority is the people who are currently looking for refuge. We'll plan tomorrow's events and meetings around getting those needs met first. One of the women who came in late, who was shorter, had mousy brown hair to her chest, and a more petite frame raised her hand. Yes, Shannon said. Miss, are you looking for refuge? The woman shook her head, and I couldn't help but think she looked familiar, too. No, we're here to offer refuge, but not only to survivors, she said with a surprisingly husky voice, but to those who some would consider different. Explain, please, Huck interjected. He pulled his glasses down the bridge of his nose and peered over the rim. Regeneratives, she said, what some of you have heard called regens. She peered around the room. Her eyes were a milky violet color that, although a different hue, reminded me of JJ's. Some of you might not know what I speak of, but I am a regen, and I have many brothers and sisters who are different from you. We are one of fathers of General Herodson's alterations. The interrogation chamber. I gasped as I recalled one of Sophie's memories of a regen being tortured and waterboarded. It was a violet-eyed regen named RV-01. Everyone stared at her, though not everyone, at least not who I was with, seemed surprised. The regen rebellion, Woody said, his voice bursting through the silence of the room like a firecracker. You're the reason Harrison lost his footing to begin with. There was awe and gratitude brimming in his voice. The woman with the aquamarine eyes looked from the regen to Woody then to Bo, before her gaze locked with mine for a moment. Some would say that, yes, 
the regen continued. As you can likely tell from my speech, we sound different than you. Or so I have been told. She glanced at the big guy, who stood protectively by her side. He watched everyone, pensive, like he was uncertain he wanted to be there, and like he was waiting for something bad to happen. I do not know what you have heard, but we did start the revolution against the general last year. And while many of my kind have found refuge with me, there are still many in hiding. That is why we are here. We are different from you in many other ways, not just in our eyes and speech. We have special requirements for survival. So if you know any of these people looking for refuge, please tell them we are waiting for them in Hope Valley, California. We can help them and protect them. I thought about JJ being ill and that she was a regen, or at least she thought she was. I looked at Jackson, waiting to see if he would say anything. You know a regen? My head snapped around to see the raven-haired woman looking between Jackson and me. Yes, she said with more confidence. You do, but that's not why you're here. A crease ruffled Jackson's brow, and he dipped his head in answer as his eyes skirted around the room, surveying the gawking faces. We also have a refuge, a city-sized settlement with power up north, which I would be happy to discuss when the time is right, he said meeting Huck's contemplative gaze. But if anything was said after that, I didn't hear it. I couldn't look away from the woman with the piercing blue gaze and raven black hair, because suddenly I knew who she was, or rather, who she might have been related to. And the fact that she was here and could read my mind made my jaw twitch and my blood run cold. I'd seen her a handful of times in Sophie's memories, the woman in the lab coat, the doctor behind it all. Dr. Wesley. 56. L. Surrounded by the soft glow of the safe light, I stared down at the milky outline of the developing photo in the tray. The outline of the group of us began to darken, and I hoped this was the one, the keeper. The other two I'd chosen which I thought were good, if a little goofy with a couple of contorted faces in half motion, weren't quite the ones I was hoping for. I wanted a photo that I could cherish, that had all of us together, a photo of our family. As I placed it in the third tray to set, a contented smile parted my lips. Twelve faces looked back at me, all of us smiling at the camera. My sister, impossible as it was, was standing beside me. Pinching the photo with the tongs, I moved it to the wash tray and then to hang up on the line with the others. I still hadn't gotten used to her being alive, even if seeing her every day felt right. L. Jenny's voice was quiet on the other side of the basement door. May I speak with you for a moment? Yeah, I called back, pulling off my safety glasses and placing them on the counter. One second. After peering around the lab to ensure I'd left no unattended film out, I flicked the light on. Come in. The door creaked open, and Jenny made her way down. Her hair was pulled up in a ponytail, like mine, and her eyes were hungry and wide, like before, taking in the new photos hanging across the line. Where's Thea? I asked, knowing they'd been inseparable all evening. After she finished telling me about Arya's mean sister, which I'm sure you've heard about, she went off with Littlefoot to give her a fresh coloring book. I sighed and shook my head. At first I thought it was strange for her to have an imaginary friend, but Sophie used to have one. As long as Thea doesn't use her as a scapegoat when she gets into trouble, I guess it's okay. Jenny's mouth quirked. Thea is very sweet and photogenic. She peered around at the photos I hadn't taken off the line yet. She's also the most willing subject out of the group. I pointed to the new photos. Here, look. There's a great one of you and Kat. Bo and Woody look like they have gas, but you two look great. Jenny smiled and reached for the print, her fingertips stopping just shy of touching it. I love it, 
she breathed, her eyes roaming over everyone's faces. This one, though. I pointed to the newest edition. This one is my favorite. It's perfect. Jenny tore her gaze from the other photo and came closer. This is how different we are, she thought aloud, and her face fell a little as she squinted at our likeness. Different hair links, and our features altered a little, but we were still us. We're not that different, I told her, detecting the discontent in her voice. But all easiness was gone from Ginny's face when she looked at me again. Elle, I must speak with you about something. Perhaps we should go up. That's okay, I told her getting a sickening sense that I wasn't going to like whatever she had to say. You can tell me here. I crossed my arms over my chest and rested my hip against the counter. You're not leaving already, are you? I felt an unexpected tinge of panic. A weak smile pulled at the corner of her mouth, making her cheek twitch. Then she shook her head. No. Relieved? I allowed my shoulders to ease a little. Well, that's good. At least, not by choice. I frowned. What does that mean? It means, Jenny said, and she took a deep, long breath. It means I'm sick, El. The heat in my veins flared and warmed my skin, and dread settled in the base of my throat. Do you mean, like cancer? My voice was indistinct as I realized what she was trying to tell me. If she had cancer, there was nothing we could do. There were no doctors to take her to. There were no treatments. Not cancer, she clarified. I am not familiar with cancer. But no, that is not what I speak of. Then what are you talking about, Jenny? Then I remembered Kat's words the day we met her. They rang in my ears, too true and too raw. There are some of us who have been genetically altered and experimented on so much, they're running out of time. She stared down at her shaky hands. I noticed it when she first arrived, but chalked it up to nerves. Being in a new place and meeting me, a stranger. She tightened her hands into fists then stretched her fingers like she was trying to control her tremors. I do not know what is happening, only that my body is deteriorating. I can feel it. How could I have forgotten? How had I not realized when Ginny was clearly unwell? But why, how come? I closed my mouth. Her appearance and mind were altered so of course her body would be too. Side effects, I realized. I believe so. It is difficult to say. Despite her apparent acceptance of what was happening to her, it wasn't as easy for me. Not as I realized my sister, who had only been with me a couple weeks, was dying. Again. And you just accept this? I hated the clip of anger, but couldn't help it. Old Jenny would never accept it, or look so resolved. Jenny's expression didn't change, and her voice didn't waver as she lifted her chin ever so slightly. It is my reality. It has been for a while. I bit my tongue and forced myself to keep breathing, to push the desperation clawing its way in, out of my nose and my swelling chest. This wasn't happening. My sister was here, alive, and she had come back to me. This is why Kat was so worried about you. All this time and you didn't say anything. Jenny's brow furrowed slightly, and that small hint of regret nearly shredded me, and my lungs constricted. She couldn't give up hope. She'd been brought back once, we could find a way to do it again. There has to be something we can do. I brushed past her toward the steps. There's a way, 
Sophie and Stanley might have come up with something in all of their studying. I'll ask them. L. Jenny's voice wasn't flat, but empty. She was resigned to her fate, and my name on her lips commanded me to stop. Kat has been looking for a cure for months. It is why she was so determined to stay in Hartley Bay and see what news she could discover, and why she went to the summit in Prince Rupert. She is determined to find answers. My chest lightened a little, and I allowed myself another deep breath. Well, that's good, I told her, though it was more of a question, because my sister didn't look relieved. Jenny? I walked over and took her hands in mine. That's a good thing, right? Her gray-flecked eyes met mine, shimmering with sadness and regret. Perhaps, but... But what? Don't you want to live? Jenny stared at me, unmoving for what felt like minutes, and I squeezed her hands harder. That's a good thing, I reiterated, but tears fell through my lashes as she remained silent. L. My name was an empty word on her lips. Jenny, I snapped as desperation bubbled closer to the surface. Answer me, you want to live, right? But her hesitance was all the answer I needed. My hands shook as I dropped them to my side. Why don't she want to live? I sounded broken, even to my ears. A wretched, weak sound that angered me as she stood there dumbly. Jenny, I want to live, she finally said but her voice sounded as desperate as mine. But she took my hands again, gripping them as she willed me to understand. I am so tired, she whispered. It weighs me down every day, and I would like to rest. But I shook my head. I just got you back. The words were barely a squeak, and I turned away from her, shaking and desperate to make her understand how much I needed her. You wouldn't have given up before, I told her, anger solidifying in my voice. You would have given whatever this sickness is the middle finger, just because you can't accept this. I am not like before, she said calmly. Jenny, I spat. But when I looked at her again, I saw the exhaustion in her eyes. It was in the pallid color of her skin, the creases around her eyes. It was in the meekness of her voice, and everything culminated at once. How she must have felt over the past two years, what she'd gone through, and what had been done to her. I couldn't imagine how she must have felt inside and out and a sob burst up through my throat. I gripped the edge of the counter as my body quaked, and tears blurred my eyes until I couldn't see. But I just got you back. All I could do was draw in a few ragged breaths, and I leaned into the table, praying it would keep me upright. Jenny rested her hand on my shoulder, and even if she was different, even if she didn't want to live, she was still alive now, and her warm hand on me broke my heart. Lifting my shoulder, I leaned my cheek against her hand, imagining what my life would be like without her now. How long do we have? My voice was reed thin and just as fragile. Even though I wanted to spout accusations about why she bothered to come at all, I was happy that she did. I was happy to know the truth and to have a second chance with her in my life, even if it wouldn't be long-lived. Weeks, perhaps months, but not years. I wasn't sure I'd ever felt a pain so raw it felt like my heart was bleeding. I'd mourned an estranged sister, but this time I would have to mourn someone beloved to me, a friend. 
squeezing my eyes shut. I told myself whatever time we still had was a gift. At least it wasn't ours. At least I could still spend time with her, even if I knew there was an approaching end. I looked at her through wet lashes, heartened to see her nose was red and her lashes damp as well. You'll stay here until then, right? It was a plea more than a question. Her eyes crinkled in the corners, and her lips thinned, like she was happy I'd asked and was holding back a smile. If you wish it. Nodding like my life depended on it, I wrapped my arms around her shoulders, needing to feel my sister's warm body, needing to feel her heart beating the tighter I squeezed. We won't tell anyone, I told her. Not yet. I wasn't sure I could handle their questions and sympathetic looks. Sophie knows, Jenny said, rubbing my back. She discovered it today, but I wanted to be the one to tell you. It's why she's been avoiding me all night and hasn't confided in me, I realized. She didn't want to burden me with whatever has been bothering her on top of this. I ran my fingers through my hair and shook my head. I didn't want to think about what other secrets poor Sophie was harboring, but I was glad this no longer needed to be one of them. Come on, I told her, straightening and wiping the dampness from my eyes. It's time to make dinner, and I don't want anyone coming down here and seeing me like this. But even as I began to dry my face, the tears threatened to come again. Time was running out, and I had to figure out a way to make the best of it. 57. Alex After the meeting disbanded and the Q&A wrapped up with the promise to discuss most of what folks had questions about in the days to come, like sustainability and safety issues regarding the crazy, ability-armed survivors that were still a threat, our group, with the exception of Kat who wanted to find the regen, planned to meander the marketplace. There were still a few hours until the sun fully set, and while my body felt a little tired, my mind was a raucous mess of curiosity and unease after seeing the woman whose resemblance to Dr. Wesley was uncanny. By the time we stepped outside City Hall, Merchants were back at their tables and the place was lively again. But unlike Shannon had promised, Luna wasn't outside and Bo began to panic. Luna, he called, frantically looking around the boots in the quickly filling aisleway. Luna, why don't you use your mind? I told him. She's probably around here somewhere and she just can't hear you. I can't feel her. I can't. She's over there, Woody said, pointing down the row of bustling people. Sure enough, the black wolf was sitting beside a booth. I would have assumed she was begging for some of the smoked meat I smelled in the air, making my stomach rumble. But then a young girl came around the table and crouched down to pet her. Hey! Bo shouted, running toward them. And with a grumble, Jackson and I followed. We'll be talking to Shannon about the evening social tomorrow, Bert said with waggling eyebrows. I rolled my eyes, used to the old man's teasings when it came to women. Then he and Woody headed in the opposite direction. Meet you back at the house. Jackson and I sidestepped minglers as we continued after Bo. We passed booths boasting tees, welded metal tools, and sewn goods. Hey, Bo called again, stopping next to Luna. She ran to him with a wagging tail and licked at his fingers. <sighs> that kid is going to give me a heart attack this trip, Jackson uttered as we came to a stop at a honey booth. What are you doing? Bo asked, scowling at the little girl. She had pretty dark skin, and her matching hair was weaved into a thick braid around her head. I was just petting her, the girl growled back, her brow equally low. She likes my skin. It's like hers. She smiled proudly, and while it was endearing, it also surprised me. What do you mean she likes your skin? Bo said, echoing my question exactly. That the little girl knew what Luna was thinking gave us all pause. But then I glanced to the sticker on her shirt. She was a telepath, an animal one, I assumed. She rolled her eyes, golden like the honey lining the table behind her, and folded her arms over her chest, pointing one foot out, like she couldn't believe he was so clueless. 
I can talk to animals too, dummy. Mia? Another voice chided, and a young woman with skin the color of cinnamon, bright green eyes, and golden blonde curly hair that hung past her shoulders stepped back into the tent with a plate of meat and cooked vegetables in hand. She set it on the table and looked between the little girl and Bo. Mia, why are you calling this boy a dummy? Because, she quipped, gaping at him. He thinks he's special or something. Hey, now. The young woman and I spoke at once. Her bright eyes met mine with a fleeting smile. Then she crouched down in front of Mia, who was equal to Bo in attitude and stature. What did we tell you about this trip? What did you promise? That I would be nice, she groaned out. Apologize to him, or Alan's not going to let you come to the market tomorrow. She held Maya's gaze a second longer, ensuring she understood, and the little girl huffed out a breath and looked at Bo. I'm sorry. It wasn't quite genuine, but it was as close to an apology as Bo was going to get. He glanced up at Jackson, who dipped his chin, encouraging Bo to play nice. It's okay, Bo grumbled back. Besides, I'm not special, he said glumly, and he patted Luna's head. Come on, girl. He looked at Jackson. The excitement deflated from him. Can I go find Woody? I'll go with you, Jackson answered, and he and Bo, with Luna in tow, headed back down the row of booths. Are you happy now? The young woman scolded. You might have scared off your only friend in this place. Mia's face fell, and she watched Bo and Luna as they walked further away. Her eyebrows drew together, and then she stomped away. Here, take your dinner, the young woman demanded, and she handed the girl her plate. Mia took it reluctantly and disappeared around the side of the tent. Well, that was fun, I muttered, reaching out my hand. I'm Alex, and that was Bo and Luna. Iris, she said, and took my hand. She smiled with a deep sigh. And that's my sister, Mia. Well, she's my sister now, anyway. Yeah, I eyed Bo down the aisle. Same. She doesn't make friends very easily, and not human ones anyway. Ah, so that's why Luna was over here. Iris shrugged. Mia prefers animals to people, which is one of the reasons we brought her. Sometimes she forgets that she's one of us, you know? Not really, I said, taking a step closer, eyeing a cluster of lavender-flavored honey bottles. Bo can only talk with the wolves. Too many animal friends hasn't really been a problem. Iris lifted her head, eyeing me up and down. I see. And what about you? What is your power? More specifically than a generic tag, I mean. He's a conduit. Peering over my right shoulder... I saw the woman from the meeting hall, the one that looked alarmingly similar to Dr. Wesley, the maker of death and creator of mass destruction. I knew the role the doctor played in the fall of the entire world and all of the innocent people that died horrible deaths because of it. Oh, Zoe, you're back. Iris smiled and looked between the woman and the man behind her, holding her hand. Zoe stopped a few feet from me and she pointed to my sticker. You can amplify abilities and use them. Like my brother, Peter. You're scaring the kids, Zoe, the man said, leaning in. He offered me his hand. I'm Jake. Alex, I glanced between them, wondering who the poor, tortured regen was that he stood protectively beside in the meeting, if he was holding hands with Zoe. Becca, his sister, she answered. I narrowed my eyes at her. Are you reading my mind right now? Her mouth quirked up in the corner. Not intentionally, but you are a conduit, and my ability seems to have gotten a mind of its own, simply standing next to you. Without even touching? Um, that's not how it typically works. No? Well, with me it does. Zoe has a very strong power, Iris explained, with a bit of awe in her voice, though I was more apprehensive about it than that. She and Jake, even Becca, are some of the strongest wielders we have back home. That Iris and Mia knew this woman made my stomach churn a little. You don't trust me, but you don't even know me, Zoe said with a cocky lift of her eyebrow. She didn't look particularly dangerous, but looks were deceiving. I'd appreciate it if you stayed out of my head, I told her. She smiled, 
but without humor this time, and she studied me a moment longer. I wasn't in your head. It's written all over your face. But don't worry, I'm not dangerous. Hmm. I straightened my shoulders, growing more uncomfortable by the second. If Jackson were still standing here, he could tell me if I was about to be lured into a false sense of security like Hansel and Gretel. You look like someone, is all. Jake and Zoe exchanged a look that told me they had either wagered on it or they'd expected something like this would happen. Zoe eyed me for another few heartbeats, probably probing around in my head, which I was sort of used to, even if it was unnerving. Then she leaned closer. As you know, we don't get to choose who our relations are, she whispered. I wasn't sure if it was horror, anger, or simply shock, but her words were an admission that she was related to the doctor, and it left me scrambling for a cohesive thought. I looked from Iris, who was talking to a patron at her booth, back to Zoe. Alex, Jackson called behind me. It's grub time. Zoe held my gaze, and I saw the smallest measure of reassurance in her eyes. Then she pursed her lips. It was nice to meet you, Alex. See you around. I looked at Jake and his expressionless face, then at Iris. See you around. She smiled, and as she lifted her hand to wave, I turned and beelined for the others. The general and the doctor had always been far away enigmas, and now a mini Dr. Wesley was here in Prince Rupert, and even in his death, General Harrodson felt closer than ever. 58. L. I sat in front of the radio in the den, letting Jackson's words sink in. Dr. Wesley's family was at the summit. I'd never thought that was something we needed to worry about. Crazy assholes were one thing, but a descendant of the mad doctor didn't sit well either. Even if Jackson didn't get a bad feeling from them, it would weigh on me, just like everything else. The radio buzzed again. Oh? Uh, yeah, I'm here, sorry. Just processing everything. I ran my fingers through my wet hair, grateful I'd snuck in a shower to wash some of the tears away, before sitting down to pretend everything was normal on our end. It had only been a couple of days since they'd left, and already it felt like too long. I didn't want to tell him about Jenny. Jackson would only worry about me while he was gone, more than he already did, and he needed to stay focused. I forced myself to smile, and I changed the subject. Well, it sounds like you guys are settling in. And if Bo has finally met his match in that Mia girl, I think that's a good thing especially if they are bunking in the same neighborhood as you. Yeah, she's definitely a handful. But Alex said her ability is pretty advanced. She doesn't have any animals with her, at least none that I noticed. But then California is a ways to travel. Well, it's only the first day. Maybe Bo and Mia will become friends, and she can help him while he's there. For his sake, perhaps. But Jackson seemed unconvinced. The radio clicked off and on again, and he added, Bird already hit on one of the summit coordinators. I swear, it's like he's reverting back to his horny teenager phase. I snorted a much-needed laugh, imagining Bert getting a smack to the face and acting as if it came out of nowhere. But my smile quickly faded. My heart hurt thinking about them. I miss them, all of them and I had to bite my lip to hold back the tears as they threatened to resurface again. I'm speaking with Huck tomorrow about Whitehorse. He's really intrigued by it, and he's made it perfectly clear they are at capacity here. How are things at home? Oh, good. Great. We're keeping up with the fish wheel. Phil's been staying to help with that, which has been nice. I couldn't very well tell him Jenny wasn't able to do much since she was weaker than I thought. How's Cat doing, by the way? If Cat was searching for a cure, and if she found one, I hoped Jenny might change her mind. She's been on a mission the whole time, still looking for answers about things she's keeping to herself. I don't ask questions anymore. I'd like to keep my limbs. So then, no luck yet? I mean, finding whatever she's been looking for? 
No, I don't think so. Closing my eyes, I massaged my temples and practiced my breathing. I tried to focus on the lumpy couch we never used and the scent of smoke from the fireplace. But all I wanted was for Jackson to be here and wrap his arms around me. The radio crackled again. Elle, are you okay? Yes, I said, smiling into the radio, as if it would convince him. I'm just staring at these photos I took of the group before you left and feeling sentimental. I clicked off the radio and dropped it into my lap as I rubbed the tension from my face. There was a clatter in the kitchen, followed by whispered mutterings. I held the radio back to my mouth and clicked it on. Babe, I better go. Thea's breaking into the cupboards again. Jackson clicked on with a chuckle. Never a dull moment. Okay, get that rascal and give her a hug for me. I will. Elle, I love you so damn much. I'll be home soon, okay? My throat tightened, but I forced myself to speak. Same. Love you and chat tomorrow. I gotta go. Give everyone my love. 10-4, he responded, and I switched off the radio. Clearing my throat and brushing my damp hair from my face, I stood and stomped through the den toward the kitchen to catch the little monster in the act. What are you doing? I drawled, and Thea looked at me with wide, caught-on-camera eyes and her finger in her mouth. Her cheeks reddened, and she hedged a smile. Just a little? All right, fine. I walked over and stuck my finger in the jar, too. I could use something comforting and sweet. But next time, let's do this before we shower, okay? I pulled her damp hair from the honey on her cheek and sighed. Nope, never a dull moment. 59. Alex. The next evening, after we broke from the final meeting of the day, I sat with Bo and Luna in the park across the street from the house, watching the two of them practice Bo's communication with her. Bo sat with his legs crossed in the grass, focusing on Luna's yellow eyes as she lounged across from him, blinking. Every once in a while, her head would tilt, like she was listening to words I couldn't hear, or her tail would wag. Then she would growl and bark happily, jumping up and turning around in a circle like she was waiting for him to come play with her. While they played, all I thought about was home. Jackson and Woody had talked to Huck about Whitehorse. He conceded that it was a great place for a potential settlement, one that some people were in desperate need of. But then he started asking the harder questions. With more settlers came a different sort of responsibility that we hadn't considered. Laws. Leaders. Safety precautions for when the settlement grew larger than our small, inhabited corner of it. While it wasn't impossible, it was enough to make me wonder if we were ready for more people. I wish you would stop moping about Sophie and come play keep away with me, Bo called. I scowled at him a few yards away. I'm not moping. Whatever, he said, rolling his eyes. But it was true. I wasn't, for once even if I wondered what she was doing when I let my mind rest long enough. Luna barked, stirring me from thought, and she took off running toward Mia as she practically pranced across the street. Oh, jeez, Bo grumbled, and he came to sit beside me on the bench. She's annoying, he muttered. And coming over, I pointed out. I remembered what Iris had told me. Mia doesn't talk to people very often. I explained. Maybe she could use a friend. Is that what her problem is? He huffed, like it was the most inconvenient request in the world, and tossed the stick that Luna had abandoned to the side. Mia smiled as she pet Luna, who licked and nudged at her hands before scampering back to Bo. Mia's smile fell, but like Bo, she seemed resigned to play nice and she slowly walked over, begrudgingly. What do you want? Bo griped as Luna took her place at his side. Hey, I chided. Why don't you say hello first? Hello, he drawled. His false smile fell. What do you want? I dropped my head in my hands and shook my head. This kid, 
I muttered. Well, Mia started, putting her hands on her hips. She wore jeans and a t-shirt, just like Bo, only his shirt was black, much like his mood tended to be, and hers was bright pink with yellow and white flowers on the shoulders. Iris said I had to ask if you wanted to play. Well, I don't. That's not technically true, I told him with a giant grin. You were just saying how you wished I would play keep away with you and Luna. Bo scowled at me, and I chuckled in reply. I guess we can, Mia shrugged. That's kind of lame, though. Well, then, what do you want to do? Bo bit out, throwing up his hands, completely exasperated. You're the one who came over here. Mia looked at me, like she had a secret or couldn't say. I threw my hands up next. I'm no one, and too busy moping, apparently. I looked at Bo. Don't mind me. I continued to watch them, though not dumb enough to leave them alone in case fists started flying, which wouldn't totally surprise me. I stared out at the market down by the pier. The tents were being broken down as the wind whipped through the harbor, threatening to tear signs and merchandise away. I'd traded a few bags of elk and moose jerky for some of the lavender honey for Thea, and a new journal made out of an old book for Sophie, though I was still trying to figure out what to get out. Do you want to drift? Mia asked, and it sounded more like a conspiracy plot than an innocent question, and I perked up to listen. Do what? You know, go into Luna's mind, or another animal if you want. I can tell you don't like to share but something less boring than being here in real life. You mean, talk to Luna, Bo clarified. I do that all the time. No, dummy. I snuck a glance at them standing a few feet from one another, while Luna sniffed around, ignorant of their plans to mind invade her even more. Like, go into her mind. Be her for a little while. We can explore the city through her eyes. It's so much fun. We can spy on people. Mia came to life as she spoke. No more frowning, but eyebrows raised with excitement. Bo, on the other hand, frowned. I can't do that, he said. Why? Because you're afraid you'll get into trouble? Because I can't, he bit out. Mia looked so perplexed. I knew Bo had to feel even more broken than he already did. Really? He turned to walk away, and she ran after him. I didn't know, she bleated, less condescending this time. I just thought you were like me. Well, I'm not. He picked up the stick and threw it for Luna again, with more fervor this time. Have you even tried? He shook his head and plopped down in the grass, picking angrily at the defenseless blades between his fingers. I was about to tell him we should go in before we lost Bo to another self-pitying party when Mia sat down in front of him. Want me to help you? Her voice was kind, more so than before, and Bo peered through his lashes at her, skeptical. If I can't talk to any other animals, how would I be able to do that drifting thing? Mia frowned again. You can't talk to any other animals? I grimaced. Without a word, Bo climbed hastily to his feet. You just haven't tried hard enough. Here, I'll teach you. Mia grabbed his hand, and pulled him back down as she closed her eyes. She exhaled. Do you feel Luna's mind? She asked. It's like a bright, blinking light. Almost so bright. It's not that bright, he told her. Are you only thinking about Luna? Are you only thinking about talking to her? What are they doing? A soft, feminine voice came up behind me, startling me, and I turned around. Iris, hey. She smiled and sat down beside me on the bench. Mia is trying to help Bo with his ability. Well, that's surprising and nice of her. I nearly snorted. Yeah, it was rough waters there for a minute. Iris grinned and leaned back into the bench as she peered around the park. There wasn't much there other than a rusted swing set on the other side and a damp sandbox. The grass area was nice, though, and perfect for Bo and Luna to expel some energy. Oh, my feet are killing me, she groaned, and lifted her face up to the waning sun. I'm not used to standing all day. What is it you usually do back home? I'm a teacher for the second graders, she said. She was the youngest teacher I'd ever met, and the cutest. Don't look at me like that, she mind-whispered, 
And my mouth fell open. Iris let her head fall back and laughed. <laughs> Your face? Uh, it's absolutely priceless. I bet, I grumbled, facing her fully. Can you hear my replies, too? She tilted her head. Why don't you try it and see what happens? Uncertain how else to do it, I thought the words, can you hear me? Her blonde curls bounced around her pretty face as another spurt of laughter filled the air. Yes, I can hear you. Pretty cool, huh? Shit, that's crazy. I imagine you could really screw with someone's head that way, too. If Theo was here, she'd call you out for swearing. Bo chided from the grass. Both he and Mia were glaring at me. Shouldn't you be focusing? I asked. Relenting, they looked at each other and closed their eyes again. So, um, what do you teach? Abilities or something? Your sister seems keen on it. I work with the little kids who are expressing telepathic capabilities, yes. There are a total of 17 in New Bodega, where I'm from, and we practice for a couple hours, three days a week. I thought you were all from Hope Valley. Iris shrugged. Sort of. New Bodega is the city, but Hope Valley is one of the settlements outside of the city. It's where Jake, Zoe, and Becca are from. We all know each other, but we don't live in the same town. The mention of Zoe made me stiffen. How do you know her? Zoe, I mean. Iris looked me up and down, like she was sizing me up. I take it you know who she is? No, actually, but I know who Dr. Wesley is, and they're undeniably related. I recalled Zoe's words from yesterday. We don't get to choose who our relations are. That was definitely the truth. But I wasn't sure how they were related. Is she her daughter? She had to be a very close relation to look so similar. Yes, Ira said, her voice dropping to a melancholy whisper. She died with the general in the Hope Valley standoff. He's not Zoe's father, though, she added, just so we're clear. It's a long story. But the doctor's death is a good thing, right? I mean, she was evil. Iris's gaze shifted from Mia and Bo to me. I could tell she wasn't sure how to answer, but I wasn't sure if it was because she was conflicted or because she didn't want to tell me something she shouldn't. I'm not sure what you know, Iris started, a bit hesitant. But for all the horrible things her mother did, she did some really good things too. I thought about how the doctor had let Woody go, another flash of a memory I'd gleaned from last night with Sophie. You think she wasn't all bad then? No, I don't. And I know that if my mother was still alive, she would have done whatever she could to save me and my brother too. A wisp of longing ribboned her voice, and I imagined the truth still hurt, even if she'd come to accept it. None of your family made it? She shook her head. I didn't remind her that was because of the doctor, too. Yours? She asked. No. I answered easily, and I shook my head. But I didn't really have a family before. Uh, not like you, so it's nothing to be sorry about. Iris watched me a moment. I know it probably doesn't feel this way, but you're lucky, then. Actually, I said, resting my elbows on my knees. I peered round at the park, washed in an ochre glow from the setting sun. It does feel that way. Everyone at home has been through a lot, and they all still grieve. But me, I've gained more than I've lost. It was quiet for a minute, and I thought about how long the past two years had seemed with all that we'd been through. And yet, sitting in the park at sunset, talking to a girl my age felt strangely normal. Like nothing had changed at all. My gaze wandered to her. If you live near Hope Valley, then you must know a lot about the general and everything that happened. I know some. Like what? Iris shoved her hands in her coat pockets and leaned back against the bench again. Becca was the one who led the Regen Rebellion, with help from Dr. Wesley. I wasn't completely surprised, knowing the doctor teetered the line between bad and good so much it was confusing but I hadn't expected her to have a hand in something so pivotally good as that. They wouldn't have been able to do it on their own. 
I wondered what Sophie would say about all this. Knowing what Stanley and Woody had been through and after losing her own family, what would Sophie say to Zoe if she met her, knowing who her mother was? I looked at Iris again, admiring her olive skin and green eyes. They reminded me of the meadows back home and the patches of sunlight that filtered through the trees. So, you're all friends? I asked. Iris shrugged. Yes, I guess. We live in the same community. We protect each other, we trust each other. She stared at me like it was a strange question. Zoe and everyone want this new world to work, so we sailed with them up here. Alan is one of the boat captains in New Bodega. We're a team. Who's Alan, your boyfriend or something? With a crumpled brow, Iris shook her head. Not at all. He's my dad. Well, sort of. He took me and me in when we first showed up. I'd been on my own for a long time, and Mia came with a group of people who were actually a little whacked, and they were told to leave. But Alan wanted to adopt her. He knew she needed a stable home. He's really nice like that. If he's here, how come I haven't seen or met him yet? Iris nodded toward the city hall building. He's been in a bunch of meetings. There's talk of establishing a new trading route along the coast, and he'd be a key part of it, at least from New Bodega's port. What about you? I stared at the cloudy sky, missing the late night sunsets back home. Do you live somewhere on the coast? No, not since the outbreak. I used to live in Anchorage, but things were really bad there, so now we live in the Yukon on the river. I always wanted to come north. Alaska always seemed so pristine and remote. But if I can't make it there, at least I get to mark Canada off my list. She stared at the woods in the distance. I'm originally from Nebraska, where there are plains as far as the eye can see in either direction, so you can probably imagine why the ocean and the forests are so surreal to me. She snorted, and it made me chuckle. Well, I've never been to Nebraska, so I'll take your word for it. In fact, this is the furthest south I've ever been before. Really? She smiled at that, flashing me white, straight teeth. This is the furthest north I've ever been. Well, what do you know? I looked at Bo and Mia, talking where they sat on the grass with Luna in the middle as a buffer. I was glad to see they were at least getting along, and that he might actually have a friend by the time we left. And maybe I would too. Ever since the outbreak, I thought aloud. I've wondered about other survivors and how weird it would feel to meet them. Bo and Thea, Jackson. I pointed toward the house. They're all I've known. I knew I'd meet people here at the summit, but I thought it would feel different. Different how? I wanted to say I hadn't expected to meet someone like her, but I wasn't sure what that meant. Because she was my age and pretty? Because she was smart and had a cool ability that none of us had at home? Or because she had a new patchwork family like I did? Less normal, I guess? Talking to you feels natural. Like, nothing's really changed. I hadn't expected that. Really? She grinned this time. So full she had a dimple on her left cheek. That's cool, because I kind of feel the same about you. Just kinda? I teased. She laughed and tilted her head, her curls tumbling over her shoulder. Can I ask you something? She turned on the bench to look at me, folding one leg up against her chest. How did you know Zoe was related to Dr. Wesley? I've seen her, I admitted. Those eyes are unmistakable. Iris looked at my sticker again, and I could tell she was trying to put the pieces together. You know someone who has seen her or knew her? Both. Sophie showed me what Dr. Wesley looked like, though. Who's Sophie? Iris had an open expression I rarely saw on Sophie. A friend back home. Hmm, a girl friend? She asked with a curious lilt. With a nervous laugh, I shook my head. You sure ask a lot of questions. And you smile a lot when you're deflecting. She grinned even wider. No, she's not my girlfriend. It's nothing like that. The truth was I wasn't even sure Sophie and I were friends anymore. Not in the sense Iris would understand. But you want her to be. I straightened, 
and looked into Iris's enlivened green eyes that glittered in amusement. I think it's going to take some time to get used to that. I smiled because it was so damn cool she could talk to me like that, but eerily invasive at the same time. At least she couldn't see things. I'd probably have telepathy if I touched her, and I wouldn't have to feel anything or see things I could never unsee. Well, maybe if you stop being so impatient, Mia ground out, you'd be able to talk to the bird. Whatever, I'm not like you are. I don't have an animal, but you don't see me crying about it. I nearly choked out a laugh and looked at child whisperer Iris for help. She rose to her feet. Okay, that's enough for tonight. That wasn't exactly what I'd had in mind, but I stood up too. Come on, Bo. We should go in too. It's getting cold. Actually, Iris said, spinning around with a hopeful smile. I was going to ask if your family wanted to join ours for dinner tonight. Oh, um, Zoe's request, in case you thought I was inviting you on a whim. She winked at me. I mean, we haven't eaten yet. I can ask. Okay, she said with that ever-present smile of hers. Good. Sixty. Alex. I stared at the walls of the grand dining room in Iris's house. There were two tables set to accommodate all of us. Six at each table, if Kat and Becca ever showed up. It was a tight fit, but larger than our kitchenette at the house we were staying in. Despite being two doors down, Iris's house was much different than ours. While we had a mismatched house of chaos, including a kid room for Bert to sleep in, an office for Woody's cot, a master bedroom for me and Bo, and a couch in the living room for Jackson, Iris's house was regal. It was lined with hardwood floors instead of tattered and stained carpets, and it was filled with matching furniture and decorative art pieces on the walls, which I assumed was the same upstairs. I hope it tastes okay. Alan said from the head of the table. He dipped his chin and cleared his throat. I glanced up with my soup spoon halfway to my lips. Alan was the mastermind behind the beet soup, bread, and meatloaf. Are you kidding? We're eating like kings, Woody said, slurping from his bowl like a starved animal. We've been on the road a few days, Jackson explained as he glared at Woody. For that, we spent a lot of time packing. We haven't sat down for a real meal in a while. But Woody was Woody. Whether we were at home or in a stranger's house having a nice dinner, he didn't give etiquette much thought at all. Clearing his throat again, Alan wiped his mouth with his napkin. Good. I'm glad you like it. I enjoy cooking for my company. Back in New Bodega, I try to host most meetings I'm a part of at the house. It's better than a stuffy boardroom, and there's always better food, too. His eyebrows danced a little and I could tell cooking was his passion, no matter what other duties he had to fulfill back home. Alan is a jack of many trades, Zoe said from her seat beside me. A boat captain, a beekeeper, an amazing father to these two, and an even better chef. She winked at Mia and Iris. I'm not sure I'd go that far, he countered, a little breathless, and he rubbed his chest, which I'd noticed was a nervous habit he seemed to have since we'd sat down to eat. He was about Woody's age, or a little younger in his mid-forties, and like most boat captains I pictured, he was a little portly and had a dark beard, only slightly graying. His eyes were beady but kind, and like Iris, he always seemed to be smiling. What's it like in White Horse? Jake asked, reaching for a mug of homebrew they'd brought with them. He was a muscular guy, big like Jackson, but not overly huge, and not a northern native. He had short brown hair, a nose that was slightly crooked, and from what I could tell, he didn't leave Zoe's side for all that long, if he could help it. He's overprotective, she whispered, leaning in as she wiped her mouth primly. Zoe's straight black hair fell over her shoulder. He worries people will find out who I am and cause trouble. She was doing it again. You're in my head, I told her. Zoe's finger pointed between us. Sorry. Like I said, it's a little harder to control what I know when you're around. Plus, knowing is a newer facet I've been dealing with lately. I haven't quite honed that in yet. Lucky you. Her mouth quirked with a smile. So, you're an empath and you read minds. She shrugged. If you want to call it that, 
It's all one and the same, really. I briefly wondered if I shouldn't have sat next to her. But the moment I forced the question away, knowing she'd likely sense the thought, she smiled, and I knew it was too late. Don't worry, Zoe winked. I'm a quick study. I'll get the hang of it. It's big, Jackson explained, swallowing a bite of meatloaf. The city was once thousands, and now there are eleven of us. Thirteen, Bo interjected. You forgot about Kat and Jenny. Right, Jackson glanced around the table. There are two new additions. Kat was very interested in what Becca had to say yesterday, Zoe said. She came up to us afterward. She looked from Jackson to Woody and Bert. This regen, you know, is that who Kat is trying to save? Save? Jackson frowned. What do you mean? His eyes darted around the table. I could feel the flush in my cheeks as it dawned on Jackson that he was in the dark. Zoe looked at me reading me instantly. That she's weak from the treatments, she added. Sorry, I misspoke. But that was a lie. One I was thankful for for now. Becca knows everything about regens. She's their leader. She will help your friend. I don't have to be a mind reader like Zoe to know that was a close call. Iris' mind whispered. Tell me about it, I muttered, forgetting I didn't have to speak, and I glanced across the table at her. She looked curious, but mostly relieved for me. Jackson cleared his throat and continued. Anyway, we have the hydropower plant up and running. It's a lot of work during the winter, when the river is too low to keep it going, but with more hands we could run it year-round, and the entire city, even the surrounding villages, would be sustainable. We could easily house more sellers once we get the infrastructure in place. From what I hear, the North could use a solid location, Jake said. And if we reopen the Alaska Marine Highway, it will be beneficial to Whitehorse too. And Whitehorse would be beneficial to us. The food sources you have there alone would be. I can tell you don't like Zoe very much, but she seems to like you. I looked at Iris again as she tore off a piece of bread and dipped it in her soup. It was hard not to smile at how strange it was to hear her voice, without her even having to look at me. I'm not sure why. I studied Zoe's profile wondering if she could somehow hear my silent conversation with Iris. She's very assertive. I'll give her that. A small smile pulled at Iris's lips as she pretended to listen to Jackson and Jake's conversation. She's an original, you know. Her and her brother Jason were born with abilities. The outbreak only stirred them awake. It's why her power is so strong and still changing. If Zoe's mom was Dr. Wesley... I didn't doubt Zoe was quite the concoction. So? I looked at Iris across the table, but still she didn't look at me. Want to go on a walk after dinner? We could explore the beach by the docks. The sun doesn't really set until, what, like 10 or something here, right? I swallowed thickly. I, I don't know, but... Yeah, sure. It was dumb to hesitate, and I wasn't sure why I did. Don't sound too excited about it. This time, her eyes met mine, and I felt like an ass. Sorry, I guess I'm still getting used to this whole telepathy thing. Iris took a drink from her water glass, eyeing me over the brim of it. Meet me outside after I finish helping with the dinner dishes. I didn't respond. I felt weird saying I would. But I wanted to go with her, didn't I? And there was no reason not to. I stared down at my meatloaf, trying not to think about Sophie. Even if I barely knew Iris, even if it was just a walk, it didn't feel right. This girl you're thinking about, Zoe mused so quietly it was as if she hadn't spoken at all. She peered around at everyone's side conversations, giving nothing away. You love her? Iris? I whispered. No, Sophie. She gave me a sideways glance. You try to forget her, almost convince yourself that you do, and Yet you're holding back. I need you to stay out of my head, please, I said tersely, glaring at her. I'm only telling you what you need to hear, and then I won't say another word. Yeah, right, I muttered. I can tell you one thing, and you can choose to believe it or ignore it. But we empaths feel so much it's absolutely overwhelming and confusing at times. I know, trust me. Sophie's ability was problematic, 
But this was beyond that. Her ability isn't the problem anymore. It was a walking shadow who smiled too much by the name of Phil. Are you sure he's the problem? Zoe quirked an eyebrow at me, and her bright eyes shimmered like she knew a secret. I hated it when women did that. Like they magically knew all your secrets and insecurities you wanted to keep hidden, and it didn't have to be ability-related. Regardless, you still feel a pull to her that's undeniable, just as Jake and I always have. We've been fated since the beginning, and if you continue to ignore your fate, you might just lose your mind. Ask him. Her gaze darted to him with a little more amusement. Jake looked at us, then did a double take, registering Zoe's smirk. He must have been used to it, because he didn't speak and refocused on Bert and Jackson again as they discussed the possibility of mass-produced biodiesels back home. No offense, Zoe, but you don't want to hear my opinion. She pretended to zip and lock her lips shut, and then she winked. I doubted it was as simple as that, but as the conversation around the table continued, Zoe didn't look at me or offer me unwanted opinions. Were you military? Woody asked Jake, tossing his napkin onto the table in surrender as he rubbed his full stomach. No, a mechanic by trade. He popped the last of his bread into his mouth. Zoe's brother, Jason, is military though, and a few of our friends. That's handy, I said. Jake dipped his chin, and I realized I didn't know what his teal-colored sticker meant. What's your ability again? I don't have my little identifier sheet, but I don't remember seeing that color. It's because he's the only one, Mia explained, and I caught sight of the tablecloth moving between her and Bo as they snuck food to Luna. I lifted a warning eyebrow to Bo. Really? The only one? Woody's eyebrows danced with intrigue. Pray tell, what is it? There was a pause, and when no one answered, Jake forfeited the silence. Regeneration. Like the regens? Woody asked, clearly confused. He nudged Bert, who was falling asleep in the chair beside him. Bert snorted awake and peered around the room sleepily. No, Jake said carefully. I heal quickly. More like he's been burned alive before and recovered, Iris added. You're the one, I breathed, remembering what Cat had told us. You hear that, Jake? You're famous. Alan patted him on the shoulder. Wonderful, he grumbled and gulped down the rest of his beer. Just wonderful. With a chuckle, Alan clapped him on the shoulder again and winced, but whatever was wrong, he brushed it off quickly. Cheer up, my friend. It was only a matter of... <clears throat> his face contorted, then crumpled in pain as he hit at his chest with his fist, gasping and coughing for breath. Dad? Mia shrieked. Iris screamed and jolted to her feet. Alan? Her chair thudded to the wood floor, and she reached for his shoulders. Alan, she cried. Do you need water? She looked in my direction. He's going into cardiac arrest, Jackson realized aloud, and he ran around the table to Alan. Help me get him to the floor, he commanded, and Jake helped ease Alan down. The room echoed with violent choking and sobs, and the moment Alan stopped breathing, Jackson began to administer CPR. We need shit. We need a medic. We need a defibrillator. Mia and Iris's eyes pierced the air as their guardian gasped for breath. A flash of familiar faces filled my mind. My mother and grandma, Bella and my stepfather, all of them dead because of me, because I couldn't save them. Shame, devastation, panic. It was all I could do not to punch my fist against the table defiantly. They couldn't lose Alan, not after everything that had happened. All I knew was that Alan couldn't be one of them. Not now. Alan can't die. 61. Alex. Pushing past Zoe, I grabbed Jake's arm and crouched down beside Alan, unconscious on the floor. I had no idea what I was doing until it was nearly done. I clutched Alan's wrist as Jake's strength hummed through my fingertips burning through my muscles and whirring through my blood. I never felt so strong before, and yet I couldn't feel anything in Alan as I squeezed his arm tighter. I had to connect them. It's what my mind told me to do, the way a spark starts a flame. 
Milliseconds felt like minutes as Jake's energy flowed into me, a whir of raw power and heat, until finally, Alan gasped for air. His face was red, his chest was heaving, and his eyes began to close, but he was breathing and no longer choking for breath. Iris and Mia grabbed onto him, crying with both fear and relief as he lay there unconscious. Is he going to be okay? Iris squeaked with an anxious whisper. Yes, Jackson promised. He checked Alan's throat for a pulse. He's breathing. He's okay. With a tug, Jake pulled his arm from my grasp, and when I looked over, he began to waver beside me. A little help? Zoe shouted the instant it happened and reached out to steady him, wincing under his weight. Woody hurried over to help Zoe get Jake into the living room, and as I stood to help them, my head spun a little and my heart was beating so fast, I thought I might pass out. Bert pulled out a chair for me to sit. Easy, kid. Bo, get them some water. Jackson called, and he hurried into the living room after Jake. A full glass of water appeared in front of me, but I wasn't thirsty. I was exhausted. My mind felt like it was crashing, and my limbs felt heavy. I wasn't sure what I'd done, or if I should have attempted it. But I prayed like hell I'd made the right call. Alan is alive, I reminded myself. It's not working. Get him on the couch, Zoe said from the living room. More shrill than I would have expected, and I began to panic. Pulling myself up to my feet, I stumbled toward them. With grunts and groans, Woody and Jackson laid Jake out on the couch. Will he be okay? I knew Jake couldn't die, but could he be drained of his ability? What if he couldn't regenerate anymore? The truth was, I had no idea what I'd done, and if it would even keep Alan alive. Maybe it was a short-term fix, and Jake's power would drain away. Alan would die, and Jake would become unconscious. What if I just killed two more people? Zoe, I bit out. Will he? This happens, she admitted her arms crossed over her chest as she chewed anxiously on her bottom lip. She stared at Jake, eyes wide and worried. Why do you look so nervous? I braced myself against the living room wall. She almost glared at me. It doesn't mean I enjoy it. I swallowed thickly. Sorry, I... I didn't know what to do. But just as my mind began to spiral again, Zoe turned to me. She walked over and stopped so close to my face I thought she might slap me, but I didn't recoil, knowing I probably deserved it. You made the right call, she reassured me, her voice surprisingly level. Stop second-guessing yourself. You saved a man's life, and Jake will be fine. Then why do you seem so pissed off? I bit back at her, my heart racing with panic. I'm not. I'm surprised. Her voice was more tremulous than before and she took a step back. You're a conduit, but I never thought, she shook her head. I never really thought about what you were capable of until now. She looked at me, her eyes less narrowed this time. I've been where you are, feeling like you're somehow responsible for all the horrible things in your life, trust me. But you're not, so stop dwelling on it. She stared into my eyes so fiercely, I thought I should feel violated or vulnerable. No matter what you think you are, Alex, she said calmly, or how much you worry about what you've done, you are a good man. All the assholes and shitheads in the world who tried to bring you down don't change that. She pointed to Alan in the other room. You saved a man who was practically a stranger, uncertain what harm it would do to you. Or Jake, I added because it felt like she was letting me off the hook for endangering his life. No, she nearly smiled. You still see yourself as a boy, incapable of being a man of worth, but you knew deep down that Jake would be okay or you wouldn't have done it. You, of all people, wouldn't have risked hurting him because you already know the toll it would take on you and everyone else if it had. She stared at me, waiting for me to understand. I wanted to tell her that she didn't know me at all. She knew nothing about me or what I thought, but as she stood there, maddeningly certain, I felt seen for the first time because I couldn't hide from her or pretend she couldn't see the truth. It's fear that makes you second-guess yourself all the time. 
Zoe's voice was low, willing me to listen. But not everyone will reject or judge you if you let them in. Until you understand that, you will only see what you want to see and find reasons to push people who love you away. It felt like more of a scolding than Zoe's observation. You're talking about Sophie, I realized. As if she'd decided she was done imparting her learned wisdom, Zoe went to Jake's side. I wasn't sure if it was Zoe's irritating certainty or knowing how powerful her ability was, but I believed her. Or at least, I wanted to. Adrenaline was still buzzing inside me, and I felt almost out of my own body, like I was strong and weak at the same time, even high on the fact that I had done something more than helpful for a change. Something worthy. Zoe's words held weight and lingered in my mind. Feeling a sense of pride, I wanted to tell Sophie. The front door clattered open, and Kat and Becca walked in. Sorry we're late, Kat apologized, then froze in the entry. What the hell? She breathed and glanced between Alan and Jake's bodies. Becca stared at Jake, her expression giving nothing away. Alan went into cardiac arrest, Jackson explained and walked over to Jake, then bent down to check his pulse again. And Alex saved him, Iris whispered behind me. That's not entirely true, I said, turning around. Jake, her arms wrapped around me and her body began to shudder as she cried into my shoulder. Thank you. You have no idea what this means to me. Just thank you. 62. Sophie. Phil and I were lying on my bed in my room, staring up at the ceiling. Strips of setting sunlight lined the stark white walls as we laughed about a blurry thought. It had been so hard to get to this point, but now, every worry and every question was a distant scrambled shadow of a memory I couldn't grasp. I felt lighter and whole again. We should never leave this place, I cooed, releasing it on a breath like a wish. All I could think about was how happy I was that Phil was mine. Finally. She was gone, and I never had to move from this place of existence again. I stroked my hand down Phil's arm as he lay beside me, his rich, languid eye smiling at me. I could lay like this without a care in the world until I breathed my last breath. Everything was quiet. Everything was finally right. I love you, I said. Phil loved Sophie, and I loved Phil, and now we could be together. Now I could finally have him back. I'll always love you, and we'll never be parted from each other again. My mind flickered between light and dark, serenity and fear. Sophie? Why was I thinking about myself like I was someone else? Bill sat up on his elbows with a chuckle. Of course we won't, he promised. He reached out and stroked my cheek with an adoration that made my heart ache with an inexplicable bliss. Tell me you love me, I urged desperate to hear the words. Promise me. I yearned for it, like the scorched earth craved water. Phil looked deep into my soul, his gaze a rope that pulled me in until I was only a hair's breadth from his lips. Wrapping my arm around him, I pulled him closer, beating off every memory and every image. I needed him to stay here, closer to me, I wouldn't be able to live without him. Tell me, I urged. I love you, Sophie. His eyes burned with lust, but I hated the sound of her name on his lips. I loathed it and the way it always rolled so easily off his tongue, but I let him kiss me. I kissed Phil harder and willed him to devour me and feel something good for once. Not as her. But as me, for just once, I wanted it to be about me. I'd waited so incredibly long for this. 
He tore his lips from mine. I would die for you, Soph. No, I growled. Nora! My mind flickered again, halting and sputtering to catch up with itself. And I knew this wasn't me. I wasn't in control. This is wrong, I said, pushing Phil off of me. This is all wrong. I peered around my room, frantic as it became a hazy, unfamiliar place. It was a husk, a farce. What's happening? When I stared up at Phil, really looked at his face, I could see how strange it all was like my mind was waking up for the first time, and my hands began to shake. Phil's eyes were too amber and too clear, and his lashes were too long, like a porcelain doll. His teeth were too straight and white. His hair was too long, and his features were more narrowed. He was a sickening imitation of real life, perfection that didn't exist. He was a fantasy, but not my fantasy. A dense fog, so heavy my heart began to ache as it tried to settle over me. What is this? I rasped. What are you? As panic flooded through my veins and swirled in my head, I squeezed my eyes shut and tried to force my mind to consciousness. Wake up, Sophie. Wake up, I commanded. Wake the hell up! But the more I tried, the pricklier the fog became sharpening with every twisting independent thought. The more the fog settled, the less coherent my thoughts became, and I could feel my mind slipping away from me again. No, I breathed. I willed my eyes to open again, pushing so hard I felt my mind snap, and I saw a flash of her again. Of Nora, surrounded by absolute darkness. Her eyes were chartreuse, and she had a repugnant scar that ran the length of her face, from her right temple to her cheek. This creature wasn't a memory or a dream. She was a monster, and she was real and in my head, looking directly at me. Her lip curled as she seethed my name. Get out of my head, I choked out, holding on to whatever was left of my sanity and determination. It was barely a string floating away in the breeze, slipping, slipping away, my mind going with it. She was powerful, and she was squeezing my consciousness in her grasp, like a crumpled piece of paper. Get out of my head, I murmured, trying to shake her cerebral fingers from me. Get out! Closing my eyes once more, I squeezed my hands into fists hitting my thighs over and over as I began to fall further and further into darkness. Into an abyss I knew I might not wake up from this time. I said, get out! 63. Alex. I sat on the bench across the street from the house, unable to sleep after the chaos at dinner, long after everyone else had gone to bed. I didn't meet Iris for our walk because her dad had nearly died, and staying in for the night was the best. Or so I'd thought. All I could think about was what Zoe had said to me. Yes, I was well aware of how scared I was all the time. Not of looming shadows or myself, but of much worse things. Gut-wrenching things. Like heartbreak. I didn't want to feel weak, and Sophie made me feel vulnerable and powerless because she couldn't make a decision that seemed so fucking simple. I exhaled at the thought, like I'd been holding my breath all of these months, trying to wrap my mind around it. When she'd wanted me, I'd pushed her away like the coward I was. When I wanted her, she'd wavered, and I couldn't stomach that either. There were mushy footsteps in the grass behind me, and I glanced back to see Kat coming toward me. Her blonde hair hung down at her sides, and her street clothes were still on, but more rumpled than usual. Where are you? I asked, because she hadn't been at the house with everyone else. Walking. She sat down beside me and leaned her elbows on her knees with a sigh. So, you saved the night, huh? Look at you, 
finding your groove so far away from home already. I thought about Alan's red and white blotched face and his gaping mouth at the dinner table. Is that what it is? A groove? I peered up at the inky sky, still digesting everything that had happened. Anyone would have done the same thing, if they could. Yeah, well, they couldn't and you did. And those girls have a dad, or whatever he is to them, because of you. Yeah, I guess. Wow, way to celebrate the moment, Cat muttered. I guess I should leave you alone so you can wallow in your victory. I chuckled, uncertain how we'd gotten along without her unrelenting sarcasm before she'd shown up. Well, when you say it like that. With a smirk, she pulled a piece of paper from the breast pocket of her t-shirt. Any luck finding the answers you were looking for? I realized I hadn't asked much about it. I only knew she was here to find a cure for JJ. To do what, exactly, I wasn't certain. Zoe said Becca would be able to help you. The small trace of openness that Kat had expressed vanished, and she stared at the paper she fiddled with in her lap. Yeah, I have a couple answers right here, actually. She held up the piece of paper and unfolded it. It was the size of her palm, and she lifted it to show me. I leaned in. Coordinates? To where? The village Becca lives in. There are other regens there, and they've found out how to heal their failing bodies. What's the other one? She glanced at me. What? You said you have a couple answers. What's the other one? Kat folded the paper in half, staring at it like she was convincing herself to keep it. Me. I stared at her, assuming an explanation was coming. Finally, she looked at me and wiggled her fingers like she suddenly had jazz hands. What, your ability? Reluctantly, she nodded. Apparently, if I got this under control, I could help her, the same way I accidentally brought her back to life. Electroshock. That sounds... terrifying. Kat stared at me, like she was waiting for me to say something else. So, you have two answers and you don't seem happy about either of them, because... She flipped the paper over and over between her fingers. Because, she finally breathed. No matter how much I want her to, I don't think she'll do it. Either of them. You mean, she doesn't want to get better? Kat shrugged. Not for Elle, or you. She loves you, but why would she want to leave you? Even if distance had always seemed like the right answer when it came to Sophie and me, in an instance of a life or death, I'd do anything and everything I had to for Sophie if it came down to it, no matter the cost to me. I wouldn't think twice about it. JJ would do it. Of course she would, I said, hoping to reassure us both. I didn't know JJ well, and I barely knew Kat, but human instinct was to live, not to die. You're right. She might change her mind for Elle, but not for me. Kat continued to flip the folded paper over and over until I thought she might wear it to nothing. That's the pesky thing about memories. You have to actually have them to feel one way or the other. And JJ doesn't remember me. But if she loves you, Kat snorted and shook her head. Loved, she corrected. Past tense, before I brought her back. Then, I hesitated. Why are you going to all of this trouble for her? Why have you been looking for answers all of this time if you know she won't change her mind? With an unexpected sniffle, Kat shrugged, refusing to look at me as she slid the paper back into her breast pocket. Hope, I guess. You of all people know we can't choose who we love, no matter how much it hurts. I cleared my throat. You mean Sophie? Kat gasped and clutched her chest dramatically. I'm sorry, was I not supposed to know about you guys? Because it's super obvious. She deadpanned. You guys clearly have a thing. A thing? What's that mean? Kat tilted her head like I was dense. You know, a thing. A connection. A gravitational pull to one another. It's what I had with JJ when we met. 
I fought it for the longest time and even left my boyfriend for her. She almost barked a laugh. Wait, you like guys too? With a groan, Kat glared at me. I love people, she clarified. And I couldn't resist JJ, just like you can't resist Sophie, even if it doesn't make sense. Being with JJ was never part of my job. Kat's eyebrows drew together and her animation withered again. The thing between us, I think it's why I couldn't let her die in the first place. I wasn't supposed to save her. It wasn't part of the plan. Monitors don't get to choose whether or not they obey orders. But somehow, I could. Wow. I'd gone from dwelling in my measly, insignificant problems to talking about death, Kat's love life, and learning how screwed I truly was with Sophie if unrequited love was as bad as that. So now that you've found the answers you need, what are you going to do? I asked. Are you going to tell her? Yes. For my sanity, I think I have to. But my gut tells me it won't change anything. Kat stood up, heaving out a breath. What about you? What does your gut tell you about your thing? Are you going to keep flirting with that cute girl in there, or are you still holding out for Sophie? She has Phil, Kat snorted. You don't seriously believe that, do you? And don't just say yes. Do you honestly believe that Sophie loves Phil? No, I said, surprising myself. I guess I don't. I knew she was going through a lot, and I knew I wasn't there for her the way I could have been, the way I should have been. It dawned on me that Sophie might not really truly know how I felt about her either. I'd never told her I loved her. I'd never allowed myself to be so open until right before I left, because I always worried I'd let her down in some way. So then, it's a male pride thing that's stopping you. No, I corrected her. I was done talking about Sophie and me with everyone else. It's a self-preservation thing. Kat frowned and she shook her head. Look, I get it, okay? I'm an idiot. The more I thought about it, the more I realized it was true. Even Sophie had said something was off with her ability. I might have even felt it if I hadn't let my ego get in the way. And now, will you leave it alone, please? Between you and Zoe, I'm going to lose my damn mind. Oh, good. My job here is done. Kat threw up her hands. Now, back to my own brooding, she muttered. And with a wink, she nodded into the shadows. Looks like you have another visitor anyway. Jake nodded at her as she walked by him, and he stopped at the bench. Zoe thought I might find you out here. Of course she did, I grumbled. Jake chuckled, a baritone sound that reminded me of Jackson, and he sat down where Cat had been, only the bench groaned a little bit more in protest. I'm surprised you're awake. I thought you might need more time to recuperate after... I slept enough. I felt too rested to sleep anymore. Jake looked at me. That's actually why I came out here. Zoe mentioned you felt bad about what you did. He shook his head. You shouldn't. Jake seemed like the type of guy you listened to without interrupting, and his words carried so much weight, they broached no argument. So I didn't. This life is all about tough choices now, and God knows I've had to make my share of them. At dinner tonight, Zoe told me to accept my fate, like you had to. Did she now? His eyebrow curved, but I wasn't sure if it was with amusement or exasperation. You don't have to talk about it if you don't want. It's fine. I came to terms with it a long time ago. It's just, Zoe's pulling out the big guns for you. She must like you. Lucky me, I said. It is lucky. Jake looked at me. She doesn't talk about our personal life with anyone. Well, except for Danny, but that's a given. Danny? Her best friend. They've been through hell together. Jake sighed and leveled his gaze on me. What is it she wants me to know? Something riveting, I'm sure. In short, learn from us, kid, and seize the day because misery sucks. Trust me.
I've tried to outrun prophecies and give Zoe space to find herself. Hell, between poisoning, memory loss, kidnapping, I've lost her more times than I even want to count. And it's made getting this far pure agony. Holy shit. Tell me about it. He chuckled and scratched his stubbled jaw. I don't know squat about your love life, Alex, but Zoe must see a lot of us in you. If it's advice she wants me to give you, then. Jake leaned back in the bench and crossed his muscular arms over his chest. He zoned out for a second, losing himself in the past, or he was trying to find a few shiny pearls of wisdom. Fate, he finally said. Embrace it, or it will drive you fucking crazy. 64. Sophie. I said get out! I screamed, knowing it wasn't real. I was still sleeping and it was all in my mind. It was what would happen if Nora gained too much control that I feared. Because the more I allowed myself to feel her presence, the more I felt her utter desperation to have my mind. She was all around me, like the thick, wet heat of a sauna, oppressive and clinging to everything. I couldn't rise above her. As my dream wielder reeled my mind in closer, though, I could feel the synapses of her mind, not just her power. I could feel it buzzing and humming around me, charging the air. I could feel her desperation and the need she had to keep me in her grasp. She'd been needling her way in for so long, it was almost as if she was already tethered to me, posed to live this fantasy life she so frantically craved. But like everyone else, she was broken. I needed to find a weakness, and the only way to do that was to embrace her, terror and all. With the remaining shred of willpower I had left, I did the only thing I could think of. Instead of resisting her, I embraced her and prodded further into her mind. I reached out with my cerebral fingers to grab hold of her memories, the way she clutched onto mine. Then, I let all my inhibitions go. My resistance vanished, my poorly constructed walls crumbled, and I could see my puppet master, grotesque and vicious as she was. Nora's darkness, rage, and desire turned to loneliness and fear as her memory swallowed me. She wasn't much older than me, and she was happy once. I saw her walking through Whitehorse, holding hands with a man that smiled dotingly on her. I felt the pinch of her engagement ring between their clasped hands. He had the most minuscule resemblance to Phil. Tall, brown hair, brown eyes. I felt her adoration tear to shreds as a flash of a woman with bloodshot eyes and matted dark hair tore at her fiancé's throat, feasting on him like she was a rabid animal while Nora hid behind a dumpster, sobbing silently as she watched. I saw her walking numbly through the streets, unblinking, weak and unkempt, lost and listless. Her mind was hollow, her feet raw to the bone, but she didn't care. Her mind was nestled away in a protective nest, hope and reality lost with it. I saw the locker room at the gym Alex and I had secured, only there was a crazed woman inside, the same woman, hungry and feral, and she was coming for Nora. Tears stained Nora's fleshy cheeks as the woman lunged at her, slashing Nora's flesh, but she didn't care. Death was better than loneliness. There was a flash of a little girl's face and Nora shaking and bleeding, but it was her standing in her apartment window, watching us from across the street that stole my attention. It was her trigger. The moment she saw me and Phil, she awoke from her mindless haze. A primal, all-consuming need and determination consumed her, a crazed desire to make me her vessel. I was a ripe, shattered mind she could feel more easily than the others, and I had Phil. I burrowed deeper into her mind, clawing for the crevices she didn't want me to see. She was strong and had months to meddle in my dreams and sift through my memories, wiggling her way in at every possible moment, 
but I needed to break her connection to me. I had to distract her and loosen her grasp if I was going to be the one to get away this time. I knew instantly what she feared most, and no matter how cruel, it was my only power against her. You can't have my life, Nora! The moment I thought her name, my head felt like it was splitting in two. You're broken and foul-hearted, and if you hurt me, Phil will never forgive you. He doesn't love you. He will never love you. You're a monster, and he'll see you for what you are. As my words jarred her consciousness, her grip loosened, and the pain eased ever so slightly. You kill everything you touch, I continued. You don't deserve happiness. You don't deserve my fill. Shut up, she screeched, and my body physically cringed. You'll be alone forever, I told her, more composed this time. You won't have Phil, because he's too good for you, and you can't have him without me. Shut up, shut up, she shouted. You're a stupid whore who doesn't know what she wants. You're pathetic. You're the one who doesn't deserve any of it. As much as it stung to hear the words, she was wrong. Phil was my family, just like Alex and Elle and the rest of them. You don't deserve any of them, Sophie. You're weak. You'll always be weak, and you're not worthy of a family. You're not worthy of him. You can't have any of them, I told her, bolstered with a renewed sense of determination. She didn't just want Phil and me. She wanted everything she knew she'd never have again. You can't have me either. It doesn't matter, she said with a fiendish laugh. You were a means to an end, and I don't need you anymore. I gasped for breath, peering around my bedroom. She let me go. Why did she let me go? Sitting up. I patted my arms and face, never more grateful to feel my sweat-drenched skin. The sun was up. I was awake. I would have laughed with relief if her words didn't still ring in my head. Tossing off my blankets, I jumped out of bed and flung open my door. L! I rushed down the stairs. By the look of the sun in the eastern window, I knew it was late in the morning and she was already outside. L! I shouted. The screen door opened, and JJ stood in the doorway with a laundry basket tucked against her hip, her tired eyes wide with fear. Sophie, you look ill. I need Elle. Where's Elle? I said in a rush, running past her to the railing. She was in my head, JJ. She let me go. I don't know why, but she let me go. She's going to do something. I peered out at the pasture, but didn't see Thea or Elle. I didn't see Phil or Ross. Elle went to the prison with Ross. There are a few things they needed. I grabbed hold of JJ's shoulders, willing her to understand. There is something wrong. She was in my head, Nora. This whole time she was in my dreams, manipulating them. She was making me think I was crazy, and now... JJ's shoulders tensed, and she dropped the laundry basket on the deck with a thud. Someone was in your dreams? Yes, her name is Nora, and she wants Phil. She's feeding off my memories and is lost in a world that's not real. Sophie, JJ breathed and took a deep, steadying breath. Dreamwalkers are very dangerous. We have to find. A small scream filled the air far across the river, and my blood ran cold. Thea, JJ whispered. Before I knew what was happening, I ran into the house, snatched Jackson's rifle hidden under the couch, and ran down the steps on bare feet as Thea's screams tore through the sky. 65. L. Ross, Stanley, and I stood in the covered side yard outside the first sale block. Everything is flourishing in this area right now, Stanley said scratching his cheek as he surveyed his summer garden. I hate to move it all. Do you think I have to? I bent down to test the moisture in the soil, admiring Stanley's hard work. 
The bean stalks and tomatoes inundated the northern corner after weeks of trial and error, looking for just the right spot. I wasn't sure if it was Stanley's patience or if he had a green thumb, but he was a much better gardener than Woody. But then, Woody was so scatterbrained, I wasn't all that surprised. I assume we should move it, Ross said, but I'm not the head landscaper around this joint. He joked and pointed at me instead. I looked at Stanley with an apologetic smile. Yes, as frustrating as it is, when the time comes, I think the garden should be moved indoors. Unless we want to turn this old workout area into a greenhouse, like ours at the farm. Then you'll be able to plant here year-round. Al! I froze as a voice cried my name, and a cold chill trickled down my back. I glanced around the side yard. Oh? Ross's voice held the same concern that made the hair on my arms and neck stand on end. Are you okay? I swear your skin just turned ten shades paler. He shifted the rifle hanging over his shoulder and leaned closer. I... I swallowed thickly. I could have sworn I heard someone call my name. Stanley and Ross looked at one another. Perhaps you should sit down, Miss L, said Stanley. But I shook my head as they began to fuss over me, and I pushed Ross's hand away. Something's wrong, I told them, even if I didn't understand it. There was a voice in my head. It said my name. My heart began to pound in my chest, and I tried to catch my breath. It made no sense. I'd never heard anyone's voice in my head and somehow it seemed familiar and urgent. Miss L, sit down for a moment, Stanley insisted. L, hurry! I whipped around, frantically searching for the voice, though I knew it was for naught. Hurry? What? Where? L, you're scaring the shit out of me, Ross chided. Jackson will kill me if you lose your mind while he's gone. I clutched his arm my fingers pressing into his flesh as I tried to convince myself I wasn't crazy, and how somewhere deep down, I knew it was somehow linked to Sophie and Thea. Something's wrong. The words were hushed and rushed and filled with horror. Without another second of hesitation, I reached for my pistol holstered on my hip and ran through the side yard toward the truck. Hurry up, I shouted, but Ross and Stanley's frantic footsteps and my voice were barely audible as every flame-enveloped nerve inside me turned cold with deadly determination. If someone hurt them, I would set their world aflame. 66. Alex I'd been spoiled since Whitehorse and hadn't had to use a wash bin in cold water to bathe or wash my face in months. I was too tired from not sleeping all night to care much, though. I stared into the bathroom mirror, water dripping off my face. Cat had been right. I let my ego get in the way of what Sophie and I shared and the connection neither of us could shake. If I'd just listened to her, really listened, I might have been able to help her instead of pushing her further away and closer to Phil. She was clearly struggling in ways I hadn't given much thought to, and I'd left her behind. Again. I dried off my face and pulled the clean, long sleeve shirt over my head. At least I had a couple weeks to figure out what exactly I was going to do to fix things with Sophie. When I opened the bathroom door, Bo was standing in the hallway, bare-chested and wearing a pair of khaki pants with his shirt folded under his arm. Took you long enough, he grumbled, but I didn't let him egg me on. Instead, I pissed him off even more by rumpling the top of his head as I stepped past him. Good morning to you too, bud. You snored last night. No, I didn't. Yep, you did. I could smell coffee in the kitchen, which meant Bert and Jackson were awake. So I hurried down the steps and beelined for the kitchen in the caffeine. Jackson sat at the kitchenette with Bert, and both of them were staring at me. I slid to a stop in sock-covered feet on the laminate floors. Uh, good morning? Where were you all night? Jackson asked, eyeing me over the brim of his mug. 
Where do you think he was? Bert said with a sneaky grin. He saved a cute girl's dad last night. <laughs> she was probably thanking him all night long. Cross, I growled, half amused but mostly disturbed by Bert's insinuation. Why do you have to make everything so creepy? Jackson snorted and glanced between us. Anyway, I was just up, thinking. When I turned to the coffee pot, I momentarily panicked that there wasn't enough left. There's a half a cup or so, Bert said. Who want me to make more? I'm sure you need it. He winked at me. Rolling my eyes, I poured myself what was left and headed over to the table to pull on my shoes. Did you hear what Huck mentioned about the ability reversal serum idea? The front door busted open. Jackson, a raspy voice called. He and I looked at one another and rushed to the living room. Becca stood in the entry, glancing frantically around. You have to go home. What? Jackson bellowed. Why? Now! She shouted. I saw a woman. She had a scarred face. I saw flames everywhere and... She hesitated, and my heart jumped into my throat, no longer beating as I held my breath. And what? Bert urged. Death, she breathed. I felt death. Sophie. Hell, Jackson ground out. Before Becca could tell us we needed to leave again, we were running for our things. If something happened to Sophie, I could never live with myself. Not without her knowing how I still felt about her, and that I would help her. I would fight for her. My vision blurred, imagining any of them hurt. I could barely run to Bo fast enough. I pounded on the bathroom door as I rushed past and into our room. Bo, hurry. We have to go. Our family's in trouble. I just prayed with every single sliver of hope that we wouldn't be too late. 67. Sophie. With bare feet, I ran through the woods, stopping only to listen for another scream, a rustle in the leaves, something that would indicate where Thea had gone. This is my fault. I should have known sooner. I should have told Elle so she wouldn't have left. Thea had to scream again or cry out if I was going to find her. And soon, before the fear of the unimaginable sank in, and I lost what was left of cohesive thought completely. I was about to shout her name when the rumbling roar of a bear echoed through the woods. My already pounding heart seized. Then I heard Thea scream again, small and scared, and tears burned my eyes. Thea! I sprinted toward the chuffing grouse. The hunting cabin. Innately, I knew that's where she would be. Sticks poked the bottoms of my feet, and the rifle was heavy and slick in my sweating hands as I forced myself to run faster, harder, and deeper into the woods. Thea! I nearly fell through a break in the trees outside the cabin. Thea! I breathed. The grizzly paced, agitated and pawing at the ground, as Thea and another girl, a couple years older with choppy brown hair that hung in her face, whimpered against the cabin. Thea clung to the girl as they huddled together. But despite the girl's worried brow, she didn't have tears in her eyes the way Thea did. She didn't look afraid. Thea? I said as steadily as I could, and I raised my rifle. Don't move. No! The little girl shouted, and I recognized her from Nora's memories. Don't kill her! She won't hurt us! Thea's tear-stained face told me otherwise. I aimed my rifle at the bear's head. Please! The little girl stepped forward. She's my friend! Then send it away and let Thea come to me! The little girl glanced frantically from me to the bear, like she couldn't decide. Nora! She sniveled. Nora! A cold chill ran down my spine. Nora, she's going to shoot her! What? A familiar voice spat the word as the cabin door flung open. The face from my dreams appeared in real life as Nora hobbled out, glaring at the little girl. What do you want, Arya? She seethed with impatience. Arya? 
She was real. I barely had time to hate myself for not realizing Ario was real from the start, and clearly part of Nora's games, before Nora's frail, desperate voice pierced the air again. I told you I was busy. Her hiss faded as she noticed me, and her cold, dead eyes narrowed for a single second before amusement settled in. A sneer parted her lips. I told you it was too late, Sophie. I already have what I want. Her face was just as disfigured as in my dreams, though she wasn't as frightening as the monster she'd made herself out to be. She looked sickly and frail. Not only had her face been scarred by the crazy woman, but Nora's leg had been permanently injured as well. She was sickly and feeble, almost pitiable, and her mind was the most broken of all. Nora! Arya's voice was wiry and torn, like she didn't know what to do. The bear continued to pace, more protected than threatening, but I would shoot it if I had to. I would shoot Nora too if I had to, and deal with any remorse later. I did what you asked, Arya croaked. But I don't want- Arya. Nora cooed so soft it was sickening. You promised you'd help me. You want a family too. Let my sister go, Arya, and I won't shoot your bear, I promised her. Arya, Nora warned, don't listen to her. Arya looked from Nora to me, tears filling her eyes as she tried to decide what to do. But I don't want to do this anymore, she whined. And as Nora registered how truly torn the little girl was, her easy facade began to crack. Arya. The girl's name was so breathy in the air, I barely heard it. You promised. You said you would help me, that you missed your family too. I do, but... Then Coco stays as she is, Nora commanded. I'm done waiting, I warned them, aiming my rifle once more. I'll shoot the bear. No, Arya cried, and Nora scrambled for something in the doorway before pulling Thea to her chest. I took a frantic step forward, forgetting about the bear, as I aimed my rifle at Nora, searching for a shot. Nora was crouched behind Thea with a gun in her shaking hand, pressed to the back of Thea's head. Save for Nora's fingers clutching Thea's shoulder, her spindly body was covered and she lowered her face to Thea's ear and whispered something. You won't shoot her, Nora. She wanted a family too badly. I had a sickening suspicion she wanted Phil more, though. Phil will hate you if you hurt Thea, I promised her. If I tell him you let her go, he might forgive you. Nora's nostrils flared, and pure amusement lit her face. You don't know then, she said, with far too much enjoyment. A grin parted her lips, and she rested her chin on Thea's shoulder, gun still trained at Thea's head. I already have Phil. The blood drained from my limbs, and the knowledge that she loved him and would likely never hurt him was all that prevented me from falling forward. Nora's grip on Thea's shoulder tightened, and Thea shrieked with a sob. This is all your fault, Sophie, Nora purred. All your fault. 68, L. Ross sidled up to the front of the house, Stanley and I following his lead. He sidestepped to the large picture windows and peeked into the living and dining room. I waited for some indication of what was happening, but his expression gave nothing away. It was Jenny's voice in my head. It had to be. But why and how, I didn't understand yet. And we had no idea what was happening, so we needed the element of surprise. There's no one inside. Ross rushed out and nodded to the front door. We never used it, but going around back would give us away. His gaze darted between us as we decided our next move. Go in, 
keep quiet and search the house. I'm going to make my way around back. I'll use the smokehouse and skinning shed as cover. We gave him a quick nod, and with a deeply drawn breath, Ross crouched under the windows and scurried down to the front of the house, then disappeared around the corner, his rifle trained in front of him. Unlike Ross, who had military training, Stanley was no soldier. He'd been a normal guy working in a pharmacy before his ability made him the perfect candidate for the general's entourage. I wasn't military either, but the fire inside of me was rampant and ready if I needed to use it. We sweep downstairs first, I told him, meeting Stanley's round, sepia-toned eyes. I could see my reflection in his black-rimmed glasses as he nodded and pushed them up the bridge of his nose. Nervously, he licked his lips. Keep your eyes on the second floor. Holding his rifle tighter against him, Stanley lowered his chin in understanding, afraid but ready. I offered him the most reassuring nod I could and lifted my pistol as I reached for the handle. Drawing in a deep breath, I slowly pressed the latch and eased the front door open. The interior was quiet as we stepped inside, sweeping the immediate area and finding no signs of a disturbance in the dining room. We moved to the kitchen before creeping toward the walk-in pantry and den, all of which were vacant. As I stepped into the living room, I froze beside the sectional, staring through the screen door as Ross ascended the deck steps. He aimed his gun on the crumpled body in front of him. Jenny, I breathed and rushed to the doorway. Ross shifted his rifle from one hand to the other as he crouched down beside my sister's body. Her long, dark hair was splayed out around her slackened face, and her narrow lips were slightly open, as if she'd been trying to speak before she collapsed. Ross leaned over her, checking for a pulse. She's alive, he said, glancing up at me, but the remorse in his eyes told me it wasn't good. Jenny! My heart hammered so hard and fast, I wasn't sure how long I stood beside them, staring down in terrified confusion. Was she calling for me because this was the end? Because she knew she was dying? My heart began to break all over again, and my insides twisted. Thea, I remembered, frantically glancing around. Where are Thea and Sophie? With a gasp, Jenny's dark lashes fluttered open, and her green and gray irises, unfocused as she blinked herself awake, settled on me. I dropped to my knees beside her. Jenny, the woods. She breathed the words so weakly I hardly heard her against the whir of fury rushing through me. Save them. Jenny's gaze shifted in the direction of the bridge, and every fiery fiber inside me flared hotter. They're in trouble. As Sophie and Thea's faces flashed in my mind, whatever fear I had disintegrated to ash, and the fire inside me burst to life again. I jumped to my feet, my gun crashing to the floorboards. Fear and dread were dwarfed by a solidified determination and ferocity to find them. Gripping his rifle in one hand, Ross hurried back down the steps toward the woods. Go, Stanley said behind me. I'll stay with Jenny. But his words were only a remote hum in the back of my mind, a reassurance I couldn't quite process as my mind blazed with the sole intent to incinerate anyone who dared to harm my family. As I ran toward the bridge, all I could think was this place was our home, and the kids were my family, and I would make it right. With each determined step, I let the inferno inside me burn hotter and hotter as my body heat roared to a blaze. Flames tickled the surface of my skin, and every apprehensive thought I had melted away replaced with sheer resolve. I would burn anything and everyone to the ground if I had to. 69. Sophie. If you have Phil, leave Thea alone, Nora, or I'll shoot you. I swear to God, I will. And risk hitting her? She said with far too much confidence. I gritted my teeth together. You and I both know how weak you are, Sophie. All of your training didn't prepare you for this, did it? 
he were so worried about those horrible men and what they'd do to you if they found you again, that you forgot to practice your aim. How long has it been since you practiced? Six months? Longer? I hated Nora's voice. I hated her horrid face and everything about her, and I wanted her dead more than anything in the world. She didn't know me like she thought she did. I was a good aim, and I didn't have to shoot her in the head to get her away from Thea. I wasn't going to wait around for Nora to snap, either. Have it your way, I muttered, and aimed my rifle at Thea's shoulder. It would go through, and if I was lucky, hit Nora in the heart, injuring her regardless. The leaves and branches around me began to rustle, and a low, pulsating chur came up behind me. I could feel the heat before I turned to see Elle coming out of the trees. She scorched the earth with every footstep, and the pine needles and branches around her withered and burned. Her face was distorted in waves of heat, and flames crackled from her hardly visible skin. I heard a collective gasp behind me, and the bear barked in fear and darted for the woods. Relief flooded me as I stumbled back from the flames, nearly dropping my gun. I thought fireballs would shoot from Elle's eyes as she surveyed the scene, but the flames tapered down as she registered Nora, Thea, and Arya in shock against the cabin. I don't know what Elle expected to see, but I doubted it was three terrified girls. Ross came through the trees behind her, keeping his distance. It's Nora, I told them, pointing at the psycho still grabbing hold of my sister. Elle's eyes narrowed on Nora, and Ross looked horrified. I wasn't sure how they'd known to come, but I guess he hadn't expected to find a feeble young woman at the helm of it. Shoot her, Ross, I ground out, but I wasn't sure he could hear me over the whir of Elle's low-lit flames. Shoot her, I said more loudly and glanced back at Nora. With a quivering chin, Nora looked frantically between Elle and me, shaking her head. She has Phil, I shouted. She threatened to kill Thea, shoot her. Elle stepped forward on instinct, and as the flames surrounding her roared back to life, I fell into the trees, dropping my gun in the suffocating wave of heat, and scrambled back. No! Nora cried, tears filling her eyes. She's Aria's friend, I wouldn't hurt her. I just, don't I deserve a second chance too? Tears streaked down her scarred cheeks as she clutched onto Thea's shirt, like Thea was all that was holding her up anymore. It's her fault! Nora pointed at me and fell to her knees, pulling Thea down with her. Thea whimpered and shut her eyes as she fell backward, a rag doll in Nora's grip. With creaks and groans, the cabin began to shake, like it was uprooting from its foundation. Go, Thea, I silently urged. I wanted her to send the cabin crashing down on Nora so she'd be gone for good, but Thea was too scared. The more she cried, the less the foundation shook, but Nora didn't realize that. She let go of Thea and scrambled away from the cabin, and I knew it was our last chance. Shoot her, Ross! Shoot Nora! He lifted his rifle and hesitated. Pain filled his eyes, and I saw the dread in what he was about to do. But as Nora scrambled for the gun, he aimed his rifle at her head. Nora stopped mid-motion, as if she was suspended in time, her fingers just barely brushing the pistol, before her head snapped unnaturally far to the right, bug-eyed, and her mouth agape. Then her body collapsed to the ground. For a moment, I stared at Nora's lifeless body, gripping the earth between my fingers as the cabin settled back into place with a groan. Thea ran over, crying as I wrapped my arms around her with a sob of relief. Glancing behind me, Elle was no longer burning with flames, and her clothes were singed to her body. She stared at JJ, who was hobbling over. JJ clung to Stanley, one arm around his neck and the other still outstretched, like she'd just broken Nora's neck with the flick of her wrist. Then, her eyes rolled into the back of her head. Jenny! Elle shouted, 
running to her sister's side. But it was too late. JJ collapsed into Stanley as she lost consciousness, and it was all he could do to catch her as they both fell to the ground. Jenny! Al called again and fell to her knees beside her. Pulling Thea up into my arms, I limped over to them on bruised and cut bare feet. She's alive, but her pulse is still weak, Stanley said, shaking his head. His eyes met Elle's with worry. I told her she should stay back. I told her it was too much, but she wouldn't listen. Ross crouched down next to Elle as tears trickled down Elle's ash-smeared cheeks. We have to get her back to the house. Here, Ross said, handing Elle his gun. I'll carry her back. Wait! I spun around, remembering Phil. Setting Thea to her feet, I ran toward the cabin, past Nora's body, and Arya, crouched down and crying beside her. The cabin was lived in, not like when I'd seen it before. The bed was covered in blankets, and candles and lanterns were strewn around the space. I even saw one of our packs we'd unloaded at the gym, and it all started to come together. Nora attacked at the gym, the dead woman's body that Alex and I had found, the little footprints, and the storage shed that had been ransacked. For months, Nora had been inching closer to us, and for months, she'd been feeding off of me. I didn't care how or why anymore, only that I had to find Phil. He's not here, I rasped. Turning on my heels, I marched to the door ignoring the lacerations on the bottoms of my feet. Where is he? I demanded, glaring at Arya. She shook her head, sniffing as she wiped the snot from her nose. I don't know, she hiccuped. I stared at Elle as Ross made his way back through the trees with JJ's body. Stanley followed behind him with my gun. We have to find Phil, Elle. Nora has him somewhere. She's done something to him. We'll find him, she promised, her brow hard set with worry. Thea clutched Elle's hand with a whimper. I promise. For all we know, he's still in his cabin. Of course, I breathed, so relieved I might have squealed it. I'd forgotten he had an early morning shift at the fish wheel. What about Arya? Thea squeaked, her little chin trembling. She can't stay here alone. I stared down at the little girl, her hair matted to her damp face, her cheek resting on her knee as she picked at Nora's threadbare shirt. As much as I wanted to hate the little girl for putting Thea in danger, she also refused to hurt her when Nora had asked her to. Come on. I offered my hand out to her. I needed to know more about Arya and glean what she knew about Phil before we could trust her. Aria looked up at me with watery, coffee-colored eyes, scared and uncertain. Come on, Aria, Thea called. We'll take care of you. Wiping her nose again, Aria climbed shakily to her feet. The tip of her shoe had a hole in the toe, and my heart broke a little for her as I realized how wretched she was. Take my hand, I told her, more gently this time and I wiggled my fingers. Slowly, Arya slid her little hand in mine, her eyes watery and wary. The moment I touched her skin, I saw her past unfold and felt the false hope she'd found in Nora. I saw her all alone in an apartment building, hungry and afraid. I saw the bear attacking Rocky at Nora's request because he couldn't be controlled by Arya's mind like the others could. I saw charitable moments between Arya and Nora, and how much they loved each other before Nora lost herself in a dark hole of delusion. And I saw Arya, watching all of us longingly through the bushes, where she was told she could never leave. I felt her hope to one day have a family again, just like Thea, and her fear that she would be alone again. I'm s sorry she stuttered through a sob, and I knew Arya didn't know where Phil was. My heart lodged in my throat. I know, I said, 
swallowing my fear and sadness. Let's go home. 70. Sophie My feet wouldn't move fast enough as I hurried ahead of Ross and everyone toward the cabins. I grasped onto the hope that Phil was in his room, that he wasn't gone or injured, or worse. Phil? I called, running past JJ's cabin door to his. I knocked, but was too impatient to wait for an answer that might never come. Phil! I called more desperately, and I reached for the handle. The door opened before I could turn the knob, and he was standing there in his pajama pants, without a shirt, scrubbing the back of his head. Sophie? He shook his head with a yawn, his hair mussed and his eyes bleary with sleep. Frozen in disbelief, I stared at him, unsure he was real. I was having the trippiest dream, he murmured through another yawn. Then it just stopped. You were there and I gasped. Oh, thank God. I wrapped my arms around him with a choked sob. I thought she'd gotten you. I inhaled his skin and reveled in the solidity of him against me. His heart was still pounding and his mind was foggy. I could see me in his dreams. I could see us together. And I saw Phil happy. I could feel his happiness. And it shredded me inside. Phil, it wasn't me. All of these head games, it's been Nora the whole time. She's been pushing us together. But even as I said the words, I knew that wasn't true. Not for him. It was part of the reason she chose me why I was an easier target than the rest. She wanted us to be together because she's sick and... She's dead now, isn't she? Phil's gaze narrowed on me. I could feel it, the way everything in my dreams changed. I'd wanted to stay in there forever, until I didn't. It wouldn't have been real, I told him, wiping my eyes. I needed him to know that the confusion... The feelings weren't real. At least, most of them weren't. Bill's expression was pained and a little off kilter, but he nodded. Yeah, I know, Soph. As his eyes shifted over me and he took in my dirty pajamas, he straightened. Are you okay? He frowned and bent down to look at my feet. What the hell happened? Elle's pleas in the adjacent cabin filled the air and the scraping and rustling of furniture were like a lead blanket of reality settling over me. Phil was only a blurry outline as I shook my head. I thought you were dead, I choked out. And JJ, I don't know if she's going to make it. Phil pulled me into his arms, and as the memory of Nora's face filled my mind, my complete carelessness and utter stupidity consumed me. I should have known. I cried into his chest. The adrenaline dispelled, and my mind and muscles grew heavy with fatigue. I should have known. Sophie, this is not your fault. I nodded against his chest, relieved Phil was alive. But I feared JJ would be the one to pay for my weakness and stupidity. I wished for a do-over, and more than anything, I wished Alex were home. 71. L. I sat at Jenny's bedside as night descended, knowing in my gut that if she didn't wake up soon, she probably never would. Her telepathy and telekinesis still confused me. Then again, everything about her was a patchwork of vague uncertainties, and what mattered was that whatever power she'd used had almost killed her. I could smell the smoke clinging to every part of me as I ran my fingers through my hair. Other than splashing water on my face and throwing on some clean clothes, I didn't have it in me to shower. I was too afraid to leave my sister alone. I was too afraid she'd leave me. Despite the hazy afternoon, her room was dark, with only the light of the bathroom to fill the cabin while she slept. The room was stark and impersonal 
like a hotel room Ginny and Kat hadn't bothered to make theirs, and I wondered if it was because Ginny hadn't known how much longer she had left. My heart squeezed in my chest as I stared at the empty space beside her, wondering whether or not Kat would get to see Ginny again. For Kat's sake, I hoped so. Ginny's breath caught in her throat, and I reached for her hand, squeezing it tightly. Jenny? I whispered hopeful. Can you hear me? Chair scratched on the porch outside the door, and there was a cacophony of footsteps as the others filed inside. Jenny cleared her throat, and I bit my lip, waiting with bated breath as her eyes flitted open. Hey, I whispered. I could feel the other's presence behind me, and as Jenny's eyes fell on me, they focused, and then her gaze slid over the rest of them. I glanced over my shoulder, at four sets of pensive stares in our direction. Ross cleared his throat. Come on, he whispered, nudging Stanley and Phil. Let's give them some space. We need to check on Thea and Aria anyway. I reached for Sophie's hand and drew her closer. We were both a quivering mess, and Jenny smiled at us, if a little weakly. She patted the bed by her legs for Sophie to sit. We didn't know if you'd wake up, I told her, trying not to lose what little steel I had left. Jenny squeezed my hand. I did not know if I would either, she admitted. How did you do that? Sophie breathed, still in awe like the rest of us. How could you tell Elle and do what you did? I can do many things, she explained. I do not know why, only that I have been able to hide without being found before. I knew I should find you, that you needed me, even if I couldn't explain how. But. It weakens you, I realized. She'd gone from being relatively fine to using her ability twice in one day, and I saw the results in the waxen color of her skin and heard it in the readiness of her voice. I pulled her hand up to my face, pressing my cheek to it. I needed to feel her warmth, to know she wasn't leaving me already. You risked your life for us. I said through the break of tears. For me. I couldn't hold them back anymore. I would do anything for you, Elle. I would do anything for your family. Covering my face with my hand, I cried. You can't leave me, I told her, but it was a miserable plea. You can't, not again. I need you. I am not leaving you, she promised, brushing my cheek with her finger. Not yet, her pale lips pulled into a reassuring smile, and even though I knew it was only a matter of time, that time wasn't now. I remembered something, Jenny said, her eyes brightening a little. While I was sleeping, I had a dream. It was of a song. A special song our mother used to sing to us a long time ago. I searched as far back as I could, trying to think of the sound of my mother's voice, let alone the song she might have sung. Jenny began to hum. It sounded like a nursery rhyme, only vaguely familiar at first. And then the words popped into my head. The sound of silence will set you free, I breathed. Jenny's eyes met mine as she continued to hum. In the silence there I'll be, so no more crying now. Shed your fears. You're never alone, because you'll always have me. Chills trickled over my skin as Jenny's riddle came to light. A lullaby? I remembered it from a distant memory, lying in bed with my mother and sister, in a room shrouded in darkness. The darkness was almost soothing as my mother sang, her words lulling me to sleep. 
You remembered. I smiled at her, somehow proud that she could find a sliver of something good from our childhood and that she could share it with me after all these years. I always wondered what the words meant and why they were so important to you. A strange calm washed over me, and I closed my eyes as the sound of my sister's hum lulled me into a welcomed respite. Seconds felt like minutes as her throaty song settled in around my heart. An engine rumbled outside, and my eyes popped open. Sophie jumped to her feet, cringing a little as she wiped the tears from her eyes. Who's? Yay! Dell and Jade are here! Thea chirped outside the open door, and my heart soared. The Ranskins! Sophie practically exploded out of the room, and I looked at Jenny. You said they would come. I'd forgotten about that. She smiled. I am glad they made it. I was hoping I would get the chance to meet them. She nudged my hand. Go. I will be okay. Say hello to your friends. Torn, I looked at Jenny. Worried that if I turned away for a single minute, she would leave me without saying goodbye. I will be here when you get back. Her words were as much a promise as they were a plea. I believed her. And reluctantly, I headed for the door. I wasn't sure how fast I was moving. But it seemed like only milliseconds before I wasn't walking toward Jade. I was running. When her smoky, quartz-colored eyes met mine, Brimming with sorrow in the dying sunlight, I fell into a sobbing heap in her arms. Oh, my dear, she whispered, petting my hair down my back. All will be well. Shaking my head, I began to break. 72. Sophie as the hours went on and the sun lowered behind the mountaintops, JJ began to wince more and more. She struggled to breathe, and we all knew it wouldn't be long. Ross paced outside the door. Elle only left JJ's side when she had to, and even Jade did all she could to keep JJ comfortable. Here, Jade said, handing Elle a cup of herbal tea. We didn't ask what it was, because we knew it was for the pain. It's only lukewarm, so she can drink. Jade met JJ's unfocused gaze. It will help a little. JJ gave her best effort to smile, but her lips cracked, and even lifting her head to sip from the mug made each breath more of a chore. Any movement seemed to result in a coughing fit, and it was only a matter of time before JJ's body shut down completely. The minutes passed, me leaning against the wall in JJ's bedroom, wishing Ross could have gotten hold of Jackson. Even if Jade and Dell were here, Elle wasn't going to be able to hold it together for much longer. She needed Jackson, and Kat, I feared, would miss the chance to say goodbye to JJ. Elle, Ross said gently from the doorway. I got through to Jackson. Elle looked back at him, and he held up the radio. They've already left Prince Rupert. He nodded for her to step outside with him. He wants to talk to you. Elle wiped the moisture from her eyes to no avail and licked her lips. I'll be right back, she whispered, and squeezed JJ's hand for good measure. I promise. Eyes and nose swollen from tears, Elle nearly stumbled as she stood. Jade held Elle by the arm and helped her to the door. Sophie. JJ's voice cracked, and I hurried over to her. She glanced at Elle's chair, and I thought she might have wanted me to sit, so I did. You are very strong, she whispered. But after today, you already know that. The corner of her lip tugged ever so slightly, and she took a shallow breath. You will be much stronger still. My nostrils flared as I realized it was a goodbye. 
you must remember this. Even when you doubt yourself, just as my sister must. I did feel stronger. JJ was right. After using my mind as a defense against Nora, I felt a confidence I'd never felt. You are determined. Never change that. I nodded, willing to do anything for JJ because she'd done so much for us. The Ranskins, Nora, what she did for Elle by coming to find her, even if it was only to leave her again. Okay, I promised. And, she said, tears glistening in her eyes. Will you tell Kat I love her, please? I could not have found my sister without her. I had to open my mouth to breathe, and the tears were too thick in my eyes to see JJ anymore. I will. Kat would never forgive herself for not finding a cure in time, or for not being there during JJ's last breaths. It was always meant to be this way. There was nothing Kat could have done. She struggled to swallow. She will not believe you, but tell her anyway, will you? JJ rested her hand on mine and cleared her throat. Please, she said, her eyes flitting closed. Get L and Ross. Biting the inside of my cheek, I rose to my feet. JJ had been a miracle Elle had never expected. Now, she would be Elle's greatest heartbreak, and I wasn't sure I could bear it. Seventy-three. Elle. No, I whimpered the moment Sophie stepped outside with tears filling her eyes. I shoved the radio into Ross's hand and ran for Jenny's room. She was lying still, unmoving. Jenny? Her eyes peeled open. Oh, thank God. I nearly fell into the chair beside her bed. Elle, she rasped, and opened her palm resting on the blanket beside her. Gladly, I took her hand, feeling the warmth in it fading. Gritting my teeth together, I brushed the dark hair from her brow and smiled at her. Look after Cat for me, she whispered. Of course, I said as my face crumpled. I was an ugly crier. I always had been. And I knew this, the saddest moment of my life, would be no exception. I just didn't want it to be the final thing Ginny saw and tried to control myself as best I could. I'm glad you came, I told her. I wish we had more time. I could barely speak the words. But I'm so glad you did. Jenny's eyes flitted shut as she attempted another smile. Good. There was an ease in her voice, raspy as it was, and a contentment that made me feel the smallest bit lighter. L? Thea squeaked from the doorway, where Ross and Phil stood. Come here, Squiggles, I told her, wiping my nose. It's okay. Thea shuffled over, her chin down, and her eyes skirting from Jenny to me before she climbed up into my lap. You will take care of L for me, Jenny rasped, trying to smile. Won't you? Thea worried her bottom lip, then nodded. Good, that, she cleared her throat. That makes me happy. Thea crawled onto the bed and wrapped her arms around Jenny. Thank you for saving me, she said through tears, and I hated to count how many deaths Thea had seen by the age of eight. How much had Jenny seen but couldn't remember? Which memories would have come back to her if we had more time together? What new, better memories would we share if we had the chance? When the tears escaped from Jenny's eyes, I thought it must be harder for her to leave than she let on, that she might wait for Cat, for a possible cure, and she'd decided to stay. 
If you hold on just a little bit longer, Cat might... Jenny shook her head. No, she winced. Please. I wasn't sure if it was the pain or the thought of having to say another goodbye that made her chin tremble. I wanted to plead with her to change her mind, but I didn't want Jenny to suffer any longer either. You've already given me so much. It was a reminder to myself. There was nothing else I could ask of her. I heard Ross's heavy, tentative footsteps behind me. When Jenny met his gaze with a reluctant nod, I was confused. I looked back at him. When I saw the regret in his eyes, I realized he'd come for her. Like death himself, Ross was going to take away her pain and let her fall asleep forever. Tears fell like liquid ribbons from my eyes, and I shook my head, squeezing her hand tighter so she wouldn't let go. No. I wept the word over and over as Ross sat down on the mattress beside her. When she was finally ready, Jenny closed her eyes and inhaled, like she was prepared for the end I never wanted to come. She squeezed my hand and lifted the other to Ross. No! I choked out. Jenny! Jenny! It wasn't even a word, but a cry. Ross's body trembled as he lowered his head. His brow furrowed, and Sophie reached for his shoulder, as if she too were bound to bear the gut-wrenching impossible with Ross, as Jenny left this world. With a stifled cry, Sophie rested her hand on my shoulder, and I felt the weight of Jenny's burden. The pain she felt in the darkness that lingered began to dissolve. I felt her relief and peace, as well as her sorrow, and I hugged Thea tighter against me. Opening my eyes, I watched as my sister opened her mouth and inhaled a final breath before her eyes closed again for the last time. 74. Alex The evening sun was blotted out by the cloudy sky when the bus finally rolled up the driveway. We knew JJ was hurt, but we didn't know to what extent. Ross wouldn't tell us much over the radio, only that we needed to hurry. Along with my dread, I felt surprised when I spotted the Ranskins' truck in the driveway, and I was filled with a sudden rush of relief. Everyone milled around outside JJ and Kat's cabin, with crestfallen faces. As relieved as all of us had been to hear Elle's watery voice over the radio, silently, we'd all prepared for the worst. Open the door, Kat demanded before the bus came to a complete stop. Woody did as she requested, and Kat and Jackson lunged out the door and ran toward the cabins. I rushed out behind them. The hours of driving, only stopping to pee when absolutely necessary, wound us up so tight I thought the whole bus might combust. Cat pushed past Phil, Thea, and a little girl sitting on the porch who I'd never seen before. Past Stanley and Jade and Dell as if she didn't even see them until she was inside. JJ? Cat let out a warbling cry from inside, and Jackson's footsteps faltered. As he stepped into the doorway, his face paled. I stepped in behind him, and I could feel it. Death. It permeated the air and was written all over Ross and Sophie's faces as they leaned against the wall. Both of them looked like they hadn't slept in weeks, their faces ashen and their eyes red-rimmed. Elle was sitting in a chair by JJ's bedside, the outline of her sister unmoving. JJ, Cat cried, crawling up onto the bed with her. She sobbed JJ's name over and over, pulling JJ's limp hand to her lips, begging her to wake up. But JJ had been gone too long for that. Elle's shoulders heaved, but she didn't turn around. She didn't move. I stood dumbly for a moment, staring at Sophie. She was alive and breathing, none of the things my mind had conjured in the hours before we'd finally heard from Ross. I saw a woman. She had a scarred face. I saw flames everywhere. 
I wanted Sophie to know that I'd come back for her, that I was an idiot and wanted to put the past year behind us, but she barely registered I was standing there, if at all. As Kat wept, Jackson stepped up to Elle, slowly reaching for her shoulder, like he was worried he'd startle her. Elle, he whispered. I felt everything inside of me hollow, like I was gutted from the inside out, watching the macabre scene in front of me unfold. Slowly, Elle peered up at him. Her eyes were lifeless puddles that shimmered in the dim light. It happened so fast. She breathed, and Jackson helped her to her feet. He only did what she wanted him to. Her voice was so quiet, it was difficult to hear her above Kat's sobs. Jackson pulled Elle into his arms as Kat flung herself off the bed. What? She shrieked, hurling herself toward Ross. She slapped him before he knew what was happening. You took her! She slammed her fists against his chest. You son of a bitch! You took her from me! You could have waited! I know how to save her! You could have waited! The room was frozen in horror as Kat pounded and pounded and Ross took every ounce of it as he stumbled back. His eyes closed and his chin quivered. You should have waited, she choked out, then fell into him, a sobbing, trembling jumble as he wrapped his arms around her. Why didn't you wait? The anguish in her voice made my eyes cloud with tears. I'm sorry, he whispered clearing his throat. Her body quaked in his arms as he whispered it over and over. Sophie wiped the tears from her eyes and like a zombie with little life left in her, she walked past Ross and Kat and past Jackson embracing Elle for the door. I hesitated beside Elle, knowing there was nothing I could do or say to help, but wanting her to know I was there all the same. Resting my hand on Elle's heaving shoulder, I squeezed with all the love and reassurance I could. Then, I left her to grieve in Jackson's arms and walked out into the daylight. Kat didn't get her chance to make her peace with JJ. But I would have mine with Sophie. I glanced toward the house, but I didn't see her. Alex. I looked at Phil, sitting with Stanley on the porch steps. He nodded toward the pasture. Sophie walked toward the barn almost stumbling as her footsteps quickened, like she wished she could fly away. Sophie, I called and ran after her. Soph. Only when I finally caught up did she bother to stop. Sophie. I breathed, grabbing onto her shoulders. Slowly, her eyes drifted to mine, and just as slowly, her eyes filled with tears and her face crumbled. Without hesitation, I pulled her into my arms. I'm so sorry, I whispered in her ear. I should have been here. I shouldn't have left. I shouldn't have doubted her or judged her. More than anything, I shouldn't have pushed her away. Everything poured out of her. The earth-shattering sorrow, the smooth, empty darkness of death, the unbridled fear of the days past, Nora, Phil, JJ, the dreams. All of it washed through me, and I squeezed her tighter. I felt it, all of it, because it wasn't only Sophie's to bear, not anymore. 75, Sophie. 14 of us stood in a circle around Ginny's grave as the sun glowed on the horizon. We were at the edge of the property where the fish wheel turned, tucked into the trees, by Rocky's grave. Now you'll see them both all the time in summer, so they can never be forgotten. Jade's words put my heart at ease, as it did with Bo and Thea. And the clouds that had been present all day glowed with pink and yellow light, like today was always going to be the day, because today was meant to be. Ross, the Ranskins, JJ, They'd all come into our lives for this very moment. And as hard as it was to simply breathe, we were all here together. 
How long had it been since I could appreciate a sunset without my thoughts wandering to my next sparring match with Phil? How long had it been since I could be in the moment, knowing I wasn't going crazy? Or that I didn't have to worry about my dreams or question who I was or how I felt anymore because Nora was gone. Thanks to JJ. I squeezed Beau's hand, then Alex's, reassuring myself that they were there and this was all real. The empty feeling, the gratitude, the relief that everyone was home and that we were mostly all together. I could almost feel the relief and regretful longing pouring from Alex, tangling my senses. But I was so full of emotion and what Ross had experienced, I felt too much to tell what was what anymore. Elle hummed her childhood lullaby in the silence, then sang the words so softly I could barely hear them. No one uttered a word. It was too hard. But we all stood in silence. We all mourned together, hand in hand, ragged breath for ragged breath. When Elle was ready, she stepped over to the grave and placed a photograph of her and JJ's children on the mound of rocks, setting a small river stone on it to weigh it down. Tears fell from Elle's eyes, but she didn't sob, for Cat's sake, I think. She kissed her fingertips and pressed them against JJ's headstone. On her name etched in a chunk of granite. And when she was finished, Elle turned to look at Cat, my gaze following. Cat held Dell and Woody's hands as the tears streamed down her face. I want you to have this, Elle said as she drew closer. She handed Cat a photo. Cat's nostrils flared and her lips pressed together, and she hung her head. Thank you, she croaked. And without hesitation, Cat wrapped her arms around Elle. They embraced for a few moments, and Elle cleared her throat. We'll leave you alone with her, she whispered quietly, squeezing her eyes shut with a final tight hug. And when Elle pulled away, she nodded for all of us to follow her. Jade and Dell headed toward the house, hand in hand. Jade's warm, sympathetic smile flashing at me as she passed. I was sad that Took hadn't come with them, but since they'd left in a hurry, someone had to stay at their homestead. Woody walked with Thea, and Bo, Bert, and Stanley followed behind them, making their way toward the house with somber footsteps. Alex's hand squeezed mine when I didn't move. You staying out here? He asked softly. I stared at JJ's grave. For a minute. I tried to smile, but my cheek only twitched, where it's quiet. Do you want me to stay with you? Finally, I looked at him. He bit the side of his cheek, and every fleck of color in his eyes shined with hope and sadness as they searched my face. His eyes had been my compass for so long, so full of heart and love and kindness, that inexplicable warmth glowed around my heart again, now that he'd returned. I'll be all right, I promised him, and squeezed his hand again before I could bring myself to let go. Alex hesitated. But finally, he nodded and turned for the house, following behind Elle and Jackson. Alex was home, and he was different now, open and attentive and not pushing me away. And the relief of that brought tears to my eyes again. I glanced at Ross and Kat as they lingered at JJ's grave in silence. After a few heartbeats, Ross turned to leave, and Kat reached for his arm. Ross? He stopped mid-step. The circles under his eyes were darker than before, and I was surprised he was still standing after the toll this afternoon had taken on him. Kat's chest rose, and she clenched her jaw before she could bring herself to continue. Thank you, she whispered. 
the crease in Ross's brow unfurrowed as he studied Kat's face. His body visibly relaxed, and he nodded, though he hesitated. Kat stared down at her hand on his arm, and after a moment's pause, she let go. Now, get out of here, she said more forcefully. Before I think of something bratty to say. With a tight-lipped smile, Ross continued toward the house, not risking a look back. You okay? Bill walked up behind me. The turmoil of the day shadowed his face. I'll get there, I told him. I'd been so scared Nora had hurt him because of me. I tried not to consider what could have happened to him. I'm glad you're all right, Phil. I lifted on my tiptoes, feeling the ache in the bottoms of my feet. But it was worth it to know he was okay, and I wrapped my arms around him. Bill squeezed me back, a tight bear hug that eased the tension from my body. He's still here, still Phil. The turmoil my ability had brought me the past two years had been worth it, if only to give me enough strength to fight back and shake Nora's power over me. Thanks for coming to save me, Sophie. Phil kissed me on the cheek, and when he pulled away, he winked at me. Can't make it too easy for him. He nodded toward the house. When I looked, Alex was watching us from the deck. Just keeping you two on your toes, he said wryly. I rolled my eyes, allowing a small smile, and Phil and I turned for the house. As I made my way through the property, I peered around for Arya. She had a mess of mourning and confusion of her own to process, and the poor thing probably felt alone and would need us now more than ever. I saw her standing by the horse pasture, her hand outstretched to Big Red as he lipped at her fingers. For a moment, she looked like a little girl without a care in the world, smiling at the pony as she patted his head. I wasn't sure how Bo would feel, having a new animal telepath in the family. But Thea would set him straight. I had no doubt about that. I was about to head for the pasture, forgoing the buzz of people in the house, when Stanley descended the deck steps with carrots dangling from his hands. He wasn't one to approach a stranger, let alone a child, but with each hesitant step, he seemed more determined. Leaving the two of them to talk, I headed up the steps. I stopped beside Elle and Woody at the rail, watching Stanley. Is this a good idea? He doesn't do well with unpredictability. It was only a half joke. Now, just wait a second, Woody said. You're not giving Stanley enough credit. He's got a heart of gold. And after what Phil was saying happened with the girl, it sounds like they might have a lot in common. He knows what it's like to be brainwashed by someone. So who knows? They might be a good match. You make it sound like this is an interview, I told him. Should we roll out the adoption papers and? She's not a commodity, Sophie. Jeez. Woody rolled his eyes and I had to stifle a laugh. But if the girl takes a shine to Stanley, then we'll see what happens. Awe, shock, surprise. None of them really covered the jaw-dropping amusement I felt in hearing Woody say such a thing. An iota of paternal instinct was the last thing I'd ever expected from Woody. You do realize, Elle said wryly, you have to water a child and feed it, right? It's more work than a garden. A smile parted her lips as Woody scratched his chin, making a show of reconsidering it. Well, when you put it that way... I guess it's a good thing I'll have Stanley. Make sure it gets enough sunlight and all that. She, I corrected. Her name is Arya, not it. Woody winked at me. And for a second, I saw Woody as more than the crazy uncle. After all, he deserved a second chance like the rest of us.
76. Alex. Well after midnight, I dragged myself upstairs to bed. Sophie had been in emotion overload since I got home, and I didn't want to crowd her, even if it took everything in me not to cling to her. Woody, Ross, Stanley, Bert, and Phil were long gone. Cat was asleep on the couch. Jackson and Elle were collecting the two sleeping girls to take up to Thea's bedroom, and Jade and Dell had retired to bed once the horizon finally darkened. The past 24 hours of chaos made my mind a bubblegum machine, jumbled and overflowing. I wasn't sure how I felt about the past week, what happened here and at the summit. I regretted leaving home as much as I was glad I'd gone, and I felt a mixture of guilt and gratitude. People knew about Whitehorse now, which was the purpose for going to begin with, and Elle had been right. I'd found what I'd been looking for, even if I wasn't even aware I'd been searching for it. I thought about Iris. She'd already lost one set of parents. It seemed cruel that she should lose Alan, too. I'd saved him, and for the first time in my life, I felt pride in something. When I reached my bedroom, I stopped in the doorway, unable to resist a look at Sophie's. Her door was closed, but the light was on. I could have given her more space, and I considered it, but my need for her to know I would do anything and everything for her was stronger. Blowing out a deep breath, I walked to her bedroom door. Even if I woke her, this needed to be done for both of us. Sophie deserved to know how I felt because she'd been honest with me since day one, even if I didn't always like what I saw or felt in her honesty. There would be no more hiding after this, no more walls. She would have all of me. I just hoped I was still what she wanted. Hey, Soph, I whispered, tapping lightly on her door. I held my breath, listening for movement. Come in, she said softly. My heart was suddenly racing as I cracked the door open. This was it, and whatever the outcome, there was no going back. I poked my head inside, and saw her leaning against the window frame with her arms wrapped around herself. She stared out into the indigo glow of night. Can't sleep? I stepped inside. Her hair was down and hung over her shoulders, lifting as she shrugged. I haven't tried. Her voice was distant, like she was lost in a thought and she didn't even glance in my direction. Are you worried about your dreams still? A part of me is, like she's somehow still in there. But I also think I'm just too exhausted to sleep. Finally, she looked at me. If that makes sense. Yeah, actually, it does. My eyes burn too bad to even close them. With a weak smile, she peered back out the window, down at the pasture or out at the tree line. She might not have been looking at anything at all, but... Sophie was being distant, and as much as it was killing me, I knew I deserved it. I'd pushed her away for so long, and I wasn't here when she needed me the most. I'm sorry, I told her, stepping around her bed. I know you're probably tired of me and my bullshit, or us, but I need you to know something. Her blue eyes widened slightly. They were the color of a frozen lake in winter and I quickly closed the distance between us. Can I see your hand, please? Her delicate eyebrows pulled together in uncertainty, but she offered me her hand. Immediately, I felt the spark of her skin against mine, and I realized how much I would missed it. I hadn't allowed myself to embrace it before. I'd been too scared, but there was something exhilarating in knowing I was drawn to someone so intensely, and that I could feel something so unbreakable. Her hand was warm and slender in mine, and lifting her palm, I rested it against my chest and closed my eyes. Can you feel this? My heartbeat was erratic. My blood was whirring through my veins. My body was alive and felt on fire, and it was all because of her. The Sophie I met two years ago. The Sophie standing in front of me now. I wanted her to know she had me if she wanted me. I wanted her to feel 
what I was feeling for the first time, unhindered. Pure, undeniable love and admiration for her, no matter what she felt or said in return. I know I'm an idiot. I know I've been looking for every reason to push you away, but I wanted you to know that I finally understand. Sophie swallowed, her brightened eyes shifting from her hand on my chest to my face. Understand what? She whispered as a swirl of color filled her cheeks. That nothing will ever change the way I feel about you. Not fill or rejection. You could hate me, and I would still feel the same. I won't deny it anymore. Her cheek twitched, and like it was the most natural motion in the world, I brushed my thumb against her cheek. Her lips parted, but I continued. It might have taken me thousands of miles. A mind meddling know-it-all and imagining something horrible might have happened to you. But I can tell you now what I've known since the beginning, but never had the nerve to say out loud. Why couldn't you say it? She asked, surprising me. It almost felt like she was stalling, and my confidence wavered. Um, because I thought we wouldn't last. Because I wanted it to so badly, and I'd ruined everything. Sophie, I love you. I took a breath. I'll never love anyone but you. She stared at me, her glassy eyes searching my face, scrutinizing every line and every shadow, like she was waiting for a twitch of uncertainty. She didn't smile with relief or shake her head or pull away in rejection. So she stepped closer, her palm still on my chest. I could see the thoughts churning in her eyes, but she was blocking her feelings. Alex, she finally said, her gaze sweeping over me. Sophie, I breathed. There was never a question. I searched the crystalline depths of her eyes, trying to understand. Between you and Phil, while it wasn't a rejection, it wasn't really an answer either. It wasn't me feeling those things. Not really. You were stubborn and frustrating, but I was a mess too. Maybe this was all part of the journey, you know? Bumpy and chaotic like Cat and JJ's. Cat had shared enough with me to know they'd struggled to find peace their entire relationship. Both times, Sophie added sadly, and I realized she was reading my mind. If it's only taken us a couple of years, I guess we're lucky. So, Alex, she leaned in. So, I said again, needing her to tell me if I was or wasn't too late. I had to hear it from her lips. I had to at least feel it so that I knew it was real. She smiled, watching me squirm. Alex, she purred my name so close her nose was nearly touching mine. I couldn't take it anymore. Are you going to say it, at least? I practically begged. Even with my newfound shield of bravery, I needed her to say the damn words. Her amusement faded as she took pity on me. I love you too, she whispered. I crushed my mouth against hers, and as if it was as easy as drawing breath, I felt all of her love fill me. All the days and nights I'd spent trying to unlove her. The energy and time wasted. The misery was for nothing. And I would have hated myself for it if I wasn't so damn elated. My heart and mind were soaring sky high with hers. And I wrapped my arms around her waist and pulled her tighter against me. I saw the old us, the whitely Sophie and Alex, scared and alone. I knew her rush of relief in seeing me after Jackson and I had finally found them at the Ranskins, after the car accident. I felt the exact moment she knew she loved me, after she thought she'd been kidnapped and saw weed come for her. Her absolute certainty felt like a warm breeze against my skin, and my stomach fluttered as I kissed her harder. Sophie was in my arms. There were no more questions, 
and no more uncertainties. I felt free, like I was home and I never wanted to leave again. She wrapped her arms around my neck, pulling me in deeper. I felt her love and lust, her happiness and relief. Her need and desire only amplified mine and every emotion shared between us made our kiss all consuming. And I groaned. Careful, she murmured against my mouth. She drew in a deep breath and pressed another long, heart-stopping kiss to my lips. You make any more noises like that and you won't be allowed in my room anymore. And definitely not with the door closed. Her eyes twinkled and she winked at me. I chuckled, nuzzling my nose into her neck. Eh, we can't have that, I whispered. But I couldn't let go of her either. I pressed my lips to the warm, salty skin of her jaw and inhaled the sweet scent of her hair. Definitely not, she breathed. Her head fell back as I trailed kisses up the column of her neck until my mouth was on hers again. Her lips were as greedy as her fingers, kneading into the back of my head. Her tongue was soft against mine, and every ounce of her desire filled my veins. This is dangerous, I rasped, leaning my forehead against hers. The pull was so strong between us, and we only intensified each other's feelings. Sophie licked her kiss-swollen lips with a nod. Yeah, it is. Did I tell you? I said through a ragged breath. Tomorrow I'm moving out into your old cabin. Her gaze flew open. You are? Yeah, I just decided. Her eyes shifted over me, and her pink mouth and flushed cheeks lifted with a barely containable grin. I think that's a great idea. I shrugged, as if my entire world wasn't floating in the most euphoric haze imaginable. I've had a few of them. Leaning in, I pressed a final, drawn-out kiss to her lips and inhaled the lemony scent of her skin as I forced every awakened part of me to settle. The touch of her hands alone felt like a torturous bliss, and imagining what it would feel like to have all of her, bare skin to bare skin, in my arms, was going to drive me mad. You should probably, um, shut it down, I told her, though feeling what she did was like a drug I needed in my veins. You know, just for now. I cleared my throat. With a knowing grin, Sophie's finger trailed lightly down the back of my neck. Then she rested her head against my shoulder. Her emotions and thoughts muted to a dull, warm pulsing between us. And I sighed with unwanted relief. Hey, Alex. Her voice was soft, almost whimsical. Yeah, I whispered. What time is it? I didn't like that question, but I knew she was exhausted and needed sleep. Really late or early, I said. I glanced behind me at her clock. It was after 4 a.m. I hated to let go of her, but it was unavoidable. I'll let you go to sleep. I tucked a loose strand of her hair behind her ear, desperate for it to be tomorrow already. I have a better idea. Her cheek lifted with a quirk, another of her beautiful smiles. If you're up for it. 77. Sophie. Alex and I had pulled one of the lounge chairs out on the deck to watch the sunrise. Cuddling, wrapped in a blanket, was not how I saw the day ending and the next one beginning. But it was perfect. No matter how heavy my eyelids became, I couldn't possibly go to sleep. Lying with him was all I ever wanted, and it felt so perfectly right. No amount of exhaustion could take that from me. His finger trailed lazily up and down my arm, and his heartbeat was steady against my ear. What are you thinking about? I asked, craning my neck to peer up at him. Honestly? No, Alex, I want you to lie to me. He squeezed his arm tighter around me and smiled. Mosquitoes. Oh, jeez. I nestled closer into him, 
inhaling his musk in the brisk morning air. At the summit, one guy, an ecologist, was telling us that mosquitoes were engulfing cities now because of all the stagnant water. Gross. Yeah, I never thought I'd be grateful for the occasional swarm here. In all the craziness of the past 24 hours, I hadn't heard much about his trip. What else did you learn at the summit? We were only there a couple days, so not too much. We told them about Whitehorse, though. Any takers? I asked, hopeful. We only had a couple more months before Alex had to hole himself up in the hydro plant again. I couldn't imagine a few days going by without seeing him now, let alone weeks. There wasn't a sign-up sheet or anything, but I think people were definitely interested. There were some survivors there, like Iris and Zoe, who had communities to go back to, but there were a lot of people living off the grid, alone too. People are still scared of what's out there, of the crazy people and dangerous abilities. Everyone wants to feel safe. His voice drifted away, and I wondered what he was thinking about again. If it was the people he'd met in Prince Rupert and left behind. Iris was very pretty, I mused. Alex tilted his head to look down at me and smiled. You saw her, did you? Yes, I wasn't prying. He kissed my forehead. I know, Soph. You can see whatever you want. I don't have anything to hide. I knew he meant that, too. I could feel it in the steady beat of his heart against my cheek. Later, will you tell me all about them? About all of them? I want to know about your favorite parts and what you did for Iris's father. I didn't want to just see it. I wanted him to tell me. I wanted to hear the pride in his voice and live his time in Prince Rupert the way he remembered it. Of course I will. As his arms squeezed around me, I felt the rush of utter contentment and joy, and I melted into him all over again, my body enlivened with the heat of promise and possibility. I couldn't resist another stolen glance. Alex was mine, finally and I felt like every dark hole in me had been filled with light, and every cold spot had been chased away. This was how it was meant to be. This was what Alex and I were meant to be. The glow around the flame, sunshine in a dewy morning sky. His eyes barely had time to meet mine before my mouth was on his, allowing myself the freedom to feel everything. Knowing he wanted me to made it even more euphoric. Cupping my hand on the back of his neck, I pulled him closer, tasted him deeper. I didn't just want Alex. It was impossible not to need him. And I would consume every part of him he would give me. I would fly high with his every touch if gravity would let me. The sliding glass door slid open, and tearing our lips apart, I whipped around with a racing heart to find Bo in the doorway. Hey, bud, Alex rasped, finding his voice in the lusty haze that hung between us. Bo ignored him and stepped outside, bleary-eyed, with one pant leg bunched up and a rumpled sleep shirt. Eventually, he looked at Alex and me, but didn't seem to care much that we were there as he headed down the deck steps in his bare feet. Bo, I said, sitting up. What are you? I heard an all too familiar chuffing in the woods, and the horses neighed in the pasture in panic. Bo, Alex called, tossing the blanket off us and jumping to his feet. It's fine, Bo grumbled, and he walked precariously through the dirt toward the mama grizzly and the baby as they stepped out of the tree line. Bo! Alex and I shouted. And as Alex ran toward the steps, I turned for the house to grab the gun and call for Jackson and stopped short. Aria stood in the doorway with must hair and a sleep lined face. A smile, small at first, turned into a grin 
and she stepped onto the deck. You came back, she called, and pattered on little feet down the steps. She and Bo hurried over to the bears. The mother was massive and able to mangle them with a single swipe of her paw if she wanted to. But when Alex moved for the stairs, I grabbed hold of his arm. Wait, I said. Just wait a second. Just like Bo had his wolves, Aria had her bears. And if they didn't hurt Thea, they wouldn't hurt Bo. Sophie, trust me, I told him, holding his gaze. I want to see what happens. With a heavy sigh, he slowly made his way down the steps, eyes locked on Bo and Thea. They trotted up to the bears, and without hesitation, Bo reached out and pet the baby, who let out a low, playful growl, and the mother bear nudged Arya with her large head, almost knocking the little girl to the ground. Both of the kids giggled, and shaking my head, I looked at Alex. How did Bo know they were out here? What? He pried his gaze from the incredible scene in front of us. What do you mean? I thought Bo could only communicate with wolves. He was out here before Arya and knew they wouldn't hurt him. Alex's eyes narrowed, but he smiled as realization set in. Whatever Mia taught him at the summit must have helped. We watched in silent awe as Bo leaned against the baby bear licking his hand. They were the same size, for now. Both Arya and Bo laughed, and I shook my head. This isn't good. What? Alex said, his amusement fading. Why? Bo finally did it. I blinked at him a laugh bubbling up in my throat. A farm, a pack of wolves, now we have two grizzlies? Elle and Jackson are going to freak. Maybe it was because we were so exhausted, or maybe it was because our lives had become so impossible. But our chuckles turned into unabashed laughter, and my cheeks began to hurt. There were murmurs from the deck, followed by the creak of hurried footsteps. We glanced back at the house to find three gaping faces and Thea skipping toward us. Kat hesitated on the final step, with eyes so wide I thought they might pop out of her head. And it took a split second for Elle and Jackson to comprehend what, exactly, was happening. Eventually, Jackson looked at Elle, and shaking his head, he rubbed his forehead with a groan. Bloody hell. My shoulders shook, and Alex and I lost ourselves to another bout of laughter. Epilogue, L. Four months later, Christmas Day. I know it's been a couple weeks since I was here last, but it seemed important that I come see you today. I leaned in and brushed the fresh snow from Jenny's headstone. This is the first Christmas in over a decade that you've been near, and I wanted to give you this. I laid a framed family photo of all of us at the head of her grave. You'll see the Ramskins are in it. So is Arya. And, most importantly, Kat is smiling. Well, as much as Kat smiles, anyway. It had taken some coaxing, but she'd finally come around. She and Ross don't hate each other anymore, so that's a good thing. And since we have a few new settlers arriving every week, we have more people who can help keep the hydro plant going, so Alex is home for a while. He and Sophie are loving that. I grumbled the last part. They can barely keep their hands off each other. But I'm happy for them. It's nice to have everyone smiling for once. Even Bo. Hearing the patter of footsteps in the snow, I peered through the trees. Littlefoot hunched down to the river, lapping at the water's edge. Deep down, I think Bo had come to terms with Luna and the wolves being his kindred spirits, which he'd learned wasn't the case for most animal telepaths, so he was okay with that. 
Whatever he'd learned from Mia and Prince Rupert had given him that small yet very important gift. We have quite the full house today, I told her, and crouched beside the stones blanketed in white. Everyone is here for Christmas, which is a first, and it's wonderful. Knowing we might not all be together if it wasn't for Jenny made my chest ache with longing to see her again. Even Took came up to spend it with us, I told her, rallying myself. I had a house full of people to go back to, and I didn't want to dampen the mood by having swollen eyes and tear-stained cheeks. He and Kat get along splendidly. You'd understand why if you knew him. I think, though, I said, allowing myself to hope. I think the Ranskins might actually decide to stay indefinitely. I think Took is the only one we have to win over, but I'll sick Bea on him, and he won't be able to tell her no. Woody and Stanley would love it too. Since the Ranskins never got sick, I think Stanley is intrigued by them. And Jade and Dell are a wonderful help with Arya. She's grown very fond of Stanley even if he still has a hard time with the parental part of parenthood. They're learning, and Jade is patient and a great teacher. So you see, we're one big happy family. Even though I miss you so much, it hurts. Heavy footsteps approached behind me, and I glanced over my shoulder to find a buttoned-up Jackson wearing a beanie with a pink nose and rosy cheeks on his bearded face. I thought I might find you here, he said, and squatted down beside me. He looked at Jenny's grave. Were you really looking for me, or are you escaping a house full of kids? And I'm not just talking about the three preteens. Jackson chuckled. I don't mind all the kids, young or old. No. I arched an eyebrow. His hazel eyes twinkled as they met mine like they held a thousand hopes and secrets for us to share. No, kids are good, he answered softly. The bigger the family, the better. I stared at him, unblinking as he let the words hang between us, and my heart raced a little. We had never talked about children of our own. I didn't want it to be a choice he'd ever have to make, knowing how close he held Molly to his heart. Don't overthink it, Elle. He smirked. Come on. He nodded back toward the house. I came to bring you back. Dinner's just about ready. Jackson took my gloved hand in his and pulled me up. To be honest, I said, wiping a wisp of hair out of my eyes. My mitten was cold and wet with snow. For the first time, I'm a little frightened to eat knowing Woody's been helping Alex. Don't worry, Sophie was chaperoning. Jackson reached out and picked a snowflake from my hair. As his gaze shifted over me, a smile curved his lips. Pink looks good on you. He ran the back of his gloved finger gently over my cheek. I have to admit, I'm actually a little chilly. It rarely happened anymore with fire simmering in my blood, but sometimes the cold still found a way to sneak in. Jackson stepped closer. I can take care of that for you. He flashed me one of his roguish grins I love so much before he leaned in and brushed his lips over mine, deft and featherlight, making my toes curl in my boots. He pressed another one to my temple letting his lips and warm breath linger there. And I heard myself sigh. Bedtime suddenly felt too far away. I cleared my throat, feeling my skin flush with warmth. Red, he mused, watching the heat swirl over my cheeks. That looks even better. His smirk held a hint of victory. You better watch out, I warned, and cocked my head to the side. You think you're a god, but even they have weaknesses. Don't think I won't use yours against you. Jackson's eyes darkened and glittered in the winter afternoon. Careful, Elle. 
That sounds an awful lot like a dare. I batted my eyelashes at him. I guess we'll just have to see. Heaving in a breath, he shook his head. This night is going to go by slowly, isn't it? He muttered, though it was practically a groan. And I couldn't help but laugh. I'm afraid so. Jackson nodded toward the house again. Shall we return to the chaos then? I glanced back at Jenny's grave, content in knowing that things ended the way she'd wanted them to, and not many people were given that. At least I still had a small part of her with me, peering up at Jackson, strong and true, the love of my life. I reminded myself how lucky I really was to have him, to have Sophie and Alex, Thea and Bo, to have Ross and Kat and everyone else who made my life so full, I couldn't imagine life any other way. Lead the way home? With a big, perfect smile, Jackson squeezed my hand. Back to the chaos we go. The End Keep listening for a sneak peek at Fading Shadows, the fourth installment in the Savage North Chronicles. Fading Shadows Sneak Peek, Three Years Later, Chapter One, Ross. Once we get this loaded, I'll be good to go, Jackson said, as he and I each slid a ten-gallon jug of biodiesel into the back of the Tacoma. His dark hair was pulled back behind his head, and his beard was trimmed, like he'd taken a few more moments to groom than usual this morning. You're stopping by the hydro plant to grab Bert and Phil on your way to the helipad then? Or are they meeting you here? Nah. Jackson distractedly combed his mustache with his bottom teeth and walked over to a stack of duffel bags. He tossed me one. They're meeting me there. Bert wants to make sure Corey has everything he needs to run things before he leaves. And Phil went with him to make sure Bert is supervised and doesn't scare the kid away from his first lead assignment. I grinned. Shit, that's right. It's Corey's first time running the plant while you're all gone. Jackson grunted as he loaded in another two diesel jugs. Let's just say Bert's a bit unsettled about it. I bet he is, I muttered. Corey's a good kid, but he's clumsy. Not to mention, Bert always worried something would go wrong with the hydro plant while he was away. No matter what crew we had on deck or how powerful their abilities were, it was admirable that he took his work seriously, but he'd been known to scare the piss out of a few recruits with the embellished horror stories that accompanied each one of his rules. It wasn't as if we would all die if the plan stopped working, but you wouldn't know that with Bert in charge. Then I'm glad Phil is going to mediate. Maybe Corey will last longer than Hector did. Jackson laughed. Poor Hector. It's good for the young ones to know the responsibility of this place. I mused. It was a team effort to keep it going. Now that White Horse housed over 200 people, Bert was an old man who'd made his life to keep the town running. But he wouldn't be around forever. At any rate, the water is rushing with all the spring ice melts, so he won't have to do much. I'll be sure to check in on him from time to time, though. The clouds moved in front of the sun, which was expected on a brisk April afternoon, and a chill swept over my skin. I heaved in an ammo bin from the loading docks curious if I shouldn't fill a smaller duffel with extra magazines and bullets, just in case. Jackson's last scavenging trip with his team to the east hadn't gone as smoothly as he usually did, so we'd packed weapons and provisions more generously this time. After hearing about that other gang altercation outside Edmonton, I'm going to get you another pack of ammo to take, maybe some extra pistols. I already thought of it, he said, nodding to the cab of the truck. Hell wouldn't let me leave the house without extra reinforcements. The corner of his mouth lifted with amusement. It was the same contentment I saw on his face after he'd married my sister, Hannah. I'd been seeing that smirk of his more and more over the past couple of years. It looked good on him. After Hannah and Molly died, I wasn't sure he would ever be happy again, but he was, and I was glad for it. I thought about Kelsey's plummet into insanity and her dying in my arms, then I pushed the memory away and forced myself to think about the living instead of the dead. 
Death was a cesspool that tended to suck me in every now and again, and it was all I could do every damn day to keep thinking about life instead. Bo's angry with me, Jackson said. Uh-oh, I chuckled and scratched the side of my face. It was always something with Bo. What did you do now? Jackson shook his head with a sigh and took a swig from his water jug. I won't take him with me. He wiped his mustache with the back of his hand. He hates me because of it, of course. Well, I don't blame you for leaving him behind. I leaned against the wheel well, feeling the cool metal through my shirt. Whatever those gangs of kids are up to, it's nothing good. I mean, I get it. The world ends, you're ten years old, and you can move a tree with your mind or lure a meal right towards you. But at some point, you need direction. You and I saw that all the time with the gangs back in Anchorage, and they had parents and normal problems. You got people like Nora out there leading some of these kids around. It's crazy, scary shit. And now they're getting bored. They want more. I shook my head and thought about the fire outbreaks in the cities, caused by some of them. It was only a matter of time before the renegade youth became a bigger issue, even way out here. I know some of them just want to be part of a pack to call family, but they're getting ballsy. They just came up on you last time like they were fearless. Jackson lifted his chin, eyeing me like he knew exactly what I was thinking. So, what's your plan? He knew me well, and I leveled my gaze on him. Of course, I had a plan. Wall off the bridge, to start with. A wall? He tilted his head back and forth as he considered it. We'd have to man it in order to allow those of us going between Riverdale and the prison, your place, and anywhere else outside the border through, I admitted but it would give us even more control and make us less alluring to troublemakers, looking to sneak in for winter supplies or anything else they might think we have worth stealing. It could work, Jackson mused, and he crossed his hands over his chest. I shoved off the truck to head toward the few bags left to load. It has to. Well, count me in. I promise to help Alex and Sophie finish their place when I get back, but it won't take long. A month was a long time to wait to build the wall, and I wasn't sure we had that kind of time. Plus, Jackson had enough on his plate, patrolling White Horse with me, working on his farm, raising Bo and Thea, going on bi-monthly scavenging trips. I couldn't rely on him to be a part of every project that needed doing, but I nodded all the same. We'll talk about it when you get back. We were far beyond the days when we could all hole up in the prison for safety, and with half of my team gone, most of the time, our security measures were laughable. As for Bo, don't worry about him, I told Jackson. He'll get over it. I'll take him on rounds with me a few times while you're gone. I handed him one of the duffels and we made our way back to the truck. How long do you think you'll be gone this time anyway? A couple weeks? The biodiesel-powered helicopter would shave off a week's worth of driving, if not more. Yeah, we haven't hit up the Yellowknife area yet and I expect we'll find plenty of supplies there. Yellow knife, huh? The further out Jackson and the team went each trip, the more I wondered how long it would be before we created an installation somewhere out there. I left our route in Woody's office. Jackson looked at me as we nestled in the last of the bags. Make sure he sees it when he gets back from Prince Rupert. Will do. They should be back soon. Cat and Woody had been gone almost a week for their quarterly check-in with Cuck and his team and it had been strangely silent without them. Despite Cad and I not getting along when she'd first arrived with JJ a few years back, we'd fallen into a groove of working together and putting up with one another. Aren't you glad Cat's coming home today? Jackson slammed the tailgate shut. My eyes narrowed on him. He and Elle had a way of asking Bo and Thea loaded questions, a parental move I usually found entertaining and I got the feeling Jackson was using his parental voice with me now. So I hesitated to answer. Why would I be glad? Because, he drawled, Phil and I are taking off and she'll be coming back. You won't be alone in the safety crew. With a raised eyebrow, Jackson tried not to smile. It wasn't supposed to be a difficult question. <sighs> I wasn't sure I bought that, but I let it go. I don't know if glad is the word I'd use. She'll start an argument with me the moment she gets back, and then... 
If I could get you as riled up as she does, I'd push your buttons too. He chuckled and walked over to me, shaking his head. Just don't kill each other before I get back. We need our help with the wall. He clamped his hand on my shoulder. And check in on Al for me while I'm gone, would you? Of course I will. Just get back in one piece. <laughs> Same goes for you. I noticed Megan's had a few more concerned citizen inquiries and neighborly drop-ins than usual over the past few months. Don't let her run you ragged. Jackson winked. I blew out an exasperated breath. Yeah, she's, uh, interested, Ross. It's called dating. You should try it sometime. I frowned. Don't be ridiculous. He laughed and climbed into the truck. Just returning the favor, brother. Don't forget how gung-ho you were about me and Al three years ago. Yeah, well, that's different. Jackson stared at me, an annoyingly perceptive gleam in his eyes. No, it's not. Yes, it is. You liked Al. Megan's nice, but I wasn't sure what she was, other than not my type. Just get out of here, would you? I tapped the top of the truck. I can see why Cat likes screwing with you so much. Jackson pulled the door shut. It's fun. That's all I need. Two of you on my case. That's what friends are for. He nodded a farewell. I'll radio in when we get to Yellowknife. Sounds good. Be careful out there, brother. Jackson waved out the open window, and with a rumble, the Tacoma started up. See you in a few weeks, he called, and pulled away from the loading dock, past the prison, and out the gate. Jackson wasn't a soldier, and he couldn't burn people alive if he needed to protect himself like Al could, but he was a survivor and a trained trooper. He was strong and capable. You had to be now, living out here. But none of it made it easier to watch him drive away not when so much about our lives could go wrong each day. Even with nightly patrols around the five square miles we were using in Riverdale, the only white horse neighborhood protectively nestled between the Yukon River and Gray Mountain, we were still more accessible than I was comfortable with. There were two bridges in and out that needed some sort of monitoring and defense, and the places people could hide in white horse made me anxious when I allowed myself to think about it too much. No matter how much time passed, there was still so much to do. When I realized I was still standing in the gravel drive like a sulking child, I turned for the prison, a big, hulking three-story building covered in metal sheeting. I was itching to get some safety planning underway. Bunching my long sleeves up to my elbows, I pulled the side entrance door open and heard another rumble and crunching gravel. I glanced at the open gate. Either Jackson had forgotten something, or Woody, Cat, and the others were back from Prince Rupert. Our constant communication and trade with them were essential for keeping our growing town stocked with what few creature comforts we had, and the food and weapons we needed to sustain 52 adults and over 120 youth under the age of 18. I recognized the sound of the Tahoe's exhaust before Woody drove through the gate. He waved and pulled up to the loading dock, bringing the Tahoe to a jolting halt. I was surprised to see that only Cat was with him. You just missed Jackson, I said, walking back over to greet them. Woody pushed the driver's side door open and his rumpled, blonde gray hair caught in the breeze. His eyes were glassy, with exhaustion from nearly 20 hours on the road. Oh, we saw him heading into town, Woody said through a stretch. I glanced at Cat as she flung her seatbelt off in the passenger seat. She let you drive this time, huh? How did you manage that? Woody wasn't the best driver in the world. He tended to steer wherever he looked, and Cat generally refused to be in the car with him at the wheel. She can't drive if she can't find the keys, he said with a big smile. True. I reached out to give Woody's hand a quick shake. I'm actually surprised you made it back so early. We barely made it back at all, Cat muttered and climbed out of the car. I tried not to smile at her displeasure and opened the back hatch to help unload. It's a relief to see you're in a good mood today, Cat. She lifted a delicate eyebrow as she pulled her hair from her bun, something she rarely did. It fell in blonde waves over her shoulders and she massaged her head with a groan. Either my hair tie was too tight or I have a headache from too much whiplash. She sighed and glared at Woody. He threw his hands up. You shouldn't have left the keys unattended. They were in my bag, my bag, and I had to piss, she told him. 
Well, I don't know what to tell you. Where are Sam and Christine? I interjected before Kat could get too riled up. I pulled a box from the back of the Tahoe marked Honey and carried it to the storage container on the loading dock, empty after having loaded Jackson's truck. I dropped them off at their house on the way in, Woody said as he started stacking crates on the dock. Don't tell me all of this honey is for Thea, I joked. L will kill you both. Kat grinned as she rebunned her hair on top of her head. No, she said. It's for the store. We also got some beef, some grain, and oranges shipped up from California. Taylor will love that, I told her. She always did nice things for Taylor, and I assumed it was because, like Kat, he'd lost his partner since surviving the virus. Maybe they were kindred spirits or something. He appreciates it when you get him new products for the shop. Kat shrugged like she was indifferent to Taylor, but I wondered if that was true. She smiled a lot around him, which was unlike her. And I noticed the way he looked at her, even if I hadn't realized it until now. As she walked over to help us unload, the side door of the prison opened with a hydraulic squeak. Stanley and Arya stepped outside. Ah, good ears. He is back, Stanley said with a smile. He looked as smart as always with his black-rimmed glasses, yellow and white striped bow tie, and his navy argyle sweater. I told you, Arya drawled. She sounded more like a teenager than ever. Her long brown hair hung loose around her face and bounced with each of her steps. Her freckles made her look a bit younger than she was, but her brown eyes held a lifetime of lessons and hurt already lived. Woody's blue eyes widened with surprise and glittered with merriment when he saw them. What the hell, he said. He tusked at Aria. You're supposed to be in school, smudge. Aria was tall for 13 and came up to Woody's armpit as she gave him a side hug. Smudge was his nickname for her because Aria was such a tomboy and was always dirty. A lot had changed in a few years, though, and like Thea, she was getting older. Both of them would be causing boy trouble soon enough, and I didn't envy any of the pseudo-dads in the slightest. Aria went to school this morning, Stanley explained, but Sophie sent her home at lunch since she knew there would be family matters to attend to. He clasped Woody on the shoulder with a warm smile. We've got the rest of this, Woody, I told him and waved him away. Go on, I'll finish up here. I think I'll take you up on that, he said, and with his arm around Aria, the three of them walked back toward the prison. I watched with a strange mixture of relief, happiness, and sadness. They'd found their niche again. All of them had been lost at the beginning, but now they had their people, a family, two crazy uncles and their ward. When are they going to get a place of their own? Kat asked, as she lifted the crate of oranges out of the back with a huff. I don't know. They've mentioned it a couple times, but I guess they like it here. When we actually start using the prison how it's meant, they won't be able to raise her here. I reached further into the back of the Tahoe and pulled out two metal crates. It's not my business. Glancing down at the bottled homebrew, I grinned. Let me guess, these are for you. I knew how much she liked Huck's ale. No, actually, I didn't get any for myself this time. Huck didn't have a lot, so I just brought some for Taylor's store. I figured I can wait until we go back again to get more. Oh, how thoughtful. Shut up, Ross, she grumbled. With a smirk, I stepped past her. I could see why she liked to annoy me. Pushing her buttons brought me a strange satisfaction, too. Oh, Kat said, turning for the back seat. I almost forgot the meds. She hauled out a decent-sized box and set it inside the storage container. We'll need to decide what goes to the store and what we should keep for the hospital, she thought aloud. That reminds me, I leaned against the car. What did Huck say about the serum? Some of the Hope Valley folks had been working on a remedy that reverted the effects of the virus in survivor's genetic code, helping people whose abilities were too much of a burden in their everyday lives feel a bit more normal and in control. It actually started out as a possible repair for the crazies and their ability-broken minds. Then, the focus shifted to older people who had a hard time controlling their abilities, probably because of their age, and were an endangerment to themselves and others by no fault of their own. And it was an intriguing option to people like me, who didn't want their abilities at all. Kat's steely blue eyes met mine. 
They're looking for volunteers to try it out, she said, hesitating. I'm thinking about doing it. What? Why? My tone was harsher than I meant it to be, but I couldn't help my shock. Cat, you don't even know if it will work. What if you die? Careful, Ross. You almost sound like you care. She smiled, but I wasn't amused. I'm serious. It's not like I want to be tethered to death, but even if my ability was magically gone one day, I wouldn't be able to forget the past. Not every life that's passed through me and what it's felt like. Not the memories. That's assuming I survived the effects of it at all. Why would you risk being a guinea pig? She shook her head. Why not? I can think of a hundred reasons. No one wanted to feel people die like I could, but manipulating electrical energy, the ability to bend it to her will if she ever cared enough to use it, didn't seem that bad. Not enough to be so reckless. Especially not when she had people who cared about her who she might risk leaving behind if her decision to experiment with something so unknown went horribly wrong. Well, it's not your call, she said flatly. I crossed my arms over my chest and stared at her. Her ability was a topic she often avoided, and I never pressed her because I didn't think it was my business, even if I was curious as hell. But how nonchalant she seemed about it felt too hasty, even for her. Why won't you tell me why you hate your ability so much? Because it doesn't matter, Ross. Drop it, okay? I hated that I didn't have a card to play that would force her to tell me. She would laugh in my face if I pulled rank as her boss and demanded an answer. She would make some snide remark if I told her I wanted to know why it affected her so much because I cared. So, biting my tongue, I turned back for the Tahoe. Cat didn't open up about much, so I wasn't surprised she was shutting me down, but I didn't like it. When we were finished unloading, Cat grabbed her pack from the back, her slender, muscle-hewn arms straining. Then she dropped it to the side with a thud. What do you have in there, bricks? I joked, trying to lighten the mood a little. The last thing I wanted was us ignoring one another so soon after she got home. Weapons, my radio, she shrugged. Stuff. Cat wasn't a delicate flower, and I'd give her that. Also, I need a ride to the farm before you go on patrol this afternoon, so I can check on Puck and help Elle with dinner. I'm not going to dinner tonight, I told her, handing her the last of the bags before closing the back. Just take the Tahoe. I have my truck. I'm riding Puck home. The Tahoe will be a wasted vehicle. She dropped her hands from her hips. Besides, why aren't you coming to family dinner? Phil and Jackson are gone, and you're going to the farm. There's no one to make the rounds. Um, you're the boss, Ross. You can do whatever the hell you want. Change the damn schedule and no one will care. Hell, no one will even notice. Wow, I said, shaking my head. I feel so validated right now. Sometimes the truth hurts. She hit my shoulder. But seriously, no one will care. With a sigh, I nodded to my truck under the carport at the end of the loading dock. Fine. Grab your shit. Perfect. I knew you were sensible. I glared at her. Were you this wonderful in your past life, or am I just lucky to have you as my only deputy for the next few weeks? Hauling her large pack over her shoulder, Kat looked back at me with a sassy smile and weaked. You're just that lucky. You can continue reading Cat and Ross's story in Fading Shadows, the full installment. Available on Amazon. The End Thank you for listening. This has been Midnight Sun, Savage North Chronicles, Book 3. An ending world novel. Written by Lindsay Polk. Narrated by Sarah Ruth Thomas and Luis Bermudez. Produced by Stephen Carlock. For more Savage North Chronicles, visit lindsaypogue.com. Well, what do you think? That was a big beast of a book, and it was very topsy-turvy. There was a lot going on. I know there were some ups and downs in there, so I hope you enjoyed that installment of the Savage North Chronicles. Next up is Ross's story in Fading Shadows. It's a shorter installment, but it's very important as we continue through the series and start working towards Bo and Thea's stories that take place in the future. Okay, so I hope you enjoy what's next. 
you know where to find me. All of my socials and information is in the description as well as the reading order. I'll see you over at Fading Shadows. Thanks for listening.